Hi everyone. It's an honor to join all of you for this year's New Mexico Wildlife Corridor Summit. And I want to start by commending the New Mexico Wildlife Federation and all of the stakeholders represented here for the progress that you've made in advancing concepts like landscape connectivity and wildlife corridors. We have begun to really appreciate that the movement of wildlife, even the spread of wildfires or the, the health of water supplies, they just don't end at state or national borders or at the borders of our national forests. We should be using the latest science to identify and manage the corridors where wildlife species move across our landscapes and across our highways and jurisdictional boundaries to ensure species diversity and sustainable wildlife populations. Implementing solutions to these challenges requires cooperation and collaboration between state, federal, and tribal agencies and our private landowners. And it requires dedicated resources. Last year, I was proud to help secure $350 million to establish a new wildlife crossing pilot program within the landmark infrastructure law. This new program will allow us to improve habitat connectivity by building overpasses, underpasses, and fencing to help wildlife safely cross our roads and highways. This will reduce fatal wildlife vehicle collisions, and it will allow animals like pronghorn and bighorn sheep and elk to move safely throughout their range. I'm proud that the New Mexico Department of Transportation and New Mexico Department of Game and Fish have already been leading in this space. Our legislature passed the Wildlife Corridors Act in 2019, which called on the state to adopt a Wildlife Corridors Action Plan to identify the wildlife corridors that bisect roads and develop solutions to those challenges. As we complete more of these projects, we will make a real difference in making our roads safer for both drivers and the wildlife that we care about. This is an important piece of our collective work to protect the healthy and sustainable wildlife populations of our state. But if we want to be truly successful in restoring whole ecosystems with landscape scale efforts, our state and tribal wildlife agencies will need more funding support. On that note, I'd like to tell you a little about a major piece of legislation that I'm working on to try and pass in the Senate. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act, or RAWA, would be the most significant investment in wildlife conservation in the last half century. It would fund proactive, voluntary conservation efforts by states, U.S. territories, and tribes to address the nation's wildlife crisis. Over the last half century, we have seen some species, particularly game species and sport fish, restored to healthy population levels as a direct result of the collaborative work financed by bedrock conservation laws like Pittman-Robertson and Dingle-Johnson. But it has been clear for decades that many more species of plants and animals are in decline or even headed towards extinction. Without enough resources, our state and tribal wildlife agencies have been forced to pick and choose which species are worthy of their attention. Our wildlife managers know exactly what type of locally driven science-based projects work to successfully restore healthy fish and wildlife habitat and robust wildlife populations. We just aren't doing enough to support these projects. I like to think of this approach as sort of the preventative medicine of wildlife conservation. We know intuitively that an ounce of prevention really is worth a pound of cure. And the Recovering America's Wildlife Act would finally provide dedicated resources to this proactive conservation and habitat restoration work. It would help us safeguard many more species that otherwise could find themselves on the threatened or endangered list, the equivalent of needing emergency room assistance. In the last Congress, many of you helped us pass the historic Great American Outdoors Act, which is already helping us tackle the long-standing infrastructure backlog at our national parks and public lands. As one of the most important wildlife bills in decades, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act will allow us to make similar historic progress 
on species recovery and wildlife habitat. We need to pass this legislation if we want to pass on to future generations of Americans the full complement of our natural heritage, from bison to bumblebees, as well as traditions like hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing. I'm proud of the coalition of sportsmen and women, of conservationists, scientists, states and tribes, and wildlife advocates who are calling on Congress to pass RAWA into law this year. Lastly, I want to point out that because of the flexibility that's built into RAWA, state agencies like the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, as well as tribal wildlife agencies, can apply these funds to help protect and preserve corridors for New Mexico's species of greatest conservation need. I want to sincerely thank each of you out there who are part of this effort. Let's continue to work together to ensure that we pass the full complement of native wildlife that you and I inherited onto our children and our grandchildren. Thank you. Buenos dias, good morning, everyone. As you all know, I represent the beautiful and culturally diverse third traditional district. And I love that my district is incredibly rural and that I have had the benefit of um, living with and among wildlife for my entire life. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful paradise to me. I think in all of us who love our land and love those who live on our land. Uh, but we want to acknowledge today, and I want to acknowledge the Tiwa peoples and the people of those tribes and those communities and those cultures who first nourished this land that we are living on, who gave us the great blessings of the three sisters, of the foods that we all enjoy. I always talk about the tamale as the example of the wonderful synthesis of our cultures here in New Mexico. And it's always best in my household that we can make sure we have antelope or deer or elk in that tamale. And we know that we learned these traditions from the particular people who are on these lands we were in. We learned the traditions about how to care for these lands. And we are incorporating right now traditional indigenous knowledge into all that we do, into what we're going to be doing along the wildlife corridors, into ideas about home management. We had two separate hearings in March looking at tribal indigenous knowledge and how to incorporate that in our world. Because we know that that respect for my land, it's not just held by an instant passed down to the land representative, the Asenka, and those that have come since then to the time that we became recognized as a state a little later than we would have liked, but we are okay with that too, and to the work we are doing today. You know, it's this herencia that we have, this herencia and this love of our land, which also, and sometimes leads to our complicated jurisdictions, right? We all know, those of you here today, uh, those of you listening, that the jurisdictions on the land that we hold so dear and sacred, right? I mean, they're checkerboard. Sometimes you're on BLM land, sometimes you're over on the state land, you're on tribal land, you're on allotments, you're on federal land. And so it is going to take an amazing amount of cooperation and collaboration to get done what we need to get done. And it is really important that we get that done because as we heard um, from the Senator, we have important work that we are doing in Congress to help this effort. But more importantly, we must act quickly because there are so many creaturas de Dios that are at risk. And I'm already reminded of that feature that I first heard Valky Hill uh, talk about on um, that beautiful movie that was put together about wildlife quality, right? Uh, un poquito para mí, un poquito para vos, un poquito para las criaturas de Dios, a little bit for me, a little bit for you, and a little bit for all of the creatures of 
God. And that's these kinds of values that I think we are all bringing to this effort today. And it's these kinds of values which will continue to help us inspire to get to the kind of solutions that we need. Um, you know, I am also just incredibly proud that I was able to support and push for that provision in the infrastructure law that created that pilot farm program for the wildlife policy. Um, and I'm really glad that I'm a co-sponsor. We have the hearings already in the House. We marked up the bill that will provide for those wildlife crossings that we just heard about. So we are moving forward on that. You know, we need to keep it going. We need to keep that momentum going. Because when we work together on land management and policy, whether it's wildlife crossings or otherwise, we know what it means to us in the Mexicanos. It means we honor tribal sovereignty. We assure that pueblos and tribes and nations have the opportunities to consult to co-manage what we're working on. It means that we talk with our traditional communities, our land grant mercedes, our ranchers, our farmers, our separate commissioners, because they are working and they are living and making their living on these lands. And I think I want to take a moment to sometimes talk about a difficult subject, but we must make sure, and I know everybody listening here today does it, but we must always and come on continuously and constantly know that we must educate and inform all the landowners about what we're doing. Because there are groups like Alec who are pushing resolutions that misconstrue and disinform about what we are doing. And those are being passed in counties here in New Mexico and across our country. They're being passed against issues like the wildlife corridor, issues like 30 by 30, because they scare instead of informing. We know that this work we're doing is not about taking, it's about sharing. And that when we inform people about what we're doing and that it is about making your ranch more profitable in a sense, better for you. I had the wonderful opportunity to hike to the top of Cerro de la Hoya because I uh, introduced the law on the house side to make it a wilderness. And my rule is I can, will not introduce a bill until I get these boots dirty, right? I need to put those, the dirt on those boots. But it was wonderful because that's, a, I, I see that that's the perfect example. I had a rancher take me to the Cerro de la Hoya, right? And we saw those prong corn quite the beautiful the way they leap, but the elk that we saw in the forest are much more careful as they move through that forest. We saw all of that. And he recognized that having that wilderness designation was better for him because having that wilderness designation meant that there might be stronger and more beautiful elk that he could use in the permits that would help complement his income. And we had tribes there giving us the blessings before we hiked up that hill. We had Tell's Pueblo members there. And that's exactly where we are headed and where you are headed with the work. So I keep thinking that years from now, years from now, when they ask us, when they ask all of us here, what we did to protect our land, wildlife, our herencia, our heritage, our history, and our way of life, that we'll say, Mejitas, we did everything we could. We did everything. I forgot to get emotional. I always get emotional because of that. You know, we did everything we could because we need to leave to you everything that was left to us. And that that is a commitment that I will give you today that I will make. And I know that is a commitment that each of you in the different ways you are making are giving to your hijas and your grandchildren. And so for that, I thank you. And now I get to have the best fun of the day because I get to introduce the amazing land commissioner who comes to that job with that kind of heart that also brings from a place of love of her community, of those children that she knows she serves and of that land that she grew up looking at and lives up on that beautiful mesa now looking, knowing that those beautiful eagles and hawks that saw her in those mesas need to be protected, need to be able to have what they are. So my honor to introduce our wonderful hermana and fierce warrior for our people, our land and our wildlife, Stephanie Garcia Richards. <laughs>
introduction, home and home. I'm kind of emotional because I have trouble down reading this. So it's my uh, privilege to come actually after those two members of our federal de delegation because uh, Martin Heinrich set the stage for my, my uh, dress code, apparently. I'm way overdressed for the people in this room, for those of you on Zoom, hello. Um, this is uh, high heels and, and blazer and pearls is way above kind of the bolo tie level that, that has been established here. So uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm dressing for Washington for a second. Um, and Congress of Women and I did not uh, plan our speeches, but you will see that they very nicely married together. So I am Stephanie Garcia Richard, your state land commissioner, and it is my privilege to be with you here today um, to give the keynote for this, for this conference. Um, I wanted to also thank the Wildlife Federation for putting on this conference for the first time live after two years. Um, it's great to see you all see your beautiful faces in person. Um, so when I was asked to give this address, you will hear from some of the state land office personnel later uh, today and tomorrow on really the details of what we're working on at the state land office around connectivity. In fact, our lovely biologist Katrina Hux is with me here today. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk in detail but I did want to kind of set the stage, give a little bit of context about this, uh, this work. And when I was thinking about this speech, the question came to me, um, why does this work matter? Why do wildlife corridors matter? Now, of course, for those of you in this room and those of you joining us on Zoom, you already know the answer to that question. You're the choir. But there are still voices that think uh, government money should not be spent in this manner. There are folks who doubt that we will even reach the outcomes that we desire with all of this work that we're doing. And so for them and for the general public, for the rest of the Mexicans, the Mountain West, why, why does this work matter? Um, now, when the wildlife and conservation folks successfully lobbied for and then were able to pass our state's Wildlife Corridors Act in 2019, the big message then, the very compelling message, was around public safety. And, you know, uh, New Mexico Department of Transportation, our highway department here in New Mexico, is a prime partner in this wildlife corridors work, in this connectivity work. They're represented here today and tomorrow. Uh, they headed up the Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. And yes, highway safety, public safety, reducing vehicular hump, uh, crashes um, is, is a, a great reason to work on wildlife corridors. But we know that living under the threat of public safety for the last two years, we know that sometimes the public safety message doesn't always resonate with the public, with our fellow citizens. And so I am reminded, like the Congresswoman, of an adage that goes something like, always try to be a better ancestor. More important to be a better ancestor than a better descendant. It's more important to do things for your children than for those who came before you. Because what we are leaving, the legacy of our herencia, like the congresswoman said, is going to impact for generations those who come after us. So this is our moment. This is our moment to be time travelers. This is our moment to have a positive butterfly effect for the folks who will come after us, to really establish, to do everything we can to ensure that we are establishing connectivity for these populations, support for these populations, because it doesn't only impact those populations that we're helping to connect, but the flora and fauna that they interact with as well. It's a whole sort of domino effect that we're working on here. And while we may not live to see the impact of the actions that we're going to take in the next few months, and the next few years, this work goes far beyond the lifetime of a single individual. This work is about the lifetime of population, of communities, of species. And so um, that's kind of the message that I wanted to leave you with around the work that you will be doing 
for the next couple of days. You'll get more detail um, from our landscape level planner at the state land office in your, uh, we have a, a session later today called um, connectivity across jurisdictions. So Bianca Gonzalez is our landscape level planner. She'll talk in detail about how we're really partnering with stakeholders, both federal and state level, advocates, landowners, um, to really work on things like uh, holistic management plans for whole contiguous landscape um, areas. Because at the land office, uh, what it's always been in the past is kind of this one-off leasing um, practice where someone has a particular uh, parcel of state land in mind, wants to do some development of it, comes to the land office, and that development gets uh, approved. What we're looking at with this landscape level planning is more holistic, contiguous, well-rounded uh, development of a particular area. And you'll hear about the White's Peak area, you'll hear about the Chupadera Mesa area, uh, where we have those, those plans in place. Um, So that's, that's, you know, in general, the message that I wanted to leave today, but I, I do want to once again reiterate, as I did two years ago in Taos, that the land office is standing here committed to and ready for partnership. We are partnering with a lot of you here in this room, including the Wildlife Federation, um, on projects and use of our land, um, uh, continu contiguous parcel, um, maintenance plans and uh, development plans, and we continue to, to remain committed to that work. So once again, the work we are doing here today will leave us a better future for those who will come after. It's not about the results that we see necessarily in our lifetimes, um, but for building a better world for those who will come after us. So thank you for allowing me to speak with you this morning. Um, I wish you lots of inspiration and networking and happy connecting. A uh, huge thank you to Representative Ledger Fernandez and our Land Commissioner Stephanie Garcia Richard. Another round of applause. We are, we're extremely fortunate in New Mexico to have conservation leaders like the ones we just heard from. Um, next, I, I'm really privileged to introduce an expert. What you're going to see throughout this four door summit today and tomorrow is we have some of the nation's leading experts working on this work. And, and the next person we're gonna hear from is actually one of the country's leading researchers on ungulate migrations. So I'd like to introduce participating remotely today, uh, Dr. Matt Hoffman. Great, thank you, good morning. Um, can, you, can you hear me all, all fine? All right, I got the thumbs up. So I'm gonna get going here. Well, it's, um, I, I wish I could be there in person, but um, we'll have to do um, over Zoom for this one. It's an honor to follow the remarks of uh, Senator Heinrich, Representative Fernandez and Commissioner Richard, um, who all set a really positive Um, what, I, what I'm going to do is, um, my, my name is Matt Kaufman. I'm a wildlife researcher uh, with the U.S. Geological Survey, also a professor at the University of Wyoming. And um, we've been working on migration issues in Wyoming, and then more recently across the West through USGS. And I'm going to, uh, this morning, tell you a bit about that work. Um, the title I think I was given was Introduction to Habitat Connectivity, but as you can see, 
I've modified it a little bit um, to be also through the lens of ungulate migration, which is, which is the, the aspect of connectivity that I work on. So I'm going to start first with just a definition. Um, habitat connectivity is often defined as the degree to which the landscape facilitates or impedes animal movement and other ecological processes. And I'll come back to this as, as the talk um, progresses. So like I said, I work on migration. And so for these pronghorn, connectivity means you know, their ability to do what they're doing here, which is making their fall migration from their high elevation summer range in Grand Teton National Park to their low elevation winter range near Pinedale, Wyoming. And with the advent of GPS collars that we can use to monitor the movements of, of ungulates like these pronghorn, there's really been a renaissance of uh, how animals migrate, why they migrate, and the importance of connected lands for their migrations. For me and my, my research group and collaborators, that work, uh, a, a part of that work started in over a decade ago when my colleague Hal Sawyer uh, collared mule deer down here in Wyoming's Red Desert. And um, this, uh, give me one second here. Um, everybody thought that the mule deer that lived down in the Red Desert here were, were resident, lived there year round. But when Hall got the collars back, he learned that not only did those animal, were those animals not resident, they make uh, a 150 mile migration, the world's longest that's yet been recorded. And we refer to this as the Red Desert to Hoback migration. Um, You'll see throughout the talk that uh, this, uh, this migration I'll, I'll kind of focus on because this has become kind of the poster child for, for the complexity of long distance migrations in the West and the challenges to conserve them. Um, if you've been to the Upper Green, the Upper Green River Basin here, you'll know why this landscape is so connected because it's basically underpinned by a lot of public land and some big private ranches and only very small towns. But in addition to this long distance migration, there's actually three different strategies here. There, there's animals that make about a 60 mile migration to the southern tips of the winds. And then there's animals that make a 10 or 15 mile migration and stay within the Red Desert year round. And so the fact that on this landscape, there are these three different strategies allows us to ask some questions of if, if there are these other options, why go the 150 miles? What's the benefit of, of that? And so, um, for the last seven or eight years, uh, I've, we've been working to monitor this herd. Uh, one of the things that we do is we recapture these animals and measure their fat reserves. And this is work that is done with my, by my collaborator, collaborator, Dr. Kevin Monteith. Fat is a really important currency um, for mule deer and other temperate ungulates. And this is what you see when you, when you put that fat data together across time. So there's two patterns here that I want to point out. The first is this seesaw pattern. That's the seasonality that almost all temperate ungulates experience. So um, what you're seeing is during the growing season, they put on fat uh, and then we catch them in December. So that's right at the end of the growing season when they've come back to winter range. And then the trough that you're seeing is in March. So that's the end of winter when they've been burning those fat reserves. So that pattern was expected. But the other thing that you see is the difference between the three lines. And remember, the purple is the long distance, the orange is the medium distance, and the green are the short distance. So this shows you the benefit of making that 150 mile migration. Um, the animals that make that 150 mile migration put on way more fat during the growing season and during and while on summer range than those that make medium distance or short distance migrations. migrations. And these are big differences. As you can see, when the animals enter into winter, they have all this fat to burn, which they do burn, which is why there's a steep decline. But the, and the differences, which may seem small down here in March on this graph, are actually can be the difference between life and death. And we've seen much higher um, overwinter survival of the long and medium distance migrants compared to the short distance migrants. The other thing, um, to, well, see, so I'll, I'll move on here, um, but this is a great illustration of the benefit. 
for the for the populations of having these connected landscapes that that allow 150 mile migration. And this has kind of changed. This this type of work is sort of changing how we think of migrations. Um, that long distance migration is two months long in the spring and then another two months in the fall. So for fully for one third of the year, those animals are migrate, migrating. And I don't have time to go into it this morning, but one of the things that we've also learned is especially in the spring, while they're migrating, they're doing something called surfing the green wave, which means as the grass greens up at the lower elevations and then mid elevations and the high elevations, they're following that green up, always allowing them to get sort of this young spring salad mix Niche, which is the most nutritious for them. So whereas we used to think of these migration corridors as just a connection between winter range and summer range, we now think of them as habitat. And it's really important how the animals chore choreograph their movements along the migration in order to get the best uh, forage from that habitat. So there's actually a, third, a fourth strategy that we have recently discovered in this system. In 2018, so this is a long-term study for our group. In 2018, we put new collars out on these animals. And, um, and then, you know, these collars have uh, satellite transmitters. So we're, we're able to see the locations every day. And we were particularly interested in watching this one deer, deer 255, who made the migration up to the upper hoback like all the other animals, but then she kept going. She went around the Grovant Range, down into Jackson Hole, around Jackson Lake, over the northern part of the Tetons to Island Park, um, Idaho. And this was kind of exciting because at this point, you know, we either she had, we had discovered a new migration, that this was her migration, 240 miles one way, um, or she had dispersed and fell in with some Idaho deer and she wasn't coming back. Um, so we were really excited to learn if she would come back. And so we just had to wait until the snow started to pile up in the, in the early winter to see if she would come back to the Red Desert. But then her collar failed and we lost track of her completely. This is a picture of my graduate student, PhD student, Anna Ortega, who did most of the leg, leg work listening for Deer 255 for more than a year and a half with no success. Um, the, the collar just failed completely and we lost complete communication from her and all of her data, which was, um, which made it really difficult to understand what she was doing and whether or not she was coming back. But then in March 2018, we were recatching deer down on that Red Desert winter range, and the helicopter pilots brought in an animal with a malfunctioning collar, and it was deer 255. And so uh, this was really exciting. We, we, we knew at this time that she came all the way back to the Red Desert winter range. We put a fresh GPS collar on her, and um, we were excited to see if you know she would return to Island Park and make another 240 mile migration. And I'm gonna show you what we've learned since 2018. But before I do that, uh, I wanna just take a little detour into, into what we know about how these animals learn to migrate. So when animals migrate or make these, you know, have to navigate big distances, it's thought that those navigation abilities are either innate or learned. And by innate, I mean, you know, encoded in their, in their genes. But for mammals, the thought has always been that, that they had to learn these migrations within their lifetime. And so my uh, former PhD student, Brett Jesmer, recognized that bighorn sheep and all the reintroductions that had happened with bighorn sheep created the opportunity to basically test this idea. So for 70 years, um, conservationists have been restoring sheep to wild, to the former habitats they once occupied before settlement. And in some of those cases, and it's a massive success story, uh, but in some of those cases, managers took sheep that were migratory in their natal range, in their orig original range, and reintroduced them into vacant habitat. And so Brett re realized that that created the opportunity to, to see if the animals would, were migratory in the new range, in their novel range, or whether it took them time to learn how to migrate. And we also had um, some moose that fit uh, the criteria for this type of study as well. So 
most of the most of the sheep and moose that were reintroduced and or colonized new habitats had GPS collars on them, so we could evaluate the propensity of animals to migrate in their new habitats. And this is what and this is what you find. So here is um, time since translocation on the X and percent migratory on the Y. So down here, all these herds that pile up at zero, that's indicating that by and large, when you first reintroduce migratory bighorn sheep into new habitat, they don't migrate. Whereas over here at the 200 year, these are herds that we never lost, herds in Northwest Wyoming uh, and elsewhere that were always existed on that landscape. And those animals are nearly 100% migratory. But then in between are, um, are herds that have been on the landscape for 30, 40, uh, when you get into moose, 80, 90 years or a century. And what you can see, and there's a lot of noise here, but what you can see is that over time, the uh, percent of these animals that are migrating increases. And, and what we're seeing here is these animals learning to migrate on their new landscapes. And this is actually referred to as a type of, of, of animal culture. What's happening here is cultural transmission, animals uh, trying something new, finding a, a, a good place to summer, a good place to winter, passing that on to their young. And over time, the population learns uh, a, a migration and a way to exploit, um, to move to exploit you know, the gradients, the resource gradients on the landscape. And of course, um, this is heartening on the one hand, that, that these migrations can be relearned, but they also take a very long time, many generations, almost a century when it comes to moose. So there's also a cautionary tale about uh, how difficult it could be to restore these migrations if they were lost. So when that study came out, it got um, a fair bit of press. And I, I really like this story by science writer Ed Yong um, because it has this really intriguing and misleading headline. Humans are destroying animals' ancestral knowledge. What's misleading about that is that we are not currently destroying the ancestral knowledge of many of our ungulates. We have many intact migrations uh, across the American West, and those migrations and the knowledge to make those movements still exist in these herds. But when we think about the bighorn sheep, and what happened when the West was settled, that is exactly what we did. We think of the millions of bighorn sheep that were lost on the Western landscapes, but we don't think about the knowledge that was also lost. And, and now we're slowly seeing sheep try to retain that knowledge, regain that knowledge, relearn how to move across these landscapes. So here I wanna come back to our definition of habitat connectivity. And, and I think this is fairly common, um, the degree to which the landscape facilitates. So habitat connectivity for a lot of people, the idea is about um, what's on the ground, the, the topography, the elevation, the rivers, the vegetation, the physical landscape. But this idea of cultural knowledge um, challenges that and, and, and suggests that we need to revise this to in, include extant populations and, and their knowledge of how to move across these landscapes. So, and the, and the question that I would, would, would pose is, you know, if, if there are no longer any animals that have the knowledge to move across a landscape, no matter how connected it is, is it, is it still connected, right? So habitat is not just the, is not just the, the physical landscape, it's, it's also the knowledge that the animals have about how to exploit that landscape. And so obviously this points to the need to maintain the populations that we have and the knowledge they have about how to make a living on these landscapes. Okay, so back to 255. Uh, she's got a fresh new collar. It's um, spring of 2018. And here's the migration uh, that she makes right back to Island Park, basically following in the footsteps of the previous migration that she made. And then in the fall of 2018, she comes once again, follows her footsteps 240 miles back to the winter range. We continue to track her in the summer. She didn't make it all the way up. She 
summer just south of Moran Junction near Grand Teton. In 2020, she made it just past the Tetons. In 2021, she um, stayed by the lake. And um, we just caught up with Deer 255. She's down on her winter range. Um, she has twins. She brought twins back to the winter range with her. So we're hoping that, um, you know, she's going to be teaching those animals how to make this migration um, as they turn into adults. Okay, so um, when we look, when we sort of step back and look at this landscape, you know, the question becomes, why is this landscape connected? How can a migration exist on this landscape? And, and what do we need to do to keep it connected? And one of the things that you see is that this, this landscape, the Upper Green River Basin of Wyoming, is really characterized by public seasonal ranges, public winter ranges and public summer ranges connected by working land. So here you can see, you know, these deer winter on the vast BLM lands uh, in the Red Desert. Uh, this is one of the most intact sagebrush landscapes uh, in North America. And then they summer in these, this is US Forest Service and wilderness areas. So their summer range is public and their winter range is public, but in between, they, they move through these working lands and this herd moves through about 40 different big private ranches. But those private ranches are, um, are compatible with migration as long as the fences aren't, aren't problematic. And so in this case, those working ranch, those, those working lands, the big private ranches sort of stitch together the migration between the, the public summer range and the public winter range. And um, that doesn't mean there aren't challenges. So here's mule deer uh, crossing a swollen river along their spring migration. There's several parts of the migration that cause them to narrow in where they basically have no choice but to cross these rivers. Um, and they're following that green up, so they have to cross the river, you know, whenever it's the right time to do so. Um, in addition to these river crossings, there's also there's about a hundred different fences. There's three or four different highways. This is a connected landscape, but it's becoming less connected with time. And so in working with our partners at the, at the Bureau of Land Management and the, and the Game and Fish Department, we recognized that we needed a better way to understand what connectivity means for this migration. Basically, what is the part of the landscape? Where is the corridor that needs to, that, that where connectivity needs to be maintained as, as this part of Wyoming continues to grow? And so to do that, we pioneered um, this effort to map corridors by basically, and I'm not gonna go into the details here, but basically taking these squiggly lines that you get from downloading the collars, doing some analyses on them to, to come up with this sort of heat map. And with a heat map, you can now look at like um, the intensity of use and, and in purple here is the high use. Um, and we might think of that as like the interstate. That's essentially the, the segment of the corridor that the highest proportion of the population uses. And, and in fact, um, it's, it's um, analyses and polygons like these of the corridors that the state wildlife agency in Wyoming has used to designate um, that red desert to hoback herd. When that herd was mapped, we were also able to look at just some of the problem spots like this, this and the, the one that jumped out was this Fremont Lake bottleneck. This is a place where 5,000 animals move through a quarter mile bottleneck, squeezed between the town of Pinedale and, and Fremont Lake, this deep glacial lake. When they, here they are on their migration, they're basically forced to swim this outlet. Sometimes they have to walk across thin ice. Sometimes they fall through and die. So this is, this is literally a gauntlet that they have to run through. And, it's comp and it was complicated by a 360 acre parcel of private land that was slated for development and up for sale. But once we mapped this migration and identified that risk, uh, the conservation fund uh, raised the money to purchase that property and turn it into a wildlife habitat management area, remove the fences and open up the bottleneck. So this is a, sort of an example of the type of conservation actions that, that this detailed mapping can facilitate. Also, uh, in the Red Desert, there's quite a bit of oil and gas leasing. And when you can see um, existing leases and, and leases under consideration on this map, 
But because this corridor was mapped in 18 and 19, 24,000 acres of leases in this corridor, in this area right here in the Red Desert, were deferred by the federal government because they were deemed um, to put the, the, the functionality of the corridor too much at risk. So again, this mapping can help us better plan on, on federal lands. I'm gonna fast forward to 2018. I know you all are gonna have some discussions about um, Secretary 3362, and I just wanna tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing to map migration corridors. Um, Zinke, Trump's first interior secretary, of course, signed this secretarial order. Um, it called on USGS, which is my employer, to work with Western states to map migration corridors. And we've, we've met that charge by putting together something we call the corridor mapping team. Um, we've been meeting weekly since early 2019. We now have representation from all 11 Western states and three or four different tribes. Um, and the goal of this team is basically to, there's a lot of states have collected this data, um, but haven't mapped them. And, and the mapping is a little bit technical and, um, and every herd is a little bit different. And so the goal of this team is to work together to analyze these data sets, basically produce those corridor maps uh, that I just showed you, and then uh, publish those and make them, make them publicly available so that all sorts of different stakeholders can use the corridor maps to advance conservation and management. And so here's just a couple examples of the maps. This is one that's in volume two. Um, this is a mule deer herd that actually gets up into Canada, uh, starts out in Washington state. Here's um, a mule deer herd that some of you no doubt are familiar with, the Rosa herd, which winters um, in uh, New Mexico, um, also moves through some tribal land and uh, summers up in Colorado. Here's a mule deer herd in Idaho, which actually um, occupies three different states, Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. And that's been one of the advantages of, of working together as a team because we can now produce corridor maps that um, transcend the jurisdictional boundaries between states and other uh, jurisdictions and land ownership. And then uh, here's an example of a mule deer herd that, that we've been working on in Wyoming in partnership with the um, Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribal game and fish on the Wind River Reservation. And you can see here, this is a population that winters um, almost exclusively on the reservation, but then uh, during the spring migrates off the reservation onto the forest and some even getting to Grand Teton National Park. So um, this is what the reports are. They're basically just, it's basically an atlas of the migration corridors. Um, we published our first volume in November of 2020, which included uh, 48 herds in I think five different states. Volume two is gonna come out early next month, early April, 2022, which will include another 64 herds. Um, and I think we're up to eight states now and one or a couple, a couple tribes um, and volume three, we just finished volume three and sent it to the publication process and it will include another 50 or 60 herds. Um, all, almost all states are included in volume three now, all 11 Western states, again, three or four tribes, um, and that will come out in late, uh, late 2022, later this year in December. So this is um, kind of what the what the migrations look like to date. These are the, the corridors that have been mapped in volume one and volume two. Um, as you can see, you know, we're, we're starting to get a west-wide look at this, um, but this doesn't mean, uh, so where you see gaps does not mean that there aren't migratory herds there. It just means that either the state hasn't yet uh, mapped those herds or contributed um, those maps to this, to this process, or that they haven't been they haven't yet been collared, um, but uh, but we have a start on it, and um, and we we're gaining momentum, and and I suspect that you know over the next three to five years we'll have a very good picture of uh, the migrations across the Western U.S. So lastly, just want to mention, um, of course, what you can do with these maps, and that's of course I think one of the most exciting things about about getting these herds mapped is that we can then, uh, the, the approach here is to allow the animals to tell us where they need to go on the landscape and when. 
And once you have that information, you can um, better understand where some of the problem spots are. And we're seeing that kind of approach of using the, the migration maps to advance science-based conservation. We're seeing that you know, spread across the West uh, in very, um, in very effect and in, 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 in ways that make conservation very effective for these migrations. So here's an example from uh, a mule deer herd in Nevada, the Pequot herd, which crosses Interstate 80 and this Highway 93. Nevada Department of Transportation and, and Nevada Department of Wildlife identified these as hot spots after after the mapping and in conjunction with um, with all the carcass surveys, and they put in overpasses and underpasses in these sections, which are shown on the map. If we zoom into the one in the middle, you can see that um, before the overpasses and underpasses were constructed, a lot of mortalities, and then afterwards, those have been dramatically reduced. So these have been really effective when, they, when they're put in the right place. Um, of course, this is the West, and so even the small towns and municipalities and suburban and residential growth can impede on these migrations. Utah is um, the first example that I'm aware of where a municipality has um, tried to create some zoning to maintain a migration corridor. And this is in Eagle Mountain, Utah. Here's the mule deer herd that winters to the south here, migrates along this, this um, ridge and then down through this, this sort of urban suburban area to summer range. And if I blow up this inset, you can see here where the, where the migration goes through the most highly developed or area that's at most highest risk of development, the, the city government has proposed a, a corridor uh, to protect this herd, to limit development in the corridor. It's narrow at times, but um, this is the first attempt at um, maintaining these corridors through areas that are, that are rapidly being developed for residential housing. Uh, and then finally circling back to um, uh, Deer 255, that's her track in purple there as she goes to the upper green. And this is, an, this is a kind of a shot of those working lands. Uh, the private lands are here in white. The green are conservation easements. And so this is a, um, a real a, a popular and can be a very effective way at maintaining uh, the open space that these migrations require where they go through uh, private lands. So most, a lot of these conservation easements were put in place because this is great sage grouse habitat, but increasingly the NRCS and USDA are starting to focus on migration corridors and winter ranges as a, as a place um, to guide um, their work on private lands and their work to conserve big private lands and prevent them from being subdivided. So then finally, I wanna kind of zoom out here. Um, this is the landscape that I've, been, that I've been talking about where the Red Desert to Hoback migrants move, where Deer 255 moves. This is the Greater Yellowstone. Clearly, this is a connected landscape, as you can tell by the, the mule deer, um, bighorn sheep, uh, elk, pronghorn, and moose that migrate across this region. This is a fairly remarkable region tied by um, national forests and, and national parks. But, but this is also, when you look at the migrations, this is an example of the types of working landscapes that support migrations all across the West. And I'm sure um, there are numerous places like this in New Mexico as well. Um, and I think for me, uh, the, I would end on a positive note and suggest that, you know, I think at this point, we have the science to understand uh, where these landscapes need to be connected, at least for migratory ungulates. And we have a lot of tools in the toolbox um, that uh, with good partnerships and collaboration can be put to work to maintain uh, these types of connected landscapes and maintain these migrations. And um, so I hope hopefully those tools and, um, and approaches will be discussed over the next two days. And uh, it sounds, it's great to see that this summit is occurring and, and the momentum with the state's wildlife corridors action plan. Um, and um, I understand there's some new funding from the state legislature for crossing structures and other, and mitigating um, problems on the roadways. So uh, hopefully I, New Mexico seems poised to make a lot of progress over the next two days towards the effort of maintaining connectivity and migrations in, uh, in your state. So appreciate um, taking the time to, to visit and 
If we have any time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, would you provide folks with a way to uh, follow your work? Is there a way folks can keep tabs on what's going on and, and contact you with additional questions? Yeah, um, let's see. Sorry, I just uh, lost my ability to control my computer. <laughs> Let's see, I need to get rid of this pointer. There it goes. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll just zip right up to the top here, um, which has my email and, so there's my email, that's my primary email. Um, you can, uh, we have a lot of this information at migrationinitiative.org. Um, and then in the chat here, I'll, I'll post, um, a link to the to the Western Migrations uh, publication. Thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, very much appreciated and very impressive work. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that's here in person today. Thank you so much for making the trip and coming out to join us for this summit. Also, like to thank all of the people who are participating virtually. And uh, I, we probably couldn't have pulled off this hybrid model without the tremendous assistance from the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. How about a round of applause for the department? And my, uh, my counterpart here, Adrian Angulo, has done a phenomenal job working with the department and getting this all set up. It's, uh, it can be more challenging than it seems to do a hybrid type of meeting like this, where we have pre presenters and audience virtual, and we have presenters and, and uh, we have Presenters and audience virtual, and we also have attendees who are virtual and attendees who are in person. So it gets kind of challenging and complicated. But I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this really important work. The next panel that we're going to be hearing from uh, is actually the team who worked together to create the New Mexico State Wildlife Corridors Action Plan, one of the very first plans of its kind. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves as they come up and provide a little bit more thorough background. What they're going to be discussing is the background and the process of the Wildlife Corridors Action Plan. They're going to provide an overview of the top 11 priorities uh, of the plan. And then we're going to talk, they're going to talk about implementation into the plan. And there will be opportunity for questions and answers uh, at the end of this panel. So at this time, I'd like to bring up Mark Watson, Matt Haverman, Jeremy Romero, and I believe participating virtually will have Dr. Patricia Kramer. So uh, come on up, folks. I bought this about an hour yesterday, so if you want to grab a drink now, uh, go ahead and do that. Or go to the bathroom, yeah. I'm not allowed to get up after that. All right, well, uh, everybody, uh, my name is Matt Hyreland. I'm the Wildlife Coordinator for the New Mexico Department of Transportation. I do want to thank you all for joining this presentation today. Uh, this is a uh, it's quite a big team effort, but we do have a few other of the uh, members of the Wild Forest Action Plan team here to help me present. Uh, joining us virtually is Dr. Patricia Kramer. She is a independent road ecologist. I also have someone right here, Mark Watson, uh, uh, the Department of Game and Fish, and Jerry Romero at the uh, New Mexico Wildlife Federation. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, putting on this summit. There are a number of people in this room that have been very supportive of this action plan over the past two, two and a half years, whatever it actually took us to complete it. Uh, there's also a number of people here who were uh, very key in actually helping draft and pass the Wildlife Forest Act, which led to the creation of this action plan. 
So, uh, you know, thank you for all those efforts. It's, uh, it's a great legacy for the state. Next slide, please. As I was just saying a second ago, this was a very large team effort. Uh, you know, as you've probably seen in your, uh, going over the action plan, I'm sure you all memorized it front to back by now. Uh, it is a, a multidisciplinary team, uh, you know, with the identification of different wildlife corridors, different wildlife you know, poison hotspots, uh, you know, uh, monitoring efforts, uh, impacts of climate change in the future. You know, we needed a, a wide variety of road ecologists, wildlife biologists, uh, GIS analysts, engineers. And so it was a, a huge team effort. And uh, you probably can't read that uh, from there, but just, just trust me that we had a, a, a great background, uh, a great uh, team pulled together. I do want to thank Daniel B. Stevens and Associates who was the, uh, the primary consultant on this project. Uh, and they're, they were led by Dr. Jean-Luc Cartron, who did an excellent job of hand-selecting uh, what, what I kind of refer to as a dream team for, for this type of project. Uh, not listed here are the NGOs and tribes that uh, did participate uh, quite a bit in providing us with uh, some, some data, as well as just information and input. And, uh, the, the plan uh, does does call them out, so uh, I'm going to go through that now. But I do want to just give a shout out to them also. Next slide, please. So what we're going to cover today, uh, this is a very similar presentation to what we gave during the, uh, the public comment period, but we, we did make some modifications. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about the history uh, of wildlife mitigation projects across the state. Uh, this has been going on for several years now, uh, and it kind of built up to the point of actually passing the Wildlife Borders Act and creating, a, uh, creating this action plan. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the tasks completed in creating the Wildlife Borders Action Plan and our final top 11 priority project areas. Uh, and then we're going to discuss on what the future holds for the implementation of the action plan and the steps that we plan on taking to get there. With that, I'm going to pass this off to Mark Watson. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Watson. I'm the terrestrial habitat specialist with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish out of our Santa Fe office. And I'm also the department lead for the Wildlife Corridors Act implementation. And I'm going to provide a short history of uh, wildlife vehicle collision mitigation efforts in New Mexico. And apologies to those of you in the room that have already seen this, which is probably most of you here in the room, but I think it provides some useful context and potentially some lessons on how to move forward with implementation of additional projects under the Wildlife Corridors Act. And currently, there's about 10 completed wildlife vehicle collision mitigation projects in the state. Those are indicated on the map by the green stars. And these projects have been driven primarily by uh, legislative memorials and or driver safety concerns. And before the passage of the Wildlife Corridors Act, there was really no clear method for how to propose and implement wildlife vehicle collision mitigation projects. Next slide, please. So the first project completed in New Mexico was US 550 between Aztec and the Colorado border in the early 2000s. And in the late 1990s, a legislator from the Farmington area contacted both New Mexico Department of Transportation and Game and Fish and urged both agencies to do something to reduce the high rate of deer vehicle collisions on US 550 between Aztec and the Colorado border. And that was probably the highest deer vehicle collision rate in the state at the time. And so DOT implemented a project, uh, the Mexico Department of Human Fish assisted with locations for culverts and passages. The project basically replaced three small corrugated metal culverts like you see in the photograph with large concrete box culverts large enough for mule deer to move through. 
The project also implemented about three miles of fencing and uh, which directs wildlife, primarily mule deer, but other animals to the crossing. Next slide, please. When I did want to mention thousands of mule deer have been documented moving through those box culverts by Jeff Gagnon with Arizona Game and Fish and his crew. And Jeff is here today and he's a member of our Wildlife Corridors Act team. And he's under contract with the Mexico Department of Transportation Research Bureau to do that monitoring and multiple uh, wildlife passages that we have associated with wild or uh, large game animal vehicle collision projects in the state. So in 2003, uh, Wild Friends and Senator, well, formerly Representative Mimi Stewart, passed House Joint Memorial 3. Uh, it was sponsored by Wild Friends, which is a group of uh, school kids, ages or grades 4 through 12 in the state that are organized by the UNM School of Law. And Representative Mimi Stewart sponsored the bill, and it broadly directed Game and Fish and DOT to work together to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions in the state. And that was passed by the legislature and signed by Governor Richardson in 2003. Next slide, please. As a direct outcome of House Joint Memorial 3, the New Mexico Carnivore Working Group sponsored the Critical Mass Workshop in June of 2003. And that basically brought together uh, state and federal wildlife biologists, DOT staff and engineers, uh, environmental consultants, conservationists, and uh, citizen scientists and concerned citizens that were interested in doing something to uh, reduce large game animal or wildlife uh, mortality along our highways. So we brought in uh, expert speakers and researchers from around the Western states that had planned and implemented wildlife vehicle collision mitigation projects that presented to the group. And the group also took a first stab at prioritizing large game animal or wildlife vehicle collision mitigation sites in the state. And Tijetas Canyon, I-40 Tijetas Canyon was prioritized as one of the top four critical areas in the state. Next slide, please. During the critical mass workshop, we learned from DOT about an upcoming I-40 uh, Tijetas Canyon highway improvement project. So a direct outcome of that critical mass workshop was the formation of the Tijetas Passage, Tijetas Canyon Safe Passage Coalition. And that was a group made up primarily of citizens that lived on the east side of Albuquerque and commuted into town on a daily basis and had either seen wildlife hit or had hit uh, wildlife themselves. And most of the wildlife hitting hit was mule deer, but also black bears. And the coalition was really instrumental in getting the Tijetas Canyon Safe Passage Project implemented. Next slide, please. And that, that does provide a good model, I think, for how to proceed with projects implemented under the Wildlife Cor uh, Corridors Act is to have local coalitions of people that are really advocates for these projects. So as a result of the advocacy of the Tijetas Canyon Safe Passage Coalition, uh, they actually encouraged DOT to conduct the first feasibility study in the state that DOT had ever done for a wildlife passage project. And so the Tijetas Canyon Safe Passage project was implemented and finalized in 2007. And it included about five miles of fence, which are indicated in red here, and, and the state's first at-grade crosswalk for wildlife, which are indicated in the yellow arrows there. And this is looking south from the Hawk Watch property, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. And that's I-40 at the top and New Mexico Highway 333 on the bottom. And then Albuquerque's on the right-hand side. And so once deer or other wildlife get across that crosswalk, at New Mexico 333, they can drop down into Tijetas Arroyo and move down about a quarter to a half a mile and go under the freeway I-40 at a series of large bridges. And so a key component of that project was uh, the Hawk Watch property, which is a 63-acre property, uh, canyon property that funnels wildlife down to our at Great Crossing. And that uh, property was for sale by Hawk Watch 
And we had a couple of champions, Senator Martin Heinrich, who was at the time on the Albuquerque City Council, and Scott Wilbur, who's the uh, executive director of New Mexico Land Conservancy. And they both worked to get this property purchased and protected as Albuquerque open space. And it is managed as a uh, wildlife corridor. And the Hawkwatch property is indicated on the map in purple. And so that's really a key message, I think, for moving forward is wherever you implement wildlife crossings, you really need to have guarantees of habitat protection on either side, especially in the case of wildlife overpasses that may go outside of the highway right of way. Next slide. And so last but not least, uh, a current ongoing project is along I-25 between Raton and the Colorado border where DOT is constructing the state's first arch culvert underpass for wildlife and it's got a, a natural substrate bottom. And we're hoping that deer and elk will use this underpass and other wildlife as well. And Jeff and his crew will be monitoring uh, wildlife usage of this underpass. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeremy. Thanks, Mark. I'm just gonna take a couple minutes here to uh, just kind of talk about the past history of SB 228, New Mexico Wildlife Corridors Act uh, up until the, the signing of that bill. So as I mentioned, uh, leading up to the signing of SB 228, there really was a, a robust effort at the grass tops and the grassroots level by, by various uh, conservation organizations in New Mexico. Um, and, and I, I want to just take a moment real quick to acknowledge really the, the heavy lifting and all the effort that those organizations did. So a lot of those folks are here in the room today, but for those of you that don't know, a lot of the organizations that, that ultimately helped lead a lot of the advocacy issues and efforts to build collaboration, increase education and collaboration amongst, amongst the community and, and the, the local elected officials. So, you know, groups like Defenders of Wildlife, Michael Dax sitting in front of us, he really did a lot of the heavy lifting during that bill, you know, meeting it up front with different com uh, committee members during different committee hearings and really did a lot of the, the heavy lifting defending that bill. Other groups were Wildlands Network, New Mexico Wildlife Federation, National Wildlife Federation, as well as New Mexico Wild and other groups like Backcountry Hunter and Anglers and T uh, Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Really together, this large consortium of groups leading both the grass tops and the grassroots level really worked together to make sure that this bill from the start of its drafting phase to its signage really represented the, the dynamics of, of our communities, our diverse communities here in New Mexico. And so, Really, I think if it wasn't for such a large monumental effort from the heavy lifting that some of these organizations did all the way down to the, the grassroots and the grass tops uh, advocacy, you know, with the, with the support that we had both at the federal level and the state level, it really was a unique opportunity to, to get a bill like this passed. So I'm super grateful and thankful to all those that, that participated. And the only thing I didn't mention is, you know, during those committee hearings, when, when Michael and other folks were defending this bill, you know, Department of Transportation also played a, a key role in, in participating in that and making sure that that, uh, that dynamic and, and the goals of this bill were really understood and educated to those, those committee members and, and, our, and our state uh, leaders. So just a little quick background on the bill, and I just wanted to, to make sure I emphasize that work leading it up into it because, you know, the, the plan itself is, is something really, really amazing and something uh, pretty cutting edge, but I just wanted to acknowledge all the work that, that went into it. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to pass it, pass it off. Yeah, so uh, kind of the, the main objective of the Wildlife Quarters Act was to direct the DOT as well as the Game of Fish to work cooperatively in drafting this Wildlife Quarters Action Plan. Uh, the, the act does spell out what the plan should include, but the, the main point really was to identify wildlife linkages across the state that are important for large mammal movement and migration, and to identify highway segments where we, we can promote motor safety and, and wildlife connectivity. Uh, the Wildlife Quarters Action Plan also encourages the DOT and the Game Fish to use the best available science and to collaborate with tribal governments, non-government agencies, uh, organizations, sorry, and uh, federal land management agencies, private landowners, 
and so on in uh, completing this objective. Next slide, please. Uh, the act does kind of spell out the, uh, the focal species that the, the life forage action plan should focus on. Uh, it does def define six large mammals uh, that you can see here, black bear, bighorn sheep, mountain lion, uh, mule deer, pronghorn, and elk. Uh, the act does also mention that we should focus or uh, consider species of concern also and kind of lays out the, um, the guidelines for compiling that list, but Mark is gonna go into that in a little more detail later on. One thing I do uh, want, want to make clear, kind of, kind of a side note, is that the Wildlife Quarters Act does make it clear that private landowners don't have to participate in uh, the, the implementation of these mitigation projects if they choose not to. Uh, even though one third of the state or approximately one third is public land. A, a number of these uh, priority project areas do occur in areas that are uh, blurred by private lands. Uh, even though private landowners, landowners don't have to participate, we do encourage it uh, not only uh, to help um, create you know, more you know, safer roads for motorists and to reconnect wildlife habitat, but uh, the landowners could also benefit from it, such as participating in conservation easements as well. And so even though the Wildlife Quarters Act does direct the DOT and Game and Fish to work cooperatively on creating this action plan, uh, you know, being government workers, it sounded like a lot of work. So we decided to hire consultants for it. We did receive five excellent proposals. Uh, as you can see there on the desk, they're very thorough. Uh, the, the top proposal that we did select was from Daniel B. Stevens and Associates. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they really hand selected a, a, a crack team of biologists and, and engineers uh, to help uh, create this wildlife forage action plan. With that, I'm going to pass it to Dr. Kramer. Hello from Florida at the moment. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Just want to make sure. Okay, we are interacting. Great. Well, hello everyone. Um, I see there's 40 participants out there um, in the Zoom call and several dozen of you out there in person. So um, thank you for inviting us to tell you more about the action plan. Um, our team was wonderful. People did amazing amounts of work well beyond what they were paid for. Um, and I do want to mention too that I want that I would love the action plan to be dedicated to our family members we lost during the making of the plan. So four of us um, lost either our parents or our spouse's parents during the plan. So it was a tough time for several of us and that might've been part of the reason why it took a little longer. Um, but we, we delivered to you something that we're very proud of and that we are um, showing you it really was not only a team effort, but we reached out to many of you in the audience and, and the public, which you'll learn more about as we go through the various tasks. So the tasks you see there are the ones that were written into um, what we call the RFP or request for proposals and uh, were part of what the act told us we had to do. So we will get into each one of those tasks. We'll go to the next slide. And uh, we'll jump into task number one was uh, data gathering. We had a lot of information to work with um, from the work that many of you have already done. So with the DOT, we brought in information from crash data. I do wanna mention one of the good things about um, the crash reporting, um, the software that the, the officers use is it gives them a species pull down menu. And please make sure that always stays because it's so important to know what animals were involved in what crashes because it helps us figure out what the best mitigation is. So on the right there, you'll see a map of all the deer crashes in New Mexico on New Mexico DOT lands. Another important part of this is to understand that in any given state, the DOT only administers about 25% of the roads. So you can basically see all the DOT roads in this map, but there are many more county, forest service, and other um, roads that are there that we're not getting the data for. So when we tell you there's approximately 2,000 crashes with animals. I, I'm not sure of the exact number right now, annually. Know that there's many more than the ones that we see reported here. 
The DOT also gave us information on traffic volume, which is important to see where the high volume places are, such as the interstates, um, where animals will have a very hard time getting across, the severity of crashes with animals, and many other bits of information. New Mexico Game and Fish gave us information on habitat, um, where collared animals were moving and where uh, areas were of most concern for the agency. Our tribal partners did a great job of, of sharing um, GPS data and habitat maps of where they knew the animals were moving on their lands, as well as carcass and crash data. Our academic researchers in the University of New Mexico, Heritage Program helped us with species of concern. The nonprofit organizations uh, helped us look at what corridors were most important. And we did build on past modeling publications such as those done by Kurt Menke and others. So we'll go on to uh, the next slide. Um, Mark is going to tell us, Mark Watson will tell us more about the species of concern that were selected um, in this task uh, one of the data gathering and selection. <clears throat> right. So the Wildlife Corridors Act specifically directed that both agencies develop, or that Game and Fish develop a species of concern list in addition to the uh, six large game animal focal species. So we worked directly with a number of mammalogists in the state and our state herpetologist, Leland Pierce at Game and Fish, to add an additional nine mammal species to the six large big game animal focal species and four reptiles that were um, adversely affected by habitat fragmentation from roads and significantly affected by roadkill mortality. Next slide, please. We were also directed by the Wildlife Corridors Act to develop distribution maps for those species of concern. So we worked directly with Dr. Jean-Luc Cartron at Daniel B. Stevens and Associates and his staff to develop these maps. And some of these maps were actually adapted from an upcoming book that he and Dr. Jennifer Fry from New Mexico State University will be publishing uh, in spring of next year called the Wild Carnivores of New Mexico. And these maps took a lot of time and effort to develop. We used the most recent information uh, using data points, new, relatively new data points gathered from iNaturalist and or uh, photo traps around the state and other locational data. Um, we also, yeah. Go ahead, Patty. Back to you. Yeah. So one of the wonderful um, uh, additions to New Mexico Wildlife Corridor's action plan was looking at climate change. When you look at what other states are doing, they don't necessarily look at climate change. It's very important in New Mexico because Arizona and New Mexico are already experiencing some of the worst effects of climate change and the prediction models for the future show that these two states are the most highly affected by um, drought and, temp and higher temperatures. So Dr. Catron, um, in his um, uh, forthcoming book on the uh, wild carnivores in New Mexico, he worked with Dr. David Gutz Gutzler, a climatologist, and Dr. Jack Tripek um, to, to model what's going to change in New Mexico. So if you take a look at the upper right map there, what, we, what, we, what I'd like you to focus on is looking at the east and the south part of New Mexico and what's going to happen. So your grasslands, which are more of the hot colors that you see in the upper, upper right map there, are going to start to become deserts. So on the bottom two maps, the left map is, are the, um, this, the ecosystem types that we have, and on the right is what's going to happen in the next 50 years. So your grasslands are going to start to dry up and become desert. And that's going to start intruding into your state from the east and very much heavily um, from the south up. So your wildlife need to move. And of course, you're going to get a lot more um, disturbance processes such as fire, um, drought, there may be some um, springtime flooding. So we've already started to see this um, in other states such as California, that when there's great big fires and animals need to move, or there's droughts and there's no water in the areas they used to go, animals are beginning moving across the landscape to get to what they need to survive. You're going to see animals getting hit more often on roads if you don't supply them with wildlife crossing structures. So the climate change models helped us predict where the most important places were, which are going to be areas where animals can move north or westward, 
and also up in elevation into the mountains where um, it won't be changed as radically. So that was an important part of um, the action plan as well. Next slide. All right, on to task number two. This was a uh, this took years. Task two was the heavy lifting of our of our action plan. On the left here, you'll see hotspot modeling based on crash data, and on the right, you'll see habitat linkage modeling based on species predicted movements. Um, what they did is what what our teams did is we did both of them in parallel. So um, the modeling on the left, the hotspot crash data, we looked at solely, and I think this is important to remember solely crash data, which are reported crashes to traffic safety people like Highway Patrol. And we modeled the hotspots based on crashes per mile per year. We used an ArcGIS tool called the Optimized Hotspot Modeling Analysis Tool that used the Geddes or GI statistics. So we, it was very scientific to show you where the greatest concentration of hotspots were. And we have 50 or 60 of them across the state. We, we selected the top 10 to continue to work with. On the right, our modeling team, which was led by Dr. Sam Cushman, used <clears throat> Unicor. And if you could just back up the slide for just a moment, I wanted to show the, what I call the fuzzy caterpillars. Oh, nope. We'll go back to task two. Yes, on the right there, I just wanted to show you the different colored fuzzy caterpillars. Those, those are different uh, modeling results for six of the target, uh, the, the species, the target species that we were looking at. Um, and we had Dr. Krishman model where those animals need to move across the entire landscape and then each species, and then we combine those models. And of course, yes, that's perfect. The unicorn model is uh, what Dr. Uh, Juan and Dr. Um, Cushman used to look at the species. Next slide, please. To go into that linkage modeling a little bit, I'll just explain it very briefly, you know, 35,000 foot level. <clears throat> the entire state of New Mexico is broken up into pixels that were 30 by 30 meters. <clears throat> and many factors were put into each pixel. The GIS layers that were piled up, such as the, the habitat type, the land use, this precipitation, the elevation, to look at what would be the best places for each of the six species. So what you're looking at right now is what would be good for mountain lions, which are very ubiquitous across the United States. Almost every place in the state is pretty good for them, except for places where humans are dominating the landscape, which you see in the, the resistance layer on the right and the roads. Those different layers were laid across uh, on top of one another and then random points um, were thrown in to mimic uh, the movement of different animals. And the model was run many times to start to look at where the most important places were, which you see in that combined central map there. Um, that shows roads and where um, mountain lions would be crossing over roads. Most of the roads you see in this are um, far service roads in the mountains and we don't have to be really concerned, but we were looking for places that mountain lions needed to move between um, different areas. I do, want to, I do want to use this opportunity <clears throat> to help define the difference between linkages and corridors. So when we talk about linkages, which is where we started from, there were big areas and wide swaths of how animals would get from a similar habitat to another one in, in a very large protected area, such as between mountain ranges. When those linkages crossed roads, we started to call them corridors and um, defined much more specifically in less than, a, in, say, about a mile in width at most, where the corridors were within the greater linkages. And again, these are just human hypotheses because many of, this, um, many of these data points and information were based on uh, much more limited data than what you saw um, Dr. Matt Kaufman present for Wyoming because New Mexico is catching up to what uh, other states have had done. So the modeling was uh, our, our best bet on what we would hope would be, but we weren't, weren't sure, so we brought in information. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll show you a little bit more about the information that we used. With those wildlife vehicle collision hotspots, we had 10, and the act told us to bring it down to five. So instead of just choosing the hotspots um, where animals are getting killed on the road, um, uh, prioritizing them based on crashes per mile. We looked at transportation factors such as the traffic volume, which again, high volume areas are going to be very difficult for animals to get um, across. So the places with the traffic volume that was higher 
got more points. So we gave points to all these different factors. We looked at wildlife um, information, such as the species of concern, if those 20, uh, the 20 different species of, of special concern were in there, we gave it a, a road segment, a couple more points. And then we looked at feasibility, if we could get a crossing structure, because some of the places that were um, highly privately owned in, in, in cities, um, they didn't rank as high because it was gonna be real difficult to put in crossing structures. So then it rearranged our top 10 priorities to the top five based on um, many, many factors. Then on the right, the wildlife corridors, again, I, I talk about the modeling, but that was not the only thing that we used. And I wanna make that clear. It wasn't just our hypotheses about where animals needed to move. We looked at um, Secretarial Order 3362 priority areas for the state, which you'll learn more about later today. We brought in any collaring data that we could use from the game and fish and the tribal um, collars, um, any, any photographs that are being taken by uh, trail cameras that you might call them or camera traps out there on the landscape, carcass and crash data, and any other priorities that um, our agency partners had. So we brought in a lot of information for the corridors as well. Go to the next slide. On task number three, our, our wonderful crews went out on the landscape to start looking at what we should do in these places. Now, we, what I'm taking you with uh, from is a, a big New Mexico, the entire state analysis down to very specific areas. So our teams went out to the top 10 crash hotspots, which were a lot of places, and the top six corridors to see what we could do. So um, in, in the, in the uh, room there with you is, is Jeff Gagnon, um, um, who was part of the teams who helped create this um, ArcGIS Survey123 app. Um, his team helped create this so the, the field crews could identify everything on their phones. Mark Watson there on your panel was out on the, everyone on the panel, Mark Watson, Jeremy Romero, Matt Haverland, also Chad Loberger um, and Julie Cutts of our team were out there and they looked at over 377 locations on these places and they recorded information about existing culverts, bridges, and potential places for overpasses. So it was lots and lots of information. What you're seeing there right now is US 550 north of uh, Cuba and all the places they looked at and what they suggested we should put fence in to guide animals to existing structures and future structures. So very detailed information in the middle of a pandemic. Now I wanna talk a little bit about what we recommended and um, fill you in on a little bit of the science if you don't know as much as, as the rest of us who live and breathe this every day. There's different kinds of culverts, which um, we haven't, we as scientists, myself um, and Jeff Gagnon, um, I, I do wanna say that um, Jeff and I have monitored hundreds of wildlife crossing structures in the West. Between the two of us, we've probably monitored as much if not more than everyone else put together. So we know a lot about what ungulates will and will not use. And our understanding of elk, which I call the problem child, is that they typically won't go through culverts like this the way mule deer do. So in places where we have problems with elk, we recommend, next slide, we recommend uh, we recommended bridges and overpasses. So we know that particularly in Arizona, <clears throat> elk will go through structures that you, like you see here with mule deer pictures. Um, and so we recommended pretty good open space bridges for elk and overpasses. And then if we, if we had mostly a mule deer problem, we recommended culverts and bridges, depending on the flow of water, the ownership of land, et cetera. The next slide shows you some of the overpasses that are out there on the landscape um, in different nearby states. So if you could go to the overpass slide, um, on the lower left is the Arizona overpass that was built for desert bighorn, which we do have here in New Mexico in our act, excuse me, in our action plan. It's only 50 feet wide and before these overpasses were finished, the, the bighorn were using them. We also find that um, overpasses can be a little bit wider than 50 feet and some of the other ones you see here. I do wanna mention something um, that cost is going to come into your discussion. And I wanted to just give you a real big general um, answer for cost. If it's over two lanes, like the picture on the upper left there in Colorado, it's approximately a million dollars a lane. So about $2 million to get an overpass over there if you've got something like the eight lanes of traffic on the right in Utah, it's about $8 million. So very, very rough estimates. The, the, the wider the highway, the more the overpass will cost. But sometimes overpasses can be cheaper than underpasses if the landscape is above the highway, and particularly if it's just a two-lane road. So 
just keep that in mind when you start to look at some of our suggestions in these places. So we'll go to the next slide. So we also did a, um, a benefit cost analysis, but I wanna explain that although the act told us that we had to do that, it did not factor in to what, what places were priorities or how much things would cost. We just gave that to you at the end to show you how much these places would cost and if they could pay for themselves over 70 years, 75 years. So the benefits were how much we could reduce wildlife vehicle collisions with the mitigation, uh, that would be in the numerator and the cost would be in the denominator, which is the cost of the proposed mitigation. So just to give the DOT and uh, those of you in, in a place to be able to find some money for these things, an idea. Next slide. We developed the action plan, which I'll tell you more underneath task seven. Right now we're gonna to go to task six about the public involvement and Matt Haverlin is gonna tell you more about that. Thank you, Patty. Yes, uh, so the Wide Quarters Act was specific that we did need to involve the public and uh, different tribal organizations as well as for, uh, federal land management agencies. And we actually kicked off the public involvement part uh, pretty early on. The Wildlife Corridors Action Plan contract was awarded, I think it was fall 2019. And by very early 2020, we began uh, reaching out to uh, tribal organizations and, and the general public, uh, sending notice letters to inform them of our intent of creating this plan. We did schedule uh, eight public meetings, five of which we actually were able to hold. However, as we all know, uh, the pandemic came around. I think they were actually driving to Silver City for the public meeting when uh, the order was issued for, um, you know, no more public meetings. <laughs> so we, we, we did make some progress with that. Uh, and we, we did have a pretty good turnout across the board. Uh, we also had a, a website and email account set up for people to submit public comments to. Uh, the following year, 2021, early in the year, uh, we did have a, uh, a progress report that we did post to the website for people to, uh, to kind of view and see how much progress we'd made in the past year on the creation of the Wildlife Quarters Action Plan. Next so overall, in those five public meetings that we actually held, we had uh, 84 individuals participate uh, and we received over 30 comments. We kind of summarized the top eight comments, as you see below. Uh, they included support for the action plan, locations to focus on across the state, uh, inclusion of species other than the six target species, uh, some mitigation measure, measures uh, such as uh, speed limit enforcement, fencing improvements, data sharing with other organizations and, and agencies, uh, adhering to the intent of the act and focusing on wildlife mitigation uh, migration routes, excuse me. Uh, as, as you can probably tell, a lot of those are actually outlined in the Wildlife Forest Act and were part of our original intention of creating a plan. Uh, on a side note, just one more thing, you know, we had 84 attendees in those five public meetings, uh, but in our past two virtual meetings, we had probably about the same turnout. So I think it's actually a pretty good direction for anybody trying to find out, you know, what's, what's the best route for, for holding public meetings. Virtual does allow people from anywhere to attend. So I think that really kind of helps them in pub, public outreach. All right. And all that information was very critical. I want you to understand and, and totally believe me that we took your comments and your data and your input, and we, it was very much part of uh, selecting the corridors and also um, the hot spots. So GPS data was incredibly important. To, again, as Dr. Kaufman talked about, letting the animals tell us where they need to go, that was very important. So researchers' data, um, particularly from our tribes, uh, tribal partners, which are doing a great job. Um, also, the public comments, we actually gave points to different areas for the number of comments that were received in um, support. I do want to mention that there was not a single public comment against the plan or any of these places. Um, and then some of our nonprofit partners um, gave us uh, information from their camera data and also past support uh, for different areas such as, um, well, we'll get into that later. I'll tell you more. Next slide. So our, our um, 
our project list, if you take a look on the bottom here, it says section four, um, it's from exactly from the act. And what we did is we came up with the hotspots that were where animals are getting killed and then the corridors where animals need to move through. And those top areas, again, were prioritized based on the potential to reduce collisions um, for to improve wildlife movement. The benefit cost analysis was part of it, but did not play a role in the, in the uh, prioritization. Again, the support that you showed us for those areas and then adjacent land use and ownership. So we'll go to the next slide and we'll tell you more about our top 11 wildlife vehicle collision hotspots and corridors. So again, hotspots based on crashes and the corridors are based on uh, lots of other information about that may not necessarily be where animals are being killed, but where they need to move. So I'll just go over um, the, uh, the top five wildlife vehicle collision crash hotspots. Number one is Cuba, north of Cuba on US 550. Number two is US 285. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Silver City. I got my quarters mixed up. Number, number two is Silver City. Number three is going to be uh, Redoso in the Sacramento Mountains. Number four is the Glorieta Pass, just east of Santa Fe on Interstate 25. And number five is Bent um, on the west side of the Sacramento Mountains. So let's jump into these and tell you more about what we found with them. The first one we have is US 550 north of Cuba. That hotspot um, is 17 miles long. Um, the Hickory Apache Nation was very helpful in helping us see where the elk were crossing, not only getting hit, but where their GPS collared animals were moving across the road and also where the nation could help us place the fence and future crossing structures. We have, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, elk are going to uh, balk at any kind of culvert, so we need big bridges and overpasses. So we suggested four overpasses. If you take a look, it's kind of small on my screen and the 40 other people that are looking at it from, um, from the Zoom call. But if you look for those blue icons that are semicircles, those are your overpasses. Again, those are always, we tried to always place them in public lands because they're a large investment and you're going to need supportive landowners. So here we put them on the green where the Forest Service owned land and the purple where the BLM owned land. Then the, the green colored icons that are squares and triangles are underpasses. They're, the squares are, are bridges, the triangles are culverts. And then the red icons that you see that are triangles are where we talk about retrofitting existing structures. Retrofitting is when you put fence to an existing structure or clean it out or do something to it to get animals moving underneath the road rather than across the top. So in here we had, like I said, four overpasses Four and four bridges. And um, we hope to get both uh, mule deer and elk across this road. This is one of our top priorities and I do believe you'll do something about this in the coming year. Next slide. It's Silver City. All roads going into and out of Silver City are problem areas. Long, long hotspot. It's 27 miles long. It's very tricky what we can do here because so much of the land is privately owned. So what we did is we put our two, over, uh, yeah, our two overpasses on the outskirts of town where the elk are the problem. And then we said lots of retrofit of existing bridges and culverts in, in town and on these private lands. And then we have um, nine more underpasses th throughout these different roads, which are US 180, New Mexico 90 in particular, where we say help, help the mule deer in, in large part get across the road. Next slide is Rudoso. That's our number three hotspot. That's a 34 mile um, hotspot. And you've got New Mexico 48 in the north and US 70 on the bottom there. Um, again, we're very limited in what we can do because of all the private land. We don't have large ranches here, but many um, smaller private landowners. We suggested two overpasses here as well. Again, they're on the outskirts of town where the elk are the problem. We talked about retrofitting existing um, culverts and bridges, which you see with the red. And then we have um, eight underpasses throughout there, including some on the Mescalero Apache tribal lands that could be placed to help reduce the problem with the animals getting killed there. Uh, the number four um, hotspot is going to be Glorieta Pass. This is just east of Santa Fe. Many of you know this area. Um, the hotspot analysis showed three miles, which is what you see in the pink um, highlight there, but we went ahead and, and did five miles of um, 
potential areas of mitigation because we know um, the animals don't know that that's where they have to go is, is that hotspot. And so uh, we, we phased in two, uh, two phase uh, solutions. The top ones, of course, are going to be um, in that hotspot area where we look to retrofit existing interchanges, uh, box culverts and bridges to get the animals under the road on private land. Again, you're going to be needing to work with private landowners. Um, Glorietta has um, six retrofits, and I think um, we've got one overpass there around mile marker 296. And uh, we'll go on to the to Bent, the, the number five hotspot. Now, Bent, if you just look at crashes per mile per year, is the number one hotspot. And it's elk, which is very unusual. All these different states I work with, this is, I think, the fifth fifth Western state I've worked at doing these hotspot analysis, this is the only state where the number one hotspot is elk based. So you do a five mile problem on the Western edge of the Sacramento mountains on US 70. Um, again, we're trying to figure out where to put that overpass for our problem child on public land. So you'll see an overpass smack in the middle there on BLM lands. And then we talk about retrofitting a bridge on the far um, West side where we think the elk will go under. And then uh, um, some more um, culverts and bridges, both uh, on private land, on BLM land, and the Mescalera Apache lands. So um, we hope that that, uh, as well as the as fence, which I haven't mentioned in all these, but please know that all these areas include some wildlife exclusion fence to direct the animals to the structures. Okay, we'll go on to the corridors now. Our first corridor, our top corridor in New Mexico is Chama, and that entails um, miles and miles of road from US 64 and 84. The second uh, top corridor is the um, Del Norte, or I like it's Rio Grande Del Norte National Monument with US 285. Number three is the um, south of Raton, we call it the Pronghorn Triangle, we'll tell you more about later. Number four is going to be in the Peloncillo Mountains where I-10 bisects the mountain range. Number five is going to be <clears throat> the Sandia Jemez Mountains corridor, which is just north of Albuquerque, and it includes I-25 and US-550. And number six is the Cuesta de Red River corridor up in the northern mountains. So those are your six top corridors, and we'll jump into them. Now, Chama, Chama is, uh, um, is a wonderful challenge. I'll just smile and say that you've got your hands full with that, but it's incredibly important. Um, we've got 38 miles of road that mule deer and elk in particular are trying to cross to go from summer to winter range and also just to live in these general areas. Hickorya Apache Nation has been incredible at monitoring these animals for decades since the 1980s to know exactly where they're crossing the road. And so the area between Chama and um, to the west where um, 64 and 84 diverge, that area is where a lot of animals are moving and we think is incredibly important. So we put in <clears throat> three locations for overpasses for the elk in particular, which also co uh, coincide largely with wildlife management areas that the state owns. But overall for Chama, um, our, our team found 66 places where we could start and end fences and put in structures and retrofit structures. We've got two retrofits in the, in the Chama area for existing bridges, 10 underpasses and seven overpasses uh, throughout this area. And so again, our Hickory, Hickory Apache Nation partners are going to be very important in this area. And we'll go on to the Rio Grande del Norte National Monument. Mm -hmm. This US 285, there's 25 miles of road here that are important um, uh, where the animals are moving back and forth. So this is probably better called a linkage than a, than a, a corridor if it's 25 miles wide. Um, three species are moving through here, and uh, Game and Fish has collars on all three species and knows where they're moving across the road, and also our crash data showing where the hot spots are within there. We've got different phases of projects, and in the middle there you'll see there's no fence um, on our map. That's where we will suggest a driver warning system where animals will cross that grade. Um, but we've got four overpasses that we suggested. There's very little to nothing to retrofit there and five underpasses. So uh, again, the, the traffic volume is very low here compared to other places, but there's so many animals moving through here. Um, and um, this monument was established in part for these species of animals that we wanna continue protecting them and their movements. 
Number three is the pronghorn triangle south of Raton. This is a very long area. 69 miles of roads are in this general area here. Again, this should probably be called a linkage rather than a corridor. Um, our teams went out and they um, looked at every single culvert and potential area to mitigate. And they came up with mostly solutions on Interstate 25 because the, the traffic volumes are so low on US 64 and the other New Mexico highways there. So on, on 25 there, we have two overpasses largely for pronghorn, which again, we wanna encompass all these target species and where they need to move. But we know not only pronghorn, but mule deer, elk, and even black bear have been hit in this area, trying to move from the plains up into the mountains and back and forth. Um, and um, several retrofits, mostly retrofits of existing bridges and culverts to the arroyos there. So we've got some solutions that could potentially really work south of Raton. Onward to our next corridor is um, I-10 really bisects the Peloncillo Mountains in the boot heel of New Mexico. And again, I, I, I said this during one of our public meetings and I say this today, if there's any journalists in the audience, this is a great story. You've got big desert bighorn sheep um, collared by Arizona game and fish in Arizona that have come to the north side of I-10 here. And then you've got desert bighorn sheep collared by um, New Mexico game and fish on the south side. And as Mark Watson likes to say, we probably have two populations of desert bighorn sheep looking at each other across the interstate and not being able to cross it because none of the collared animals have been documented moving across the highway. So this is a major problem area um, for wildlife to get across and we've We've, again, this is another problem child, I might wanna call it. You cannot get entire populations of desert bighorn underneath highways, you've got to give them overpasses. So um, for this one, we've got four overpass locations, understanding that not every single one will happen. But again, uh, we come back to our um, New Mexico State Lands Office people being highly supportive of these. And you've got land, New Mexico State Lands right there in the yellow um, where these overpasses could be located as well as some future culverts and bridges. So another important corridor, not just for desert bighorn, but for wolves, um, potentially jaguars and other animals. And next we go to the Sandia Jemez corridor. <clears throat> I cannot overstate the importance of our, our partners in the Pueblo of the Santa Ana and Glenn Harper and his team in collaring animals and giving us information of what areas were important. Again, like Dr. Kaufman said, these five species of animals that were collared on the Pueblo showed us exactly where they need to move through the area with the collar data, uh, as well as not only on the Pueblo Santa Ana collared information, but our partners um, <clears throat> in the University of New Mexico had collared mountain lions that showed us where the Sandia mountain mountain lions were coming up from the south to the north trying to get across Interstate 25. So we've got, um, let's see how many miles here. We've got 36 miles of road here. That's not just Interstate 25, but also US 550 is a problem area as we learned. Our teams went out with, um, with a, the San Pueblo of Santa Ana's Glen Harper to find out where we should locate um, new structures, which you see in, in green and blue. And then where do we retrofit those existing bridges and culverts. And we had um, partners in other, <clears throat> the San Felipe Pueblo go out in the field with our team to locate places where they knew animals are trying to get across the road. So for this very large uh, wildlife linkage corridor, we have eight retrofitted bridges and culverts, three underpasses and um, uh, two more underpasses, I should say five underpasses and five overpasses locations that we've identified. And finally, the last one, uh, the last corridor is the Cuesta to the Red River Wildlife Corridor. Um, it's in northern New Mexico there. Um, the, 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 chi the child, <laughs> the, uh, the, the target species is your, is your bighorn sheep, your Rocky Mountain bighorn. And there's places where they're coming down to the road and hanging out, um, getting killed regularly throughout the year. Um, and so again, bighorn don't like to go under the road. So we've given you three overpass locations and potential retrofits for some bridges and of course some uh, fence and some driver warning systems at the end of the fence. 
But we have a star here because we want to bring on Mark Watson to tell us a little bit more about some of the uh, challenges with this uh, particular situation right now. Mark? Thanks, Danny. Yeah, so it, it recently came to the team's attention that there is a uh, local Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep population that has been documented to be carriers of the pneumonia bacteria, which could uh, threaten the persistence of the two bighorn sheep herds adjacent to this highway, the Latier Peak Herd and the Wheeler Peak Herd. So at this point, the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish uh, does not support any kind of planning or design for a habitat connectivity project along New Mexico 38 because this could, uh, again, uh, pose a grave risk to those populations and potentially on down into the Pecos wilderness population, I assume. But because this is a long-term planning document for New Mexico Department of Transportation, we decided to keep it in the plan. And hopefully at some point in the future, although it's not clear how long this disease could last in that uh, local population, at some point the department might support it. Uh, so thanks for that. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Mark. And on to our next slide. This is a map of your top wildlife vehicle collision hotspots and corridors in New Mexico. Wait, where'd it go? <laughs> Our map is not coming up on my end. I don't know if you've got it. We'll just, we'll just jump right into the yeah, uh, specific. In our defense, I, I think the uh, Google, Google Docs or Google Slides or whatever kind of uh, messes these up a little bit. There is a map there, I swear. Yes. I wanted, I wanted to mention in, in closing for my part is that when we selected these hotspots and corridors, we made a, a special effort to make sure we had all six target species looked at and identified as to where they, they could be uh, best crossing the road. We looked at ge geographic representation with the best data that we had, and then the feasibility of where we could get these things done. So... Um, it's all, all next, it's all for you to take off with. So go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Patty. Uh, some information, and I didn't see you take a sip of water once. So well done. We just closed our public comment period, uh, May 12th. Uh, our draft action plan was released January 12th. So we have a 60 day comment period. We once again sent letters, uh, notice letters to our stakeholders, uh, a number of NGOs and federal land management agencies, as well as all the uh, tribes and pueblos in the state. Uh, we also published uh, press releases and several newspapers, though we've already received comments that we didn't publish them in every single newspaper. Uh, we'll try to address that next time. Uh, we also posted to our social media sites uh, and put out um, press releases other places as well. Uh, in the, I think it was the first week of February, we, we held two virtual public meetings. Our, like I said earlier, our attendance was actually pretty good. We had some really great questions, a lot of good feedback. Uh, and moving forward, uh, you know, comments were submitted uh, via email, uh, handwritten, and we also had some phone calls. Next slide, please. So now that we, we've received all the public comments and the public comment period is closed, we will start going through them and digesting uh, what updates may need to be, to be made to the plan, if any. Uh, as Mark said earlier, there are definitely uh, the need for some updates, including you know, noting the uh, New Mexico 38 bighorn sheep issue. Uh, we expect to finish going through the comments and updating the plan by late spring or summer of this year in which we will post the final uh, version of the Wildlife Forest Action Plan, uh, not only to our website, but we actually have to submit it to the, the governor's office as well. Uh, moving forward from there, uh, we will continuously be seeking funding. Uh, this is probably <laughs> the top comment that we have received, uh, partially due to some um, uh, petition emails that we've re received from, from some organizations as well, where hundreds of people have chimed in on this fact. Uh, you know, it's not set in stone. Uh, you know, funding sources weren't guaranteed when we uh, kicked off this effort, but we it, it will be a constant effort to, to try to find that money. Luckily, we, we do have $2 million that has been earmarked in the uh, DOT's um, uh, funding for, for this upcoming fiscal year. 
And even though that two million is not going to build any wildlife overpasses or anything, it will help go towards the design of uh, at least a couple of these projects. And that's going to be very beneficial to actually have uh, got through the, the design phase, uh, done public outreach and, and all that during, during the, the design process. Uh, that way we, we, will, we will have essentially shovel ready projects, especially when this, um, the, the, the funding from the infrastructure bill on the wildlife, you know, wildlife crossing pilot program uh, you know, has $350 million available uh, to the states. Uh, once that becomes available, we will have some uh, you know, shovel ready projects to try to move forward with. It, it'll make us very competitive. So we're, we're very excited about that. Uh, you know, besides funding projects in the future, we will be continuously, uh, well, not continuously, but we, we, we will have the opportunity to update the plan. Uh, we could do it on an annual basis if it calls for it. And we will uh, need to submit annual reports to the, uh, the governor's office. Uh, you know, kind of marking our progress made thus far. And with that, I would like to open the floor to any questions. Thank you. Hey, Casey. I think Ray's got a microphone. Oh. You know, Jeremy knows a lot more people than I do, and I'm sure Mark too, so I'll let them call out people. <laughs> Casey, right there. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, this is just a follow up, Larry Mark, to what you just said uh, about show ready for projects. And so, uh, this five year pilot program, as you all know, is going to be in the end, and they're just going to start getting ramped up now that they have their appropriation and they can start moving forward. Speaking with a colleague at DOT in, in Washington, and I guess I didn't realize, I should have known this, how long it takes to actually do the structural planning, do the structural design, do the NEPA compliance, historic, historic preservation, all of that stuff. With that said, when do you expect to have shovel-ready projects ready to go forward in the second year, third year, this five year half, or where you at? So, you know, we actually don't have that $2 billion yet. Uh, to, to start the uh, design process. But, you know, I, we, we can prioritize that uh, and, and, you know, try to get it done as soon as possible just so we don't miss the window on applying for, for any of those funds that may be available at the federal level. Uh, I, I would expect to have some by, okay, everybody's going to hold me to this. <laughs> I, I actually don't want to put a date on it, but I, I, think, I think within a year we probably, probably have a design done, hopefully. It, you know, it, working with engineers, consultants, and all that, you know, some sometimes things are uh, kind of, you know, either put on the back burner or just take longer than expected. Uh, but, you know, we, we are, you know, th this money is dedicated for this exactly. So we'll, we'll, we'll use it as such as soon as we can. Thank you. And one other question, I don't uh, call where I heard this, so, uh, but the experts here, I'm going to ask this question and kind of is it true that they're trying to develop a plastic, like a very, very sturdy, obviously plastic overpass for this type of activity? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. Patty's probably the best to answer that. I, I, I have heard of a, a polymer, reinforced polymer or something, Patty. Um, those of us that are on the Zoom, we can't hear the questions. That's just a lot of wah wah. So, could you repeat the question? Yeah, you bet. So, so the first question that Casey asked was, when will the state have shovel-ready projects um, based off of the plan ready to ready to pursue? And the the second question was, as Casey asked, um, he is he has heard uh, that they are developing different techniques to to create uh, wildlife overpasses, and one of them is using uh, pl plastics, uh, recycled plastics. I would imagine to to uh, create those overpass over, over overpasses. And we kicked that question to you, Patty. Um, yeah, those are, they're still kind of in, in an experimental stage. And what, what states typically do when they want to do some kind of an experimental um, product is they get research funds as well as the construction funds. Um, and then they put a researcher on it. Um, I, was, I was actually in Utah monitoring a structure um, for wildlife use while the University of Utah engineers were monitoring those beams that hold the structure. They were of a recycled plastic kind and they had all kinds of monitoring equipment 
to see how well the beams were supporting the heavy trucks when they came over. But I, I am not aware of any other state using that. The overpasses have largely been your typical um, steel and concrete ones like you saw for the Arizona overpass and the Utah one I showed. And then the prefab arches from the Contech company, um, they're called Conspans, where they're six feet wide arches that are kind of placed like a slinky. Um, those are the two major ways that it's done, not a whole lot with the plastic. Jeff, did you get anything to add? I think there's some, some uh, hope that some of those designs will happen. I think, I think one of our future players are going to come and actually might be able to touch on that a little bit um, on, that, on that concept of just involving some of that. Brian. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for all the hard work you put this. Uh, it really is, it shows in the, in the quality of the product. Um, I'm curious about, we've talked a lot about the wildlife uh, corridors and transportation issue, the collisions, but we didn't talk a lot much today about the uh, just a lot of the corridors, the top priority corridors you're identifying. Um, in the report, did you all make any recommendations about how to facilitate movement within those corridors, not highway related, just like, for example, fence modification or habitat management, that kind of stuff? I guess I'll, I'll take this one to start off with because, you know, a lot of the act was sort of written around and for DOT and you know collisions on the highways that had a safety component that was and because DOT actually did the contract and provided the money the contracting to develop a plan and the list. It was a real focus on highways and highway safety as you as you noted Brian. Our uh, big game biologists, our wildlife uh, management division have been working a lot with the BLM and probably John Sherman and some of the other folks can address that with the BLM and, and the building. But I think our big game program are constantly working with land management, uh, public land management agencies to remove fences. I know a lot of that is also being done in cooperation with New Mexico and the National Wildlife Federation and the Taos BLM where internal fences are being modified or removed. Wildlife friendly fencing is being installed uh, where it can be. So there's a lot of that going on currently sort of outside the scope of the Wildlife Corridors Act. We felt like that was kind of a, a tough nut to crack though within the context of the Wildlife Corridors Act. Um, we are going to include some additional information on the Rosa deer herd, which doesn't necessarily have a real heavy highway risk component in New Mexico. It does in Colorado, the Colorado US 160. So we're gonna include some language about the importance of that herd and their movements across the landscape in Northwest New Mexico as a, as a migratory herd. And just to uh, backtrack, Casey, to your question earlier on the, uh, on the plastic crossing structures, we had uh, an answer come in on our chat box from uh, Aaron Sito. And, and Aaron described, um, this is what was said in the chat box, fiber reinforced polymer widely used in Europe for bike head infrastructure. Caltrans is exploring the use of FRPs in a wildlife crossing over US 97 in Siskiyou, in Siskiyou County. So that's probably what you were, what you were referring to. So yeah, it seems like uh, based off of that response that it is, it is currently happening. So that's good to know. And then, uh, and we also have two more questions in the chat box. I'll just go ahead and read those. The first coming from a uh, group of participant, Jackie Hall. The question is, is there an ROI slash economic study on prevention of wildlife vehicle collisions with the construction of such things as built wildlife corridors that might influence the insurance industry to invest in such infrastructure? Could you read that one more time? Yeah, I'm happy to. So is there an ROI slash economic study on prevention of wildlife vehicle collisions with the construction of such things as built wildlife corridors that might influence the insurance industry to invest in such infrastructure. Yeah, so I'll, 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 oh, Patty, did you want to? 
I know. Well, I guess I'll give a I'll give a big picture, and then it'll be perfect uh, for you, Matt, to to talk about New Mexico. Um, Pew help Pew Charitable Trust um, help fund this, and Leslie Duncan's on the call or in the audience. And Leslie, if you could help upload the website for the new tool that Pew helped fund that looks at a new way of doing benefit costs to look at the value of reduced wildlife vehicle collisions um, that mitigation would help with. Um, that's one part to the answer. And then um, the other part is traditionally in all the decades that I've worked in this field, the, the, um, the uh, insurance companies don't typically get involved, but it would be wonderful if we could get some great um, nonprofit push on that area. And, and then Matt, you can take it to the New Mexico. Yeah, you know, uh, specifically for a plan, and you know, Patty kind of went over this a little bit during the presentation. We we did do uh, a somewhat crude cost analysis of you know what these mitigation projects could uh, provide for you know uh, re uh, the the economic benefits, I, I guess. And uh, part of that analysis is the uh, projected reduction in collisions, uh, and we kind of broke that down amongst you know just uh, property damage only, uh, injury crashes, and fatalities. And so, you know, the, uh, both FHWA and the DOT kind of place values on that. The, the uh, FHWA uh, values are, are definitely, uh, I think, you know, more more realistic, uh, as, you know, as far as putting a higher value on, on human life. Uh, so we, we we do factor in, um, you know, the, the reduction in collisions and the economic benefits. And as far as taking that to insurance companies and try to get their buy-in and, and helping to, to implement some of these projects, you know, I don't... I don't know about that. Uh, my personal uh, experience with the insurance companies is, is that they don't really work well with others. Uh, but you know, there there is we do have some numbers on uh, the, the economic benefits of uh, reducing the number of collisions in these areas. Uh, hopefully, that kind of answers that a little bit. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for that, Matt. And the last question we have in, in the chat box for the team is is uh, from Teresa Seamster. Teresa asked, could the corridor panel tell those of us that work on county open space and trail planning how these public spaces, easements and trails could assist in connecting wildlife crossings with safe corridors through towns and cities? Maybe Matt, what I'll do is I'll give the big picture again and then you, can, you guys can do the um, zoom into more New Mexico specific. Um, What's really important here, it's a great question, thank you. Um, metropolitan planning organizations and regional planning organizations, we tend to overlook them, but just like I said, the DOT only administers 25% of the roads. These planning organizations are very important for putting wildlife mitigation in their transportation plans, which are then adopted by the DOT in the State Transportation Improvement Plan or STIP. So um, I'm working on a national study right now. It's called the Pool Fund Study with Federal Highways and Nevada DOT. And New Mexico is part of that Pool Fund Study. And we're really trying to concentrate on that ground level local planning and zoning um, that can really influence not only the DOT, but how this all fits together for those of you in New Mexico. Yeah, thanks, Patty. Just to elaborate, you know, you know of course, just building uh, highway crossing structures is not going to you know, solve any problems on its own. We definitely have to look at a larger landscape uh, uh, scale. And I'll let Mark elaborate on that in a sec if he wants to. Uh, as, as, a, as an employee of the DOT, uh, you know, we, we really focus on the, the highway right away. Uh, how, however, you know, we, we do uh, want to incorporate the local communities to, you know, to avoid any uh, future, um, you know, development in these uh, wildlife corridor areas. Uh, a number of our stakeholders were uh, or did include, uh, you know, city council members, uh, county commissioners, and so forth. So hopefully, uh, word has gotten out there to these communities that are kind of our, our focal areas that, you know, we do in, uh, intend on creating wildlife mitigation structures along this highway. And that does have you know larger landscape uh, implications, I guess. Uh, but you know, I'll let Mark elaborate. <laughs> Maybe not. Jeremy, could you read the question again, please? Yeah, you bet. Could the corridors panel tell us uh, tell those of us that work on county open space and trail planning how these public space, 
how these public spaces, easements, and trails could assist in connecting wildlife crossings with safe corridors to towns and cities. That's, that's not a level that I've worked at. Um, as Patty mentioned, I have worked with metropolitan planning organizations, especially for the Albuquerque area, and tried to get them to put in information about future potential wildlife overpasses and underpasses. And I, I think they have done that. And each of the metropolitan planning organizations are, I think, required to consult with Game and Fish, but it's, it's rare that any of them ever reach out to us. And they're on very long-term planning windows. I think their plans last about 20 years. So there's multiple planning organizations that we never work with, like Las Cruces or even Santa Fe that, or Roswell, that probably have those organizations and those plans. So there's, I think, a lot of room to work with those organizations. From a county level, I, I think that's really, really tough to do. I think we need local people working with those counties, you know, and local landowners too. And the mention of easements is something we've tried to be advocates for, at least in my division at Game and Fish, because conservation easements are critically important for protecting wildlands and, and migratory habitat for big game animals and for threatened and endangered species. And, and so we try to assist with uh, conducting biological surveys uh, to document species that occur on private lands that are interested in implementing conservation easements. And there's a lot of work going on in the state. I think New Mexico Land Conservancy just passed 500,000 acres that they protected, including the Armendaris Ranch down south, one of Ted Turner's ranches. So that's really important work too. Yeah, I mean, I think if I can add, you know, the concept of, of incorporating land use plan or local land use planning and zoning in regards to connectivity is is a uh, is really important, but also it could be it could be somewhat of a of a delicate uh, of a delicate walk. You know, um, one of the best examples right now in New Mexico that I could currently think about is is uh, one of the situations our colleagues at the Pueblo of Santa Ana are currently going through, and and the hotspot that we showed you guys earlier for the Sandia Hemis kind of reflects that 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 kind of struggle or that hurdle. Uh, currently, you know, we have some of that data that was used to identify that those hot spots on the western portion of uh, US 550 bordering the Pueblo of Santa Ana. If anybody's familiar with this kind of Albuquerque, Bernalillo, Rio Rancho landscape, they'll know that just to the south of I-25, there's a, a, a set, uh, soon to be subdivision that's already been planned and zoned. And, and uh, according to the Pueblo of Santa Ana, constructing that, that subdivision would severely fragment the, the ability for wildlife to move back and forth across that highway, already more than the highway does. They have uh, documentation of mule deer moving across that highway into, into local parks in those neighborhoods to, to find forage. And so, you know, how stakeholders work with local land use, um, local land use planning teams or county commissions to make sure that the informa information that we're bringing in light from these action plans, from the ecological work that uh, our colleagues at the game department are working on. Really, I think it takes a, a, a monumental effort to bring all that information to those planners so that they have the right information. And so as they're making those, those decisions on where uh, zoning and where land use, whether it's open space or developed space will go, they have the right tools and the resources and the data to make sure that the the decision they're making thoroughly reflects all the qualities of that landscape, including the habitat and, and the wildlife. So um, it, it can be a delicate ba uh, battle, but I think there's different ways to approach both uh, county commissions and city councils to one, educate them to build support through things like resolutions for specific projects or for uh, just ma the management of connectivity within their, their jurisdictional boundaries in general. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities and with that, there's also, also challenges. Awesome. And then for folks on, on the chat, uh, Patty, you were referencing the, the, uh, the calculator that, that uh, Leslie and Pew were putting together. For those of you uh, attending virtual, you can see in the chat box that link to that, uh, to that crossings calculator is, is in the chat box. Jeremy, awesome. Jeremy, we have a question right here. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. I have a question just pertaining to that. When we get the planning going, we know where we need to stage these crossings. Uh, an example, big orange sheep crossing outside Leslie. Um, how 
was just wondering how long have been like planning stages to you know, shovels and, and building these structures to the general scale? Well, and I'm not like you know pointing out. I know it takes time, but the only reason I'm referencing this is because I noted on the uh, the comment about the uh, pneumonia up there between the uh, two curves. I recently received some of those great questions about you know domestic sheep and the threats of you know, the wild sheep and the cows and all of that that was happening. But it was also noted that the sheep came out along the road there pretty often. Is there no co movement between those two herds at this time? And so that's why you know Hayden Fish has decided to put off uh also here, is that what I've heard correctly? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just repeat the question mark so folks on on Zoom can can hear it. And, and Matthew, if I heard it correctly, there there are two questions. To that. So the first question is: is once these these projects identified through the action plan are are shovel ready, how long from that from that initiation phase to the completion phase is it going to take to do those projects? And then the second question was more or less referring to the specific hotspot of. Uh, New Mexico Highway 38 and just east of Cuesta for the Bighorn Sheep Crossing, that project recommendation. And that was asking if those two populations of Bighorn Sheep, uh, the Latier population as well as the Wheeler Peak population, are they already coming in, into contact with each other? Yes, exactly. So if, if they have recognized the pneumonia there as like a threat, um, are those sheep already facing that threat um, by not having a head to that crossing? Uh, I think there's more sheep on the road there also to the remaining Yeah, I'll just go ahead and address the first question. Um, just, you know, I, I really don't want to put any uh, timelines on how long it's, it takes to complete your project. Uh, you know, as you know, th these are DOT projects, sometimes they, you know, take a little bit longer than expected. Uh, you know, there's numerous opportunities to hold things up. Uh, including just going through the, the whole NEPA process, acquiring you know all the sufficient funds and everything. Our uh, statewide transportation improvement plan, uh, or STIP, uh, typically looks at a four-year funding cycle. And I'm not saying that's to take four years to actually complete a project, but you know uh, the uh, the whole permitting process and design phases and everything. You know it, it's not going to be super fast to actually go from start to finish. One thing that we could really benefit from is the fact uh, how much uh, government or how much support from the legislator and the governor's office that, that, that we do have. And, I, you know, I think that tends to help light the fire on certain projects that do have uh, local interests or, you know, special interests uh, uh, behind them. And so I, I think, you know, you know, kind of like trying to get that support uh, expressed, you know, that, that could definitely speed up the process of, of getting these projects rolling. And completed. With that said, even though we kind of laid this out as big projects, okay, we're doing four overpasses and three bridges and all that, it doesn't really have to be completed like that. We, we could break it up into phases where we just kind of, you know, phase it out, do smaller sections as the funding becomes available. Uh, some of the easiest things to do would be to actually do kind of standalone retrofit bridges. And so if we, if we have a, a highway project going on, let's say uh, in the Pronghorn Triangle area, and we, you know, we we have a couple bridges identified. You know, uh, we we know that we, we we want to do something there, so we could actually kind of piggyback on the existing project. Just go ahead and, and, and add some fencing, you know, to help on the final animals to these bridges as part of this other project. So we kind of do it piecemeal throughout time, but to actually uh, you know start to finish on a, a large um, you know specific wildlife mitigation project is it's really kind of hard to say. Sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll mark it yeah, and then for the second part of your question, I'm going to ask Nicole Tapman, who's our big game program manager, to, to answer that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mark. I'll come up here so everybody can hear. Um, so there, the Rio Grande Gorge population has experienced the MLB, the, the pneumonia, and that's on the west side of Cuesta. They are within four miles of sheep that come, um, we, we call them the, the Red River Herd, but that Red River Herd links up to higher elevations like the Tier and Wheeler. And so our concern is that the, the MOB positive sheep at the Rio Grande Gorge are linked 
with Red River sheep than they can bring that disease up to the high elevation, which we don't want to. So for that reason, we don't want to. Um, I recognize that there are sheep on the road and that causes a, a, a problem for the sheep and travelers. But for management of those sheep, we don't want to move to high elevation. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I think we should have a question right here. Hi guys, uh, thank you for a great presentation. I'm Dave Helper, the running chair of the bus. And um, just had a quick question about uh, you know, Dr. Kaufman talked about his presentation and how animals don't really recognize geographic boundaries. And I know that New Mexico used to have a an MOU you know, memorandum of understanding with the with the Colorado Department of Transportation and Colorado Parks and Wildlife about managing cross jurisdictional herds like you have in Florida, New Mexico. And um, even heard recently that you know the, the work that you've done um, on fire and tow on, on I-25 has created some end run problems um, in Colorado that's showing up on their new analysis of the eastern plains and um, uh, prioritization study that they're finishing up right now. So um, just I know Arizona Game and Fish is active with you guys and, and helping on creating this excellent report that you put out. Um, just wondering if you have plans to kind of pursue uh, help all the neighboring states or you know, partnerships between the two states. Yeah, sure. You know, you know, first of all, you know, that, that project in Raton was actually in the works before I, I was on board with DOT. Uh, I've been here about a year and a half now. Uh, and, you know, I think they're still working on completing that project, so I, I don't think it's really, uh, I don't think we're at a point where we can determine uh, how much of an in-run event there is there, uh, but I definitely see the potential, you know, and I, I, I kind of wish that was handled a little bit differently. Uh, you know, previously we, we didn't have a wildlife coordinator to specifically focus on wildlife. We, we do have several environmental specialists that, that you know, are very knowledgeable in wildlife, uh, in wildlife mitigation. But you know, now that that I am on board to help kind of you know focus specifically on these issues, hopefully there, there will be a little more interstate uh, communication to, to avoid any problems like that. To help, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, if we do not have any more questions, just looking at the agenda, we're, we're approaching eleven oh two, and it looks like we have a break from eleven to eleven fifteen. Go outside. Plan some coffee, get what's left of those pastries, and uh, we'll meet back in here at uh, 11.15. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'm calling everyone back here for um, our second panel um, on Secretarial Order 3362 um, and GPS collaring. Um, and I'm going to introduce our three panelists in a second. My name is Michael Dax. I'm the Western Program Director for Wildlands Network um, based up in Santa Fe. Um, but before we do that, I just want to give um, a quick shout out to Senator Mimi Stewart, um, who couldn't be here today. Um, as many of you know, um, New Mexico is, I think, one of two states that doesn't have a paid legislature. Um, and especially as Senate Pro Tem, she is working um, far more than um, than she should be based on her pay and desperately needed a little bit of a vacation, um, which, which is where she is right now. Um, but we probably would not be here um, today if it was not for Senator Stewart. Um, Mark Watson, our previous panel, mentioned the memorial that she sponsored over the years. Um, I believe it was three or four memorials before sponsoring um, the 2019 Wildlife Corridors Act. And so just want to um, send some appreciation to Senator Stewart um, for her dedication over almost 20 years now um, to this issue um, and has been a champion um, in that, that $2 million that was allocated earlier this year um, that was due in large part to Senator Stewart's efforts as well. So um, just want to make sure that she's appropriately, appropriately acknowledged here today um, before we move forward. Um, but uh, to my right, um, we have Casey Stemler, who is the Senior Advisor for Western States at the Department of the Interior. He is also the architect of Secretarial Order 3362. <clears throat> then we have uh, Nicole Tatman, who is the Get Big Game Program Manager at the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Um, and finally, John Sherman, who is the State Wildlife Biologist for the Bureau of Land Management here in New Mexico. 
Um, so going to pass it to Casey first to kick us off. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Get the slides pulled up and get a chance. Yeah, these are mine, so that's always a good start. First, I want to thank everyone really for the opportunity um, to, to come to the summit today. I know this is the second one you've had, and I was asked earlier if I do this in other states, and, and I said no, because I'm not sure of other states that are doing this. And so just from that perspective, I think you guys are on a, on a great path on this topic. At the outset, I, I want everyone to know, because it's been a question um, is 3362 still a priority? And I will say that it is a priority for the Biden-Harris administration, just as it was for the Trump administration. Think about that for a minute. Two very, very different political perspectives in this effort has survived. It has survived because of our state fish and wildlife agency partners and the NGO community being so supportive of this. And I can't thank you all enough. Even though this is a huge accomplishment to survive two administrations of very different perspectives, we have an awful lot of work to do, not only in New Mexico, but across these other 10 uh, Western states. And so with that, can we advance the slide, please? The purpose of the order is fundamentally about landscape conservation. And we do that by working respectfully and cooperatively with our state partners being number one, with other federal agencies, with the NGO community, with tribes, and with private landowners. The focus of the order are deer, elk, and pronghorn. And, and I chose these species because of their ecological, their economical, and their cultural values. But most importantly, and I re reiterate this over and over, Depends who you talk to, but generally they're non-controversial. And why is that important? It's important because as you saw earlier on these maps, the proportion of private land across the West is, is great in some states, some less than others. When we talk about migration corridors, it's always a mixture of federal and private and state and some tribal land. And so if we don't have the, tri the private landowners on board, it can be very difficult to accomplish our, our goals. Go ahead. So go back just a very quick, quick history on this. At the outset of the implementation of the order, I needed to figure out a way or at least a mechanism to gather information from the states. So I sent a letter to each of the 11 state fish and wildlife agency directors. And that letter had a number of items in it, but, but namely I asked them to please provide their top three to five priority migration corridors or winter ranges. And, and I did this because I didn't want to, people picking priorities is a difficult task. I recognize that, but if, if we don't do that, then we end up spreading the little money we have across a vast area. And we don't have the impact that I think is possible if we can hone in on a fewer number of priorities. So we limited it at five priorities. I also asked them to, to, to provide their top two to three research priorities so that we could help fill any data gaps that might exist and them identifying those priorities. The response from the state really is the content for these state level plans that, that help guide the implementation of this order. Next slide, please. This is gonna get confusing, I know, but hang with me here. So these are also called action plans. So the creation of, of the SO3362 action plans are really vital to the success of our effort. The action plan consists of the state priorities and they help provide the focus really to create the partnership so that we can go out there and do the habitat conservation projects that we do. And those action plans also help inform a grant program that we've established for the implementation of 3362. We provided the templates of the states, but the information within those action plans are the state's information. Of course, New Mexico has a 3362 state action plan. I'm not exactly sure how 
We all plan to integrate that plan with this state wildlife corridors action plan, even if you need to. I, I don't know, but I sat here pondering that, wondering, wow, there's a lot of action plans down here in New Mexico and only a handful of people to implement them. So um, I'm, I'm with you there. Could, could we go ahead and advance again, please? Matt Coffin alluded to this in his presentation about science. And, and our goal with the implementation of this order is to use science to identify those priority areas and then to drive habitat conservation activities within those areas. So we, we, we sectored the money off that we had available really into a, a science component that consists of research and mapping and a habitat conservation component. And so far in the four years of implementation to date through Department of Interior alone, we provided over $6.4 million uh, for research and each state could could receive up to a total of $600,000. We provided one, approximately $1.5 million for, for mapping. That was the stuff that Matt Coffin covered earlier today. And approximately 15 million for, for habitat conservation projects. And that 15 million has been matched by about $3 million from NRCS, private foundations, and the US Forest Service via NIFWIF grant program. So far, we funded 41 research projects and 170 habitat projects across those 11 western states. Uh, yep, go ahead, you can go to New Mexico. Specifically in, in New Mexico to date, we have funded uh, three research projects for a total of about 600K and six habitat projects to the tune of $1.3 million. I really hope, working hard to keep more money flowing into this and diversifying the partners that are contributing. I feel good this year that, that we're making progress on that. So I hope we're able to support many more projects here in New Mexico in the future. Go ahead. So more recently, I, I, just at the end of January of 2022, I sent a letter out, to, I call it an interim letter and you'll understand in a second why. I sent a letter out to the State Fish and Wildlife Agency directors and, and the primary intent of that letter was to really reaffirm the Department of Interior's con continued commitment to the implementation of this order, but also to suggest several items that, that they might consider in any potential update to their 2022 action plan. The items I asked they consider um, for that update include incorporating new data map analysis, completed habitat conservation projects, new habitat conservation projects, and, and this is a little twist that's different. That's normal. That's what I ask them every, every year. There's been a lot of interest in this order to expand it to other species. There has also been some interest to expand it to other states. I visited with some state Fish and Wildlife Agency directors and got their input. And I found the best way to probably proceed forward was to give the states kind of an open door, an opportunity to say, hey, if you would like to include consideration of mentioning other species, that are benefiting from the habitat work that we're doing for big game, please do so. We take it for granted in our community that we understand the work that we do for habitat conservation benefits more than your target species, but that connection is not always made. And so I thought it was important that, look, we're doing this big game work, but there's an awful lot of species that are benefiting from this habitat work and overpasses and underpasses, et cetera. Let's start talking about that a little more. And I also, in that letter, asked the state that they would consider talking about the ecosystem goods and services that are provided by the habitat work done through this order. So um, ultimately, the decision to update these action plans are up to the state. If the specific state says, I'm good, we don't want to change our plan, that's their decision. If they want to update it, they can do that. I'll send another letter out here in April to the uh, State Fish and Wildlife Agency directors with the formal effort moving forward to say, okay, now is the time to update your action plan if you so choose. Next slide, please. You mentioned earlier a NIFWIF National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant program that we set up. And on average, we receive about 23 proposals a year and we're, we're only able to fund about 13 of those. And so there's been a lot of effort on my part and others to, to get that funding pull up so that we can fund more than half roughly uh, of the proposals we received. I will say that last year uh, we did change some language. I, I, again, just the things that you're blind to that you don't understand. 
I never felt that this order was exclusionary to tribes, but some tribes felt that way. And by not explicitly opening the door, if you will, to, to tribe, they, they didn't think that they could participate. And we fixed that in this NIFWIF grant program by literally just adding a sentence or two. And we did receive three NIFWIF grant proposals from tribes this last grant, grant cycle. I can't talk about whether they're funded or not, but I will tell you that that round of grant proposals will be announced here in early April. We will have another RFP through this NIFWIF grant program this year. So stay tuned for that. I expect the, the RFP to hit the street sometime, uh, probably in mid-summer. Next slide, please. So in closing, I just wanna say that, and reiterate, 3362, it, it remains a priority and it's continuing. And, and we are not going to change the focus of the order. Uh, still focused on those three species and we're still focused on the 11 uh, uh, states. I tried various ways to, to maybe expand a little bit, be it species, be it states, and, and to be fair and, and completely respectful to the administration. I respect their position. Casey, we have a great thing going here. It's well supported uh, across the West. Let's keep that going. Let's not throw any, any kind of wrenches into that process. I will say that the department is obviously hearing from others that there's more you know, than just big game that, that folks are interested in and connectivity and, and corridors can apply to other species as well. And so the department is looking at that and saying, okay, maybe you know, we can look at these other species too. So 3362 is staying, but you know, stay tuned. There might be something forthcoming on other species as well, but it just won't be through changes to what we're already doing in 3362. So with that, I'll pass it on to, I'm not sure who I'm passing on to, Nicole? Or John? I think it's John. Okay. Does it matter who goes next? Go for it, Nicole. Okay. I do have a presentation. So I, I'd like to share with you guys some of the preliminary maps that we've been working with USGA to create and some of the preliminary data that we thought coming in um, from some of the secretarial order funding that Casey just discussed. So, are you guys hearing a weird ringing in your mind a little bit? How about now? Better? All right. And now again? Okay. Is that better? Okay. All right. Um, so my contact information is here. I'll put it up again on the final slide, but if anybody wants to talk more with me about this particular project. Um, that's how you get hold of me. Next slide, please. So none of what I'm going to share with you today would be possible without partnerships with a diverse group of agencies. Not pictured here are tribal entities that we collaborated on this topic also. So I wanted to mention that. Um, I'll share a series of maps here in the next few minutes, but it's definitely not all that's out there. There's more that's going to be in the works that will be published later. Um, but it is a snapshot of what our agency is working on right now. All right, testing again. Better? Great. Gotcha. Um, and, and one thing I want to go back to is Dr. Kaufman mentioned in the introductory remarks that we only know about the animals that we look at. And so it might look like there's a lot of blank space in our maps, but that's simply because we haven't looked there yet. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll show you a series of these maps in the next few slides. They are all in graph format and are, a lot of them are going to be based on preliminary data. They're going to be made available publicly when they're finalized. So the format that they'll be made available is through USGS report on yield migrations in the West. Dr. Kaufman mentioned that uh, when he spoke to us. So volume one has been published already. New Mexico is not included in volume one, but we will be included in volume two and three. And those apparently came out this year. And so um, this is one particular herd that we worked on. So this is the Mount Taylor elk herd. Um, we worked with USGS to use some data that we already had in another project. So this particular project was initiated to investigate low calf survival in the Mount Taylor region. 
we didn't initiate the project to identify movement or migration routes of animals, but in the process, we had the data um, that could be looked at in a different way or analyzed in a certain way to identify these high use corridors. And so um, essentially, we use data in part with the USGS to use data we have lying around to come up with um, this map. In particular, in particular for the Mount Taylor Park. Um, we partnered with Dr. Kaufman at Wyoming and Dr. King at New Mexico State University. Our agency doesn't really have the expertise of personnel to do this, and so the partnership with USGS that has does have the technical expertise to analyze this data and produce these professional maps is um, really helpful. It allowed us to use this data and look at it in a slightly different way. I mean, to find that this year does have some distinct summer and winter use. So obviously, as, as we all know, that this, if this information can be helpful um, to help manage this population, perhaps even improve elk cow survival. Next slide, please. Um, this particular herd is mule herd around Shaman, Mexico. This work was recently funded by Secretary of Order 362. The map that you see here is, is a draft format, but a version of it will be included in volume three of the USGS report out later this year. Um, for this particular meal, you're going to see some pretty distinct movement pathways and some, some clean um, movement pathways. And, and I'll refer back to this in a second, but um, we've always known this to be a migratory group, but we didn't really know where they moved. So they have kind of two distinct patterns, one more in the northerly direction and one kind of in the easterly direction. Next slide, please. Um, this is another sector order funded project on um, Prongmore. This is a pretty interesting Prongmore population. They summer in high elevations around 10,000 feet and interspersed over meadows and sunken crystals. So the photo in the upper right portion of that slide shows you some of the landscape that they are found on. We see them in summertime and fall, but this area gets way too much snow for them to be there in the wintertime. And so they knew they left, but we didn't know exactly where they went. And so um, the Secretary of Order money helped us identify where these animals moved. They moved towards the east um, onto the San Antonio Mountain area and, and even further east to the Taos Plateau. Next slide, please. And the, uh, another, another Secretary of Order funded project is on elk, kind of this, in a similar ecosystem in the northern part of the Sombrero Coastal of New Mexico. Again, this map of the report uh, included in volume three of the um, USGS report. These are elk near San Antonio Mountain. Um, they don't have especially distinct pathways, as you'll notice, and it, referring back to the deer pathways that we saw in the slide ago, a few maps ago. Um, they are perhaps demonstrating a more generalist nature and not really like, not really using very distinct pathways. But at the same time, you still can identify some high use areas um, as you go out from the center of that key map there. Next slide. And there's about 1% chance of this, uh, this little animation actually working. So we can go on and, and even see this. I have a backup slide. If the animation isn't working, and it is. Okay. Next slide. You can put this to the next one. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I wanted to share with you. So we had a bunch of biologists try to make an animation in the work in PowerPoint, which obviously we failed, as you can see. Um, but we had an interesting observation of the mule deer Delaware recently that was caught in March of 2021. So Kind of in the lower uh, portion of this map is Taos. Um, she was caught just south of Cuesta. So these squiggly lines are a bunch of different deer. She was just one of them. Um, she was caught in March of 2021, primarily on Savoy Mesa and the Llama region, east of the Rio Grande Gorge in South Cuesta. I might actually classify her as a resident doe, but she made an extremely weird movement in the autumn of 2021. She crossed the Rio Grande Gorge, so I put up a picture of the gorge on the right. Um, she crossed the Rio Grande Gorge six times, three times each way. And then uh, in October of last year, she took 40 days to west across the Taos Plateau. Then she spent three days near San Antonio Mountain. And then she moved back to Savoy Mesa, to I guess what I call her home range, um, in, the, in the span of three days. So she took 40 days to move west, and then another three days to move back um, to her home range. That was, so she is the upper line in this graph or on this map here. Um, but she's certainly not representative of all deer in this particular herd, but interesting nonetheless. 
There were three other deer that, that we sampled that did cross the gorge, but mostly most of them stayed in the side. Um, one other deer, as you can see, I hope you can see there's two different colored lines. One other deer did make the movement to the west, but she did have more of a distinct range. So this is data that's just coming in now. Um, we're saying still collecting information on this particular bird, and we hope to have uh, more finalized maps to provide to you all. So next slide, please. There's my contact information again if anybody has any questions after summit. While they're loading it up, am I blasting you all out or is that good? So I'm John Sherman. I'm the um, the wildlife program lead for BLM here in New Mexico. And since Nicole addressed all of the, the collar stuff, which is appropriate, Casey talked about SL 3362. The uh, the part I'm going to discuss is the habitat work, since BLM is uh, primarily focused with um, that part of this order and. Uh, We've done a lot of work throughout BLM in New Mexico, both in priority areas that are identified in the state action plan that Game and Fish um, has published and outside of those areas. Um, and so uh, with that, I will go to the, go ahead and move it to the first slide. So one of the, um, yeah, you, yeah, right there. One of the, um, the ways that BLM has, has uh, implemented some of the uh, habitat management on public lands to in, improve movement and uh, primarily movement is address fence barriers. And um, in this picture, this is down in, in Roswell. Um, and basically we map these fences that were historically back in the 50s and 60s, even back in the 40s. Uh, built sheep wire or woven wire, um, and which provides, uh, you know, a, a, an exclusion to anything around it. So these animals before, you know, this sheep wire or, or woven wire was removed, uh, could not move uh, unless there was, you know, a, a rusted hole in the fence or whatnot. So um, sheep are no longer down there. And so it gave us back starting about 2013, 2014, an opportunity to start working with some of the ranchers, um, even on private lands, um, to modify their fences, to go in and modify their fences. And uh, this picture was taken in 2014. Um, in Roswell alone, we've opened up about 400,000 acres of area that was previously, um, you know, encircled and um, uh, crossed by a lot of woven wire. I, I don't think we've um, converted all of them, but in all of those fences, we've actually uh, come in and implemented at least a, a pass uh, in the corners and um, you know where we have found the animals to move back and forth on a regular basis. So that's in the Rosal. We're also doing this, if you could move to the next slide, in the Taos field office, and this happened, this is a fence, Ham, I'll leave us out in the audience sent me this photo. This is before, and you can see the woven wire on the bottom with a couple of strands of barb on top. Um, and so we have that crisscrossing the Taos Plateau, the area that Nicole was talking about for both the, the elk and the uh, antelope uh, work that they're doing up there. And so um, we have identified some of those areas. In fact, Pam was just showing me a video of elk crossing a fence that she took recently on a fence that wasn't modified. And uh, so, and then, so move to the next slide. This is what, what we are constructing. We're taking that sheep wire down and putting up a four strand fence that uh, is wildlife friendly, uh, smooth bottom wire. Uh, primarily this is elk and antelope, but I would imagine there's probably some mule deer up in this area as well. So uh, fences, have been a major focus of, of, of the habitat work that the BLM has uh, implemented. And, and uh, some of that was through the NIFWF grant. 
um, opportunities that came through SO3362 in both in Taos and in their priority area down in the southeast corner of the state. Um, but also BLM for the last, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years have funded a lot of these projects just on their own. And, and then our previous program lead in Washington uh, worked with Casey quite a bit to send money um, actually to do habitat work as well as we funded some of the, uh, the research on uh, the, in Arizona, I believe, and uh, I don't know what other state, but anyways. So um, move on to the next slide. That's modification of fences. So the other thing we've done, um, we've done a lot of landscape treatments in pinyon juniper country. This is up in the Cerro area, which is uh, Taos Plateau. Um, it's on the east side of the, uh, the gorge. Um, and so these are some of the uh, uh, areas, and this was actually a WUI project that was implemented for the town of Cerro. But um, if you'll notice, you know, there's patch, it's patch cut. There's a lot of it that's left in, uh, and these areas are also, you know, a lot of winter range for, for uh, mule deer, elk, and um, other wildlife, not antelope, but other wildlife. So we've done a lot of this work throughout the state. Um, and I use this example, but we are doing a lot of work in Fort Stanton. We're doing a lot of work over in uh, the San Mateos and the East Mags. Um, and then up in the Rio Puerto, the, our fuels program is doing a lot of work up there as well. So next, next slide. This is also part of that Cerro landscape, uh, follow-up burn um, after, after a mechanical treatment of any, uh, which is a, a, a standard practice that, that we do in some landscapes. Um, we have found that um, with thinning, if you, um, if you lop and scatter, it creates a lot of fuel up underneath that uh, laid down uh, uh, slash. And so if you, if you light it off the right time of the year, you end up taking out a lot more trees. So we have uh, in areas where we uh, do the, the, the piling, versus the lock and flat scatter, we'll do some burning, uh, follow-up burning in there. So the next slide. And so uh, the other is water developments. Throughout the state, um, we have developed waters uh, through the Habitat Stamp Program, through uh, you know, BLM funding and through um, NGOs providing uh, the, the support both in uh, you know, their labor, their volunteer, their monetary, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, funding waters, the mule deer, water for wildlife, um, and a number of other groups that have funded these, these type of projects. Um, currently over in the squirrel area, there's kind of a, um, Mark, I think Mark addressed that there's a sheep population over there that's been moving back and forth across Highway 60. And so Carlos has, um, develop some waters down there uh, in some of the high Chups Mountain, Chupadera Mountains, um, and, uh, and and done a little bit of thinning down there as well. And uh, he just sent me a photograph and I didn't get it in here. I didn't get it in time to put it in here, but uh, uh, I, there must be, I don't know, 15 rams watering at this water that he put in. Um, so, the water developments and that, and that area is outside of the, any of the priority areas that were identified in the Game and Fish State Action Plan. So, but BLM has actually gone and funded some projects over there. So, um, next slide. Is that the last one? I believe it is. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> So we're gonna to go to um, questions and answers now. Um, and our first question came um, through in the chat from Denise Join, and it's directed to Casey. Um, is any of the $30 million Bezos Earth Fund grant to NIFWIF being applied to wildlife corridor priorities such as the ones you described? Wow, that's a really interesting question. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm cautious on what I say about this because I don't work for NIFWIC. Other than to say that 
I want to remind you that I mentioned there were three tribal proposals that were received this particular cycle. NIFWIF did receive that, that money from Bezos and they considered using some of that money to perhaps support some of those tribal research proposals. And I think I better leave it at that. <clears throat> All right. Um, other questions? And as we as they walk around to, to those questions, I'll just get one. Um, Ray is coming. Um, so uh, this question is from Nicole. Um, outside of 3362, is there other GPS collaring that New Mexico Game and Fish is doing right now? Yeah, that's a great question. We collar the game for a lot of purposes, and it's not always to identify any, any patterns, but we do have GPS collars on elk and field region, and so we're able to use the data that's coming in from those to identify some movement patterns also. Um, we do, we have actively collared animals for three winners in a row, so a lot of this is still in the works. And um, as we get more projects out of the ground, it's it become easier and easier to use GPS collars rather than the normal PHF collars. So, I see us continue, continuing to go in that direction. Um, even though when we may not implement a project directed towards identifying a migration route, we do get that data for it for the also. Yeah, hi. I have a question about kind of combining your two presentations. Um, is the column data fine enough to be able to use it to kind of look at? Post treatment uses. So, like you talked about thinning and wooey, and it looks like that's mostly in the DMV for woodlands. Um, are you able to use your collaring data to kind of see how the animals are using that landscape post thinning? And then, of course, take that data and use it for adaptive management to see if those thinning projects are kind of effective for what you're trying to do. So I'm just going to repeat that question for the folks on Zoom. Um, so oh, I, I'm going into this microphone for the folks on Zoom. But the question was um, whether or not uh, the collar data is being used to determine the effectiveness of the habitat treatments that John Sherman discussed. I'll start and then probably pitch it to John. He probably has more to say about this also. Um, it depends on the timing, right, that we collar these animals and if there is a insane treatment that's going on and at the same time we have GPS collar collecting data. So that's the first piece. But Dr. Kane at New Mexico State University has been doing a, uh, a wildfire or habitat treatment um, landscape scale analysis and data collection in the AMS landscape for uh, maybe 10 years now. So we are getting some of that data um, on the effectiveness of, of these types of habitat treatments. And I'll let you John. So as far as on the top spot though, in fact, Nicole and I just had a discussion and, and uh, as far as this was specific to fence implementation, uh, I asked her if, if our biologist from Taos could come over and with a map and look at the collar data and put some points on the map so that we're working in that direction. Although, you know, for our contracts for fences, uh, Basically, we just identify a fence that needs uh, and, and we go with it. And hopefully, we're catching those crossing areas in that fence. So, as far as the Ben and Juniper uh, stuff, you know, that was a wooden or a wooey project. But as far as the wildlife focused projects that are in Ben uh, and Juniper, most definitely, they're, they're associated with the water development or uh, they are. Observations are used in, in the field office to know that big game are, and it's their primary focus at big game. Although I will tell you this um, so in the Taos Plateau, um, Stanick, is that his name, Pam? So uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and um, Scott Summershoe with the working group, the Pinion Jay Working Group, have implemented the Pinion Jay uh, protocol, uh, survey protocol in the Taos Plateau. And uh, we just, he just delivered a report to us of his findings uh, 
verbally, he hadn't officially given us a report yet. It's pretty amazing what he found. Uh, lots of pinion jays. I will say this, one of his anecdotal observations was that a lot of those cones that they surveyed up there in the Cross Plateau, it had good woodland habitat for pinion jays were not occupied if there wasn't a water development in close proximity. It's what he documented. And that was just anecdotal, but he noticed that where he found colonies nesting, there was water within close proximity. So. Thank you. This question is for Casey. And you may have already mentioned this, if I missed it, I apologize. So has any 3362 funding been used by Western states for planning or implementation of highway passages for wildlife passage passes? Yeah, not directly. Indirectly, yes. So several of the states, when they submitted their research proposals, I, I can tell you one was Utah, one was Wyoming. I'm sure there were others, but they're not popping into my head right now. Their specific research proposal was to look at the impact of a certain road on a particular herd. One was actually near Zion National Park. And it sticks in my mind because of the increased recreation that, that we're all doing here the past couple of years and the increased traffic to Zion. They have a herd that they know uses a crosses a certain road down there. So they wanted to mark that herd of mule deer to see the impact that that, that road was having and potentially put in a future underpass or overpass. So research projects were supported specifically for potential future road projects. But the funding that we have, I call it the color of the money. We don't have that color of money necessarily to do those types of projects. Now to the NIFWIF grant program, we have Oregon as one of the states where we have supported a proposals for fencing. So they get the overpass in or the underpass, what have you, and then have the, the funding to put the necessary fencing in. And you all know it's kind of worthless without the fencing. And so we were able to support research proposals to put that fencing in. But specifically the environmental compliance or the planning, we just don't have that color of money. And we have a question that came in from Zoom. Um, from Jim Ramaka, uh, for John Sherman, has the oil and gas industry been considering the migration corridor information as part of their activities in the Rosa Mesa area? So Jim Ramaka, um, who used to be a, a biologist for the Farmington field office. Yes, Jim, in fact, uh, WPX actually paid for a majority of the migration corridor information, the collaring by Hall Sawyer and, and whatnot in the ROSA. And currently all of that information that was gathered and including the mapped corridor are being built into that plan uh, that is currently ongoing up there. And uh, oil and gas folks have bought into it uh, through you know, there's existing leases, Jim, you know how things go up there. Uh, and so they they have built, uh, you know, gates that are seasonal closures for that winter range um, and, and that kind of thing. So yes, the oil and gas industry has, has helped out with that ROSA for a long time. Did that answer it, Jim? Do we have um, other questions from the audience? All right, we got one in the back there. I'm curious um, how much have you guys integrated some of the maps that the Hickory imagination has used to call them like the gross of the curve and what you Incorporate those into your business, your plan. So the um, the report that I am mentioning is across all Western states. So I think eleven states are included in that report. I believe that um, some tribal maps will be included also. So tribes obviously own their own data, 
And but I do believe in some instances they're partnering with USGS to create very similar maps that I think will be published in maybe volumes two and three of that USGS report. So, um, but that being said, we certainly talk to tribes about where animals are moving and, and coordinate with them on that level. Um, but I guess I can't speak to the specifics of the tribal data necessarily, but I but do know that um, more than I show is out there specific to tribes and that's, um, Think they are partnered with USGS to analyze the data. Similarly, um, how about with neighboring states? How, um, especially Colorado and Arizona, how is the department working with those states to incorporate um, Colorado information that, that they're gathering? I, I know specifically in Colorado, one of their priority areas for the state action plan is that San Juan herd. I think one of the great things about the reports that are coming out is it puts all of that collar data and maps in one location. So it could start some of those conversations. Obviously, that is a shared herd, right? In winter in New Mexico, summer in Colorado. Um, we do have a kind of a working group um, for San Juan working group in New Mexico that becomes some sort of tribal um, partners as well as state agencies in Colorado. It's one of them. We come together about once a year um, to just discuss management directions of each of these different issues. I'll keep going. Um, I just want to speak to that really quickly because that, that question comes up quite a bit. And um, it is amazing at the cross boundary herds that are shared by the states. And I'll give you just one example of pronghorn in Nevada, that one of the research projects supported by 3362 is on pronghorn. And they again had an idea that these, these animals move perhaps to other states, but when they mark them, they found out they go to California, they hang out there a little while, they go up to Oregon, they hang out there a little while, and they come back to Nevada. So the importance of looking at some of these populations beyond the state boundaries is obviously pretty important. And to Nicole's point, I've had a lot of discussions with Wyoming and Colorado because Wyoming has a herd and the, and the corridor stops at the, at the border, but the summer range is in Colorado. And, and I, something that gets lost in all this is, is the corridor, I guess, is the, the sexy thing to talk about, but we can't forget where they're coming from and where they're going to. And so, I always try to throw that out there in these instances, it's the summer habitat and winter habitat are vital. So you can have the corridor and maybe just the winter habitat, but if the summer habitat is in another state, uh, cross-boundary cooperation is pretty important. So continuing on the theme of collaboration, Casey, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation that 3362 was designed to incentivize collaboration. Um, and we've heard from BLM, we'll hear from Region 2 of the Forest Service later. We have our, our friends from the State Land Office in the back that we'll, we'll, we'll hear from later today. Um, after a number of years of uh, 3362 being implemented, um, can all of you speak to how we can further incentivize collaboration and where there's still room for improvement? Great question. Um, I'm looking out in the audience and, and, and Leslie from the Forest Service, hey, is here and, and I'm on a team with her in Southwest Connectivity Alliance. And it's just one example of um, two folks meeting and then it leads to collaboration. And so I, I think that to, to your question, we are making extremely great strides, positive strides with USDA, with, with um, not only what I just spoke to with the US Forest Service, but with the NRCS in particular. And I'm very excited. The right people in the right place are, are here and now. And, and I think that um, we're going to see some really good announcements, big announcements from them in the corridor space here in the future. So that, that's very, very encouraging. With respect to you know, the NGO community, I'm finding that pleasurable because I work with and communicate with the, what we call the sportsman's community and then what we might call the, the green community. It doesn't matter when we're talking about these types of issues because it's we all are trying to get the same thing done and that is landscape conservation. So to, to, to my response to your question would be, 
simply continue to think about those opportunities and don't look at it, 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 folks as like, oh, we never work with them. Well, now's the time that I think we can work together. Private landowners, you know, there's the private landowner groups and they're a great source of collaborative opportunities, but boy, when it comes down to habitat conservation, it's that one-on-one -on -one sitting down with that landowner to, to not threaten them and, and find ways to move forward that they feel good about moving forward with you. In my experience over 30 plus years of doing this stuff, nine out of 10 times, um, they'll work with you. And, and that's what we're trying to do through 360. And lastly, I'll say on the tribal uh, point, we have funded over the beginning of this, some tribal projects. And as I said at the outset, I didn't understand that not including certain language, they felt excluded from this. And, and I think we're making great strides in this, but any of, the, of you that have worked with tribes or are part of a tribe realize that every single one is different. And so there's no single approach that, that I can take it's going to work for every tribe across any given landscape. Some Southern Ute is one that we work with quite a bit. They have great technical capability. They're able to write proposals and do projects. Other tribes don't have the people to even write a grant proposal. So how we deal with them is very different. We have to find funding just to help them get people in place. So if they're able to write a grant proposal or are able to participate in meetings such as this. So, so, so tribes, I look at that as critically important in the West because that's where they own most of the land, but bringing them to the table really takes efforts from partners and, and from, from my seat to, to find out what they need to allow them to participate. So it's a very different approach. <clears throat> So from a BLM standpoint, SO3362 over the last four years under the previous administration focused primarily on big game, um, even though we did work outside of some of the priority areas. And, and that is continuing, but there's also an effort, a bureau-wide effort for connectivity, and uh, which you know includes all species and I look at it as a, there's two parts to connectivity and some of it can be implemented and some of it can't. When you, when you get to a point where um, you can't do the same on this side of the fence as you did over there because of land ownership or whatever, then you know, that's where connectivity stops, at least for the time being, unless a landowner changes or whatnot. But as far as the habitat goes, there can be an aspect that addresses connectivity in the habitat. And that part of it, the BLM, is continuing to focus on both. If we have a program in New Mexico, BLM, it's called Restore New Mexico. Started out in the oil and gas fields down in Southeast New Mexico under Jesse Juin about, I don't know, 10 years ago. And it has changed a bit. It has uh, morphed into other things, but, um, and brought in a lot other partners. In fact, Jesse um, has worked with the Department of Game and Fish to apply for the NIFWF grants under SO3362, um, some of which have been have been granted, have been successful, and, and so we're implementing those projects. Um, and so through Jesse and others uh, that you know orchestrated that program years ago, we are continuing to focus on um, you know not only the big game habitat, but um, for example, um, there's a project NIFWF has other initiatives. In New Mexico, there's one, the Southwest Rivers, and uh, Jesse also applies for grants under that, as do others for BLM, for projects on BLM land. And one of them is, um, uh, there's a plant down in Carlsbad, fencing with pike barriers, that plant, it's an endangered species, a gypsum wild buckwheat, um, which will remove it from the list once we get those pike barriers up, because the primary um, impact is off-road vehicles. Uh, and so by barricading it from off of two tracks, then it will, will remove all. So that, that connectivity, that uh, the ability to move into other species, the BLM is kind of building on the backs of the SO3362, that model to push out more connectivity type projects. And, and those are the ones that focus primarily on building connectivity into the habitat. Um, we do work with, private landowners. We do work with state land office in, a, in areas of the state. We work with Forest Service. 
but you can't always um, really move that that connectivity beyond boundaries unless you have someone on the other side of the fence or other side of the line willing to do that with you. And so um, when we find someone, yeah, we certainly try to uh, implement both uh, SO3362 in, in um, you know, movement and migration corridors as well as connectivity for other species as well. So I hope that answers your So I think laying on the strengths, there's a lot of interest in this topic lately, obviously, but playing on the strengths of different entities working towards the same goal, I think it's going to keep the momentum going forward. So I guess I'll tell a story because it sort of illustrates the point. So for the Chama mule deer herd, which I put a map up earlier, we knew that was my report her. We decided to highlight that in our secretary order request for funds that was funded. Um, so we, but when the data comes in, we don't have the expertise to analyze that data necessarily or the time in our own agency. So partnering with USGS, who does have that expertise, gets a map out there. Additionally, the secretarial order money wasn't necessarily for identifying specific aspects of habitat that we were using to perhaps guide future um, habitat work. But Dr. Kane at Mexico State worked with the Mule Deer Foundation to fund that aspect of that particular project. And through that, the idea is that hopefully, when we look on the ground maps where Mule Deer are selecting, perhaps in the future, even if we don't know the direct pathways that they're moving, and probably won't ever know all of the pathways that they're moving, we can at least implement habitat work on the ground and partner with our land management agencies to target certain aspects of habitat management that we are selecting. So if we don't know where the, the corridor is, by implementing a project over a wider um, landscape, we are probably <coughs> encompassing some of that. So a lot of different partners have different strengths and um, I think just utilizing all of those strengths to come to a one common goal. Great, so we have just three minutes here before lunch. So I'll, I'll oh, we do have a question. Um, oh, sorry. Okay, John Cornell in the back. Uh, Dr. Cameron's map showed the top six ecological corridors that were identified through state wide action plan. Five of them in the north, the one at Steins, obviously, was specific to, to big one sheep. We all know that the difference in climate and when these animals choose between the desert, dry areas in the south as opposed to the north. But do we, in the company, see anything in the future conceivably where we might identify some corridors or maybe not corridors, but routes in the south that are just as important to build their problem down here or down south as uh, those corridors are for the species up north? Thanks for the question, John. And to repeat it, um, I hopefully I'm summarizing for people that are on Zoom, the question was, how are we addressing, um, we know that there's migration routes north where elevations are higher, perhaps there's more precipitation, but what about down south? What's happening down there? Um, so many, we are getting some peripheral data, for example, from Cuba on elk. Um, it's, it, largely, we don't think those birds are migratory, right? So they don't have the same sum of middle features for the most part. I mean, I, I could be completely wrong in some places like the Sacramento, but um, they are certainly important to constituents and so, socially important and also ecologically important. So um, we would certainly like to see more work done in the southern part of the state as far as identifying important seasonal ranges and these animals move across the landscape to utilize different precipitation patterns. So um, hopefully we're the BLM and Gaming Fish and USGS in a, a, a private we're doing some development in the southeast are, are working to put color on the landscape now. So hopefully we get some more information, but there's certainly um, knowledge gaps at the moment for that particular area. Okay, that does bring us to 12.15, which is a, oh, okay, sorry, we do have one more question um, from the audience. How do you get together with the 
as to the beyond and taps and listening to the <laughs> conversation and the question that Brian asked earlier about habitat. Um, being someone who works directly in the field, uh, Nicole and John and Ann mentioned um, talked about habitat connectivity. Um, I, I'd like to mention to this group is that the BLM has this office. We're getting ready to kick off our uh, Rio Grande and the North and Management Plan um, in, in our office. And some of the things that we look at in planning um, when uh, project proponent for internal or external projects come across my desk is, and where it concerns habitat connectivity, is looking at some of those linkages. Um, from the <coughs> west side of the gorge to the east side of the gorge and what those linkages look like potentially. And I know that this is all preliminary data, but it really helps in, it helps us um, as public land managers put together uh, a management plan that's going to address sectoral order uh, 3362, it's going to address migration corridor, it's going to address habitat connectivity. And meeting with the um, all the people that are involved and that have the information, you know, uh, Casey and Matt Crofton and all these folks, you know, I guess a lot of those um, publications and looking presentations and stuff. And it would really be helpful for us um, at the field level to understand um, how the data speaks to each other and how it doesn't and how it complements each other. And so I, I just want to put out there that we are getting ready to put this um, management plan together and any information that folks can provide. Or if you want to be cooperators, um, you know, get in touch with our field office manager. We do have a new field office manager. Her name is Pamela Matthew. Um, but anyway, I just, you know, I, I just wanted to let you know that it's important. And part of the other, you know, going back to the wildlife corridors action plan, you know, it was asked, I think there were several questions that were asked about how long it would take to implement an underpass or an overpass or putting the projects together. And at the field office level, for some of those that were um, located along to us, to us, uh, US 285, as I mentioned to uh, Matt earlier on, is that planning at the field office level also takes time uh, as far as uh, office priorities, as far as getting the NEPA uh, completed, getting the archaeological survey about if we get all of the uh, components that go into an environmental assessment to actually do projects on the ground at this time. So if we know when those projects are getting ready to be implemented or an idea of them getting the priority is in our area and we can be proactive in, in meeting with the time frame that you all might be setting for your um, agencies as well. Okay, we'll kick it over to Jessica Bell. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to all of our panelists for this fantastic discussion. One thing I just wanted to quickly flag is that recently Kate participated in a podcast episode with the National Wildlife Federation Outdoors. So I'm going to ask Adrian to put a, a link to that podcast episode in the chat for our virtual participants. For uh, anybody else, NWF Outdoors podcast is super easy to find. You can find the name where podcasts are hosted. And I listened to the conversation. I thought it was fascinating, very informative, all about this very thing that we're discussing here today. So it would be an excellent opportunity to, to follow up and get some additional information. With that, I think we're uh, ready to break for lunch. So thank you all very much. And we'll have some um, videos to view as, as we eat our lunch here for the uh, in-person viewers. And for those at home, enjoy the videos, which will begin at 1 o'clock. So thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and do some films here. If we can kind of keep conversations to a, a, a murmur. So I'll kick it off to Brian Bird to introduce our first film. Hey, everybody. Um, I just want to introduce this uh, short film that Defenders of Wildlife had made. And the film is um, 
The purpose of this film was to promote the Wildlife Conservation Action Plan that was, we just had this morning uh, discussion about. And before we start, I just want to say that this film that you see here is about eight minutes long. It is a director's cut. This is not a final edit. Um, we will be doing a final edit and releasing that publicly very soon. But you are all lucky enough to see the world premiere today. Um, and I just want to thank um, Pew Charitable Trust for financing uh, the production of this film. And it's produced, it's directed and made by Dave Cox at Mountain Media for Defenders of Wildlife. And you're going to see some cameos from a few people that I believe are here today. So thank you very much. And in New Mexico inhibits movement of valued wildlife. Roads and fences carve up habitat, making it difficult or impossible for animals to reach areas important for their survival. Crossing animals are often struck by vehicles, also creating a human safety concern. To address these issues, New Mexico created a Wildlife Corridors Action Plan that identifies 11 priority locations for investing in wildlife corridors. Now, New Mexico can be a leader in building wildlife crossings and moving wildlife and people safely across the state. So here on the uh, Santa Ana Reservation, uh, where I've grown up my entire life and was able to hunt it as a youth and now fortunate, very fortunate to have the opportunity to um, pass it on to my kids. Something that a lot of people don't have the fortune of having and we have that here in the Santa Ana Pueblo to um, allow our traditions to continue. Um, there was a point when I was younger where it was very rare to see a deer or an elk or even an antelope at all, and now they're everywhere. And it's it's thanks to the uh, to the uh, DNR's um, efforts, and uh, we just can't thank them enough. As the urban environment around the Pueblo of Santa Ana uh, continues to grow and expand its footprint, and as the highway continues to the highways, I-25 and Highway 550 continue to see higher volumes of traffic. It was important to the Pueblo to understand, are there existing corridors on the Pueblo's land? Where are they if they're, if they're there? And uh, what can we do to try to help mitigate wildlife crossing these areas? You know, pronghorn and wild turkey, we had to bring back here just because the, um, they couldn't get here. Um, we had, we had pronghorn from the West Mesa coming up onto our property at the 550 boundary in 2006, but they couldn't cross 550. Out of all the animals we have collared, none of them except for wild turkeys have crossed I-25, but I-25 has created basically a barrier for wildlife. And we know that wildlife do cross there because our wildlife collision data shows that they get hit and killed there. In February, 2020, we collared a young male mountain lion and after he was collared, he spent some time with his family still in his natal range. And then a few months later, he tried to move out of his range and he was running up against I-25 on multiple occasions and would turn back and eventually crossed Highway 550 and then moved west to the Mesa Verde National Park and the Ute Mountain Ute lands where he's been since. It's possible that if I-25 had wildlife crossings along it, this, this mountain lion may have moved into the Sandias instead of going up to Mesa Verde. We'd never know that, but the point is, is that it tried to move across I-25 and never made it across or never chose to cross because of the high traffic volumes. Why is it important that the animals can get across the highways? Well, that is a very good question. Uh, the reason why is because unfortunately with human population increasing and the uh, development of more and more uh, cities and roads especially, main highways, uh, animals and the habitat of the wildlife is getting isolated, is getting patches, is getting isolated. And that just like humans, uh, wildlife needs to migrate. They, they populate an area and then they migrate to other area. 
uh, here in the in the Chihuahua desert areas like this the uh, the natural resources uh, fluctuates a lot for example the environment it changes one year you could have a lot of rain precipitation and that all of the habitat will boom which we will have great cover food water and uh, for them to survive one year we could go into a drought and they could, those resources will be limited well if you have a hundred animals and those resources they become limited from one year to the next where are they gonna how are they gonna get all those resources well they need to migrate to where those resources are well this this these wildlife corridors creates that bridge to be able to connect those patches of wildlife in making it into a huge wildlife area So now that New Mexico has our wildlife corridors action plan in place, I think where the rubber meets the road now is actually implementing and funding uh, an ambitious suite of projects so that we can address these issues of public safety and you know, wildlife stability and security. Uh, like here on, on Highway 285, where I'm close to, um, there is a location that's identified for, for a uh, infrastructure plan to be implemented. Um, these these plans are very expensive and we had two million dollars in this year's budget in our legislative budget uh, for infrastructure projects but these projects each one is is very expensive and they can cost millions of dollars each. I think as citizens we have to ask ourselves you know what is one human life worth? Um, I myself was recently in a collision with an elk on Highway 68 South of Taos. I was in a small, low car, had the elk come over the hood into the windshield, which often happens, I could have been killed. Obviously, the value of our wildlife uh, from an economic standpoint, from an aesthetic standpoint, a cultural standpoint is huge. So I think that where the rubber meets the road now is implementing the plan and ambitiously funding it. New Mexico is second to last in the West in implementing infrastructure projects. So. You know, let's get let's get this done, and let's let's be the leader uh, in the West in in these projects, in protect, protecting our citizens and making sure our wildlife have uh, safe passage and and um, habitat around these highways that is that is in good shape so that they don't have to cross highways for water and other uh, habitat related issues. We're going to play a video that's brought to us by Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. And uh, the TRCP was also our food sponsor for this event. So huge thanks to TRCP for sponsoring the food. So thank you very much. Thank you, John Cornell. Um, after we play the TRCP video, it looks like we're going to have a little bit of time and we're going to try a different link for the Defenders video so we can watch it again without the technical difficulty. So uh, with that said, I'll turn it back over to Adrian to play the TRCP video. What appeals to me about hunting is really just that connection you get to the land. To me, you know, being New Mexican is uh, pretty closely linked to being a hunter. Um, that's my family's heritage and that's something I definitely hope to pass on to my kids in the future. Americans choose to hunt for many reasons, and those traditions are dependent on healthy wildlife populations. Big game animals, like deer and elk, must move across the landscape to survive and thrive throughout the changing seasons. At the same time, we as a nation depend on natural resources and are making land use decisions that impact the ability of wildlife to move and use their habitats. Fortunately, our understanding of where and how much wildlife move is greatly increasing because of advancements in GPS technology. This increased understanding of wildlife behavior can help us make smarter decisions about how we choose to manage our natural resources. That is why many states in the West, including New Mexico, are studying how wildlife travel across the landscape. New Mexico was the first state in the Union to pass a Migration Corridors Act, and now with the uh, modern technology that we have with uh, GPS collaring, uh, we can put these collars on uh, 
deer, elk, and pronghorn, and we can track their movement so we can identify the critical habitats that these deer and elk and pronghorn are moving into so we can uh, manage these lands better for wildlife and wildlife habitat. Intact and connected areas of habitat are increasingly recognized as important for sustaining wildlife populations and outdoor recreation. In New Mexico, outdoor recreation, including hunting and fishing, is a $2.3 billion a year industry. Outdoorsmen and women are spending their hard-earned money on pursuing their outdoor passions, and as a result, local economies are benefiting from it. Conserving habitat for migrating species will not only strengthen the growing economy, but also ensure healthy wildlife populations. One of the new revelations of the collaring technology through global positioning system collars is the fact that we now know they actually stop over. And this is really, really important. These stopover areas are absolutely vital. If those are gone, it means the animals may have to move faster or spend less time in an area where they were used to uh, gathering key resources to finish their migrations. And they may enter winter range in poorer condition. And we know that animals have to go into that winter range in good condition, otherwise they may not survive during a tough winter. We have a lot of um, historic and, and local expert knowledge of big game movements on the landscape. A lot of local biologists and game wardens know that the animals move into or out of these areas seasonally, but we haven't identified those specifically. It's more just anecdotal evidence. New Mexico is in the early stages of identifying where these corridors actually exist on the landscape. We started our capture this fall for pronghorn and we caught them in a high elevation population around, say at about 10,000 feet. And so we caught a handful of them this fall. Um, we're planning to catch additional animals this winter. We know they're moving, but we don't know where they're moving to. It's, it's really, it's like, kind of like Christmas morning sometimes, like, oh man, there's, let's check it today and see what happens. There's a new dot on the landscape or, um, or wow, this animal was up here for a week and then it just, it just took off and now it's 15 miles away within, a 12 hour period. Collecting data is just the first step. Once wildlife movement patterns are mapped by the New Mexico Game and Fish Department, the agency will need to work with its partners at the state, federal, and local levels to ensure the long-term conservation of these habitats. This includes public land management agencies like the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. Managing the national forest system for multiple uses is an inherently complex and often controversial job. The Forest Service has a multiple use mandate that includes maintaining the viability of fish and wildlife populations on the national forest system. So we have a responsibility in the suite of values that the Forest Service provides to make sure that we're doing a good job of providing habitat that allows populations to persist into the future. Balancing the needs of wildlife with the need for energy, housing, and transportation can be a challenge. That is why having precise information about wildlife movement can help us successfully conserve wildlife habitat while still allowing development in appropriate areas. Creating balanced land management plans will benefit the people of New Mexico and the wildlife for generations. What I really enjoy about being an outfitter and a guide is taking people out, you know, getting them a chance to harvest an animal, uh, they enjoy New Mexico, the scenery of New Mexico, and showing them our culture and showing them what great hunting New Mexico does have. Um, it's pretty core to our lifestyle. It's how, you know, we like to consume our food. It's how we um, hang out and, you know, grow closer. And to me, the experiences I've had in the outdoors hunting is unmatched. There's nothing else I've ever done that even comes close to the experiences I've had in nature while I'm in it in a hunting situation. There's a lot of things that impact wildlife habitat. Uh, and of course, our public lands are, are being put under a lot of pressure these days for all types of development. You know, we're seeing more and more human encroachment in our, in our wild areas and, and in our forests and BLM lands. And so the more that we can know about how the wildlife are moving and these habitats that are so important and vital to them, the more uh, informed we can be as far as, as directing the agencies on how to manage these lands for balanced use. If we are going to effectively, as a community of conservationists, government, non-government, federal, state, members of the public, if we're going to do our job, we need to effectively consider the fact 
that the summer range, the winter range, these areas need to be linked. Herds need to be able to go where they've always gone. And over time, as we continue to take action at the landscape scale, we need to be considerate of how these pieces of habitat fit together. Because we're not gonna succeed managing a national forest within its boundaries. We're not gonna succeed drawing lines at the edge of the BLM. And we're not gonna succeed thinking about only activities that could occur on private land. There needs to be a very holistic view of what habitat is, what landscape scale ecological integrity means, and how these different pieces of the puzzle fit together so that wildlife can persist over the long haul. That need for wild things is what makes New Mexico what it is. I couldn't imagine living here without it. And so to me, um, you know, that integrity of our ecosystems and having these beautiful animals on our landscape isn't just a plus, it's central to, you know, our very existence and, you know, making sure that we can not only hunt and have these amazing outdoor experiences, but, you know, we have a full intact landscape that defines um, the American West. Conservation Partnership for being the food sponsor for today. And uh, just to keep the show going here right on time, uh, I'd like to welcome to the stage our next panel, uh, Renee Callahan, um, Tabor Ward, Stuart Lively, and I believe um, we have a representative here for State Senate uh, Pro Tem Mimi Stewart. So we've got a couple minutes. Uh, I'm showing 122. We should be able to get this panel off right at 1.30. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Welcome back, our Zoom viewers. Uh, we hope you had a good lunch. We all had maybe too much of a good lunch here. So and you know what they say about the first panel after lunch, right? <laughs> But we've got a great panel, I think, that's going to keep everybody alert and focused up here. Uh, again, I'm John Cornell with TRCP. I'll be moderating this panel. This is the funding opportunities, federal infrastructure bill, statewide, statewide side, excuse me, stateside funding and dedicated sources, and the State Wildlife Transportation Alliance. And I'm pleased to say that we have got Sanders Moore is filling in for her boss, which is Senate Pro Tem Mimi Stewart. And I think you all have seen and heard what a bigger role that Senator Stewart had in getting our uh, Wildlife Corridors Act passed in 2019, SB 228. And I think it would be safe to say that we might not be in this room doing this summit if it wasn't for her persistence and tenaciousness to get that passed. So we Pass it on, please, to the senator. That uh, it for sure would be in a very abbreviated uh, agenda if it hadn't been for her, her work at the legislature. So, thank you for that. Also, we have uh, Renee Callahan, who is virtually with us. Hello, Renee. How are you? Thanks for joining us today. And we have Tabor Ward. Tabor Ward from Colorado, and we we'll cut her some slack, even though she's from Colorado. <laughs> We, you know, welcome the opportunity for our little brothers of North to participate in things with us. And she is going to talk about the Colorado Wildlife and Transportation Alliance, which we are very much interested in hearing about. And then we have uh, Stuart Wiley, you on my right. Stuart is the chief of the Big Game Division for the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And with that, I think I got everybody. So we'll start. Now with Renee, you're up. Awesome. I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Can you hear me? Awesome. Thank you. And um, I think I'm running my slides from there, I hope. My uh, connection has been a little unstable recently, so. 
Thank you. So I'll just get started in the meantime by thanking everyone for inviting me to join today. It's a wonderful uh, privilege and honor, and I really appreciate it. My name is Renee Callahan. I'm the Executive Director of ARC Solutions. I'm based in um, Bozeman, Montana. Uh, next slide, please. So oh, one more back, please. Great, thanks. Just for folks who aren't familiar with ARC, we are a not-for-profit network. Uh, we've been around for a little over 10 years working on uh, raising awareness about the proven success of wildlife infrastructure in reducing crashes involving wildlife and reweaving habitats across roads. We have a special focus on uh, promoting innovation in the place, their placement, construction, and design. And for folks who aren't familiar with us, I would invite you to uh, visit us online at arc-solutions.org or feel free to uh, reach out to me directly after today. Uh, next, please. So we're gonna go on a whirlwind tour. It's gonna be extremely high level. There's a ton of content. Um, I'm gonna uh, talk about some of the new opportunities coming out of the recently enacted Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or BILL for short. Um, and again, it's gonna be really high level. We could have a presentation on each of these programs. So uh, just bear with me as I provide you a little appetizer. My hope is that you'll be like afterwards, like, oh, I have a culvert program. And you know, these are the X programs that Renee talked about with culverts or, or um, et cetera. So that's kind of my goal as opposed to a deep dive on, on any of those uh, specific programs. Um, next, please. So as you can see, it's a long list. I'm gonna start off focusing on new and expanded uh, wildlife related funding opportunities. I'm also gonna talk about uh, some wildlife related policies that I think are important for folks to know. And kind of in between, I'm just gonna to touch very briefly on some of the programs under uh, existing programs prior to the new law that crossings were already eligible for uh, under those funding buckets because I don't, I don't wanna create the impression that these are the only um, programs. I'm, I'm really focused in particular on some of the new and expanded ones, but I do wanna hit those uh, existing programs quickly as well. Uh, next, please. So this first one, I will spend a tiny bit more time on. Uh, it's been getting a lot of attention. I'm thrilled uh, to report. And that is the Standalone Wildlife Crossing Pilot Program. This program creates for the first time ever, a five-year, $350 million competitive grant program. It is dedicated to projects that are focused on reducing wildlife vehicle collisions while improving habitat connectivity. Uh, I've listed the eligible um, applicants here, and I have also flagged uh, some of the eligible uh, partners, which as you can see, includes NGOs and universities. Uh, next, please. So in addition to the, that sort of touchstone of projects that reduce crashes while improving connectivity, the statute also includes a number of secondary selection criteria. So these to, are things to think about as you think about how competitive you'll be for this program. It uh, includes leveraging non-federal dollars, uh, opportunities to benefit local economies, uh, opportunities for education and outreach, monitoring and research. And I'm delighted to report also uh, uh, the inclusion of innovation, including innovative design. 60% um, of the funding will go to projects located in rural communities. And again, the bumper sticker on this one is it's dedicated. So you're not competing you know, with potholes or pavement as you often are. Uh, and again, not disparaging those um, projects in any way. I know they're important for everyone, but, but this is unique in that it's dedicated. Uh, next, please. So in addition to that new dedicated pot, then the bill also expands the types of projects that are eligible for funding under uh, some existing programs and some other new programs. The first one I wanna highlight is the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. It's been expanded to include eligible projects, including construction of wildlife crossing structures, as well as projects 
and strategies uh, designed to reduce the number of crashes. Um, on the slides, just as an FYI, the big number that I've included, that 72 billion over five years, um, that's, that's a national number, of course. They did just release uh, some of the new uh, funding figures uh, with the higher levels of funding under the uh, proper uh, federal fiscal year 22 budget. And so I believe New Mexico's share of this program for fiscal year 2022, which we're in, is about 114 million. And roughly half of that is statutorily uh, all allocated to communities based on their relative share of the total state population. Uh, next, please. The next one I want to flag is this nationally significant uh, freight and highway program, also known as INFRA for short. Uh, new eligibility for wildlife crossing projects as a way uh, uh, to improve uh, freight safety. I'll touch on this again at the very end, but uh, USDOT did just release a notice of funding opportunity for this program uh, yesterday. Uh, next, please. Uh, this next program, the uh, Federal Lands Transportation Program, for folks who are familiar with this program, uh, these are for projects on federal lands for uh, highways that are owned and maintained by uh, the federal land managers. Um, you would know uh, if you'd been tracking it that wildlife infrastructure was already eligible prior to the new law, but what you may not have known is that there was an annual $10 million cap on federal managers' uh, ability to spend money on um, mitigation to reduce crashes under this program and bill double that cap. It's now 20 million a year. Next, please. So bill also includes this new program to encourage investment in bridges. Um, the focus on this program is on repairing uh, bridges that are in poor or nearly poor condition, but uh, up to 5% of the um, funding uh, annually can be used for projects to uh, replace or rehabilitate culverts as a way to improve uh, resiliency to flooding and at the same time improve uh, aquatic uh, habitat connectivity. Next, please. Uh, this is a new hybrid formula grant program. It's known as the PROTECT program. Uh, it provides funding for two new types of uh, improvements known as natural infrastructure and also protective features. Um, and even though wildlife crossing uh, structures are not directly eligible for funding, I think that this program may uh, offer the potential to improve habitat connectivity as you are improving infrastructure resiliency. Um, so for example, some of the protective features uh, protective features, the definition includes projects to upsize culverts or raise or lengthen bridges. And so I think there could be some opportunities to improve uh, both aquatic and potentially habitat, uh, terrestrial uh, connectivity as well. Um, New Mexico's uh, going to get about 13 million in formula allocation funds for this program in fiscal year 2022. There will also, there's, this is a hybrid one. There's that sort of formula allocation that goes directly to the state. And then there's also going to be a discretionary grant program. And we're waiting to learn more on that. Uh, next, please. And let's, let's skip this one. Uh, it focuses on an adromous fish. So let's go to the next slide, please. So these two buckets are, they're technically not part of the uh, highway um, provision. They are part of the energy title in the bill, but I wanna flag them for people nonetheless. Um, so uh, this is, it's a you know one-time $250 million. It goes for remediation of national forest system roads and trails. Um, and priority projects include activities related to restoring habitat uh, and safe passage um, for threatened, endangered, or sensitive fish or wildlife species. Next, please. Another one-time infusion, 80 million. Uh, this one's for large landscape aquatic restoration projects on both federal and non-federal lands including um, Indian tribal uh, lands and rangelands. The focus is on fish passage uh, with priority going, uh, well, fish passage and water quality. Uh, and the priority goes to projects that will restore the most miles of streams for the lowest federal uh, cost. Next, please. 
Uh, I know this one's a, a, a little bit out there, but I wanted to flag it just so folks know. It, I, I, to my knowledge, um, it hasn't actually gotten uh, dollars appropriated to it. For There was just a, a, a recent, uh, the budget, which is the fiscal year, federal fiscal year 22 budget, which was just passed about 10 days ago. I tried to see if there was funding in there and I didn't find it. So if you're a budget expert and you found that this funding was uh, authorized, uh, then please let me know. Um, otherwise it's uh, 10 million over five years. It is a competitive grant program um, and uh, eligible entities include state DOTs, tribes and federal land managers. Uh, next please. So here's my short detour. Um, I want to flag these four existing programs, which were under the prior federal uh, law, the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, or the FAST Act, uh, folks will probably know. Uh, next, please. And this first bucket is for transportation alternatives. Um, this is, it's technically a set aside from that surface transportation block grant program that I talked about at the very beginning. It's gonna be roughly $7 billion national figure over the next five years. I think New Mexico's share is about 12 million for fiscal year 22. Um, you can see eligible activities here, uh, projects aimed at reducing crashes while maintaining um, or excuse me, uh, maintaining uh, connectivity. I think the other thing to flag about this is it does uh, employ a, a competitive selection process. Um, and in addition to tribes, um, local governments and other eligible entities, it's unique in that uh, NGOs are eligible to apply directly for these funds. Next, please. So uh, wanna flag the Highway Safety Improvement Program. This one got about 15 billion under bill. Again, that's the five-year number. Eligible projects are newer retrofitted crossing structures or other measures aimed at reducing crashes. Um, and it works, uh, these funds can be used on all uh, public roads. That includes non-state owned uh, roads as well as roads on tribal lands. Uh, New Mexico's share of this program for fiscal year 22 is about 28 million. Next, please. So the, the last of these existing programs under which crossings were already eligible is the Tribal Transportation Program. This got $3 billion under bill uh, under the new law. Eligible projects include the mitigation activity shown here. So uh, if you're on or adjacent to tribal lands and you have a project aimed at reducing crashes or lessening the effects of roads on um, uh, fish, wildlife, or uh, habitat connectivity, and that includes uh, retrofitted culverts and bridges. Next, please. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the last one under the FAST Act. I forgot about uh, this one. Federal Lands Access Program. Uh, el eligible projects here are for, again, this is a theme. Uh, you'll hear me repeat this a lot, reducing wildlife vehicle collisions while maintaining uh, habitat connectivity. This is on state, tribal, and local roads that are providing access to the federal estate effectively. Um, there uh, is a uh, if you search for this uh, program online, you'll come to a map and I checked and it looks like that the next call for proposals for New Mexico will be fiscal year 2024. So you have a little time on this one. Next, please. Okay, so let's just hit a few of the policy related elements in the bill. Uh, I've listed the ones that I'm aware of, um, but I'm only gonna focus on a few of these. Uh, next, please. First one I want to flag is that the statutory definition of construction was revised to explicitly include uh, improvements to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions, including wildlife crossing structures. So if there was ever any doubt about whether you could include these costs as part of a construction project, that doubt has been removed. Next, please. Uh, the next uh, policy element uh, calls for the secretary to update and expand the 2008 report to Congress on wildlife vehicle collisions. 
Uh, this is one of those go-to resources I'm always using, um, but it's well over a decade old. So I was excited to see this. Um, it's gonna include causes and impacts, impacts of highways on wildlife, on um, traffic, uh, uh, the barrier effect of uh, roadways sometimes, um, as well as various economic analyses. Next, please. This is another really exciting one. Folks who've been working on this issue a lot longer than I have, have been wanting to have a standardized methodology for collecting and reporting spatially accurate wildlife vehicle uh, crash and carcass data, because at the end of the day, if you can't measure it, then you don't know how big the problem is. So the hope is, is that this uh, methodology will help uh, alleviate some of those uh, uh, data failures, if you will, to really measure this problem. And then um, the secretary is also charged with developing a national template to encourage voluntary implement implementation of that resulting uh, standard. Next, please. Two more voluntary guidances here. One of them is voluntary guidance on the threshold for determining whether it's appropriate to evaluate a highway for potential mitigation measures. The other one is uh, issuance on um, uh, guidance on uh, voluntary joint statewide transportation and wildlife action plans. And just a huge shout out, of course, to New Mexico and the team who presented earlier today. You all are way ahead of the curve on that. And I'm hoping that folks uh, will be able to learn from your leadership in this area. So thanks for that. Next, please. Uh, last item I wanna flag is uh, secretary is charged with developing a series of workforce development and training uh, courses uh, aimed at transportation and fish and wildlife professionals. So helping keep uh, all the folks up to date on what's going on in this field. Next, please. With my next to last slide, I just want to point folks to this Federal Highways website on the bill. In addition to like a 75 page PowerPoint that describes uh, these and lots of other uh, changes as a result of the law, it's also the best way to kind of keep up with uh, what's coming down the pike uh, in terms of Federal Highways implementation. I think also just quickly on the timing front, um, folks who've been following this issue will know that um, for up until about 10 days ago, we were under a continuing resolution. And so we were, uh, Federal Highways and USDOT were basically, they couldn't go above the level of fiscal year 21 funding for this year in terms of those formula allocations. So that money wasn't able to be released until there was that proper uh, fiscal year 22 budget that just got adopted. And they also weren't authorized to start standing up any of these new discretionary grant programs. So uh, it's my understanding um, and we're optimistic that we'll start to see guidance coming out on some of these new and expanded opportunities, including the Wildlife Crossing Safety Pilot. And then um, I also do want to flag that even just yesterday, uh, the um, USDOT released a, uh, no, a NOFO or Notice of Funding Opportunity um, and setting up a common application for three uh, uh, funding pots. One of them was the Infra Program, which I mentioned earlier. Um, the other one is actually uh, a rural uh, surface transportation program, which for which any programs that are eligible under the surface transportation block grant program, the highway safety improvement or the tribal transportation program are also eligible under that rural um, surface transportation program. So the NOFO came out on that yesterday. Um, those dollars, again, uh, any, any projects eligible under those other three um, programs that I've discussed. So that's uh, that rural program, I think, is a billion dollars over na nationally over five years. Uh, next, please. And that's it. Um, I would, I look forward to uh, hopefully answering people's questions. Uh, thanks again. And here's my contact info if you want to uh, reach out directly. Thank you, Renee, for that extremely informative presentation. And I'm sure there will be some questions at the uh, end here. So, we will next up, we have Chief of Staff, Sanders Moore. It's always good to see you again. Thank you, John, it's always good to see you too. Can you all hear me in the room? Okay, can you hear me on Zoom? I'm gonna keep my mask on. Um, okay, Renee, can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear me? Hey, Renee, can you hear 
Sanders. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Excellent. Um, so for those of you that I don't know, probably only in my former advocacy role, I ran um, environmental organizations in New Mexico for over a decade um, before the first time I was elected by the first and hired me as your chief of staff. And I tell you that one to give you a little bit of background on myself, um, but also to really just indicate her strong commitment to environmental issues. Um, this is one of her top issues. She's a former educator, so her top things are education and environment. And so anything that falls under environment has been um, a hot priority and top, top priority for her in the Senate and before that when she was in the House. She's been in the legislature for 29 years now. Um, I am new, still fairly new to staff. Um, I'm going to say new as there has been a much stronger learning curve, or steep learning curve. Um, but it's fascinating one. So one of the things I've learned a lot about is the budget, the budgetary process, and how to get funding for important projects. Um, as I mean, people have said before, um, the Senate uh, pro tem was very instrumental in helping get some of the money that was in the budget this year. So I was thanks to advocates on the ground who will also continue to talk to the appropriate uh, people at the legislature. But it, this is one of the things that the pro tem had me really sticking on. She said, you know, she worked really closely a couple years ago with the governor and Secretary Sandoval to get the $500 million um, study they would heard about this morning um, into the budget and then done. Um, and we, of course, have that little bit of toxic information now that can inform the wildlife corridors moving forward. Um, she was very, very proud about that project. Um, and you know, this year in the budget, we got $2 million, which was not nearly as much as she was pushing for. <laughs> she was hoping for 50. Um, but you know, we were really glad to get the two. Um, the budget secretary process, I can talk about it more people have questions, but um, it really is starting soon. Um, the agencies have to put their budgets in uh, usually around July 1st. Um, advocates, as a former advocate, I never knew that. It's like, oh, okay, well, it's October, should we start talking about the budget? But if you really want to have an impact on the budget, you actually need to start now talking to the agencies. Because if you can get if you can get a budget request in in the initial request in July, it goes a long way to getting the money in the final budget that is um, proposed. The, because the budget folks are well, they're never speaking. Um, and so so we, we didn't have the numbers. You know, there are lots of conversations we were talking. In the fall, I guess. Um, say, okay, how much do you think we can get? How much should we start asking for? What do you think that you would keep and really support and move forward with? And um, so we were really just trying to get as much as we could out there and, and getting the getting the budgetary folks to really get to this program. Um, so fortunately, we did get the two million. We were <laughs> pleased to get something in there. Of course, that will help unlock some of the matching dollars at the federal level. Um, and we're hoping that this is actually just the start to bring a lot more. Um, from everything I've been hearing so far, and many people um, have also probably been hearing this as you've been reading the papers or looking at any kind of budgetary outlook for New Mexico. Um, the project, we had the largest budget ever this year by more than a billion new dollars. It was 8.4, 8.6. I can't remember the final numbers. 8.4, 8.6 billion dollars, which is way more than we've ever had. The projections for next year, or even higher. So um, now is the time to start saying, okay, what are the big projects? How can we do this? Um, and to definitely not to make sure that now that we do have this study, say, look, these are the projects that really need to be moving, and how do we get that money in the budget um, as soon as we can? And I know that my boss will be championing this and getting as much as she do as much as she can as a priority for her and for our office um, to get state dollars. But then to also unlock those federal dollars so that we can make those state dollars go as far as we want to do that. Um, and I really, that's basically all I have. Um, I'll stand for questions at the end when we do, do, do QA. Oh, and I should have also said it very good. She sent her request. She was very sorry that she missed this today. Um, but things are always a little bit crazy in the legislature, so you got stuff to miss it. Thank you, Sanders, and good job of stepping in for the Senate Pro Tem. <laughs> We appreciate that. And I'm sure all of us are interested in additional funding, especially 
as you said, there's no secret. We're probably going to even generate more revenue, more than gas this year than we have in any year previous. So I'm sure there'll be some questions afterwards on maybe what we can do to help or a path to get set up for the next legislature. So thank you. All right, next up is Tabor Ward. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, everybody hear me okay? Um, well, thanks so much for inviting uh, your little brother to <laughs> Colorado to um, the summit today. It's really exciting because it reminds me of 2017 when we had our uh, Wildlife and Transportation Summit, which was the spark of our alliance that we currently have. It was, it was just like this, except it was in Colorado and a really great chance to get folks together who cared about this issue to figure out what were the next steps to take collaboratively uh, from a statewide level to move, to move the dial on these issues. So I'll be talking a little bit about the Alliance today from a pretty high level, and then happy to answer more specific questions um, during the Q&A. Um, so where we came from, uh, and just a little bit about me, I am an external facilitator of the Alliance. I work for an organization, a nonprofit called CDR Associates. And so we bring the different agency stakeholders, uh, NGOs, uh, federal, state, local together and create this collaborative forum for discussion and help with the decision making process, help with action items, um, attend uh, conferences like these to, um, so the agencies feel sort of balanced in, in how they contribute. Um, so next slide, please. And you can actually skip to the, to the next one. So here's a picture, as I mentioned, of our summit. It looked similar, except it was pre-COVID, so there was more people uh, actually there. We didn't have a call-in option. Um, and the purpose of this two days, it was two days like this one, uh, was to establish partnerships and develop an action plan so we could really talk about highway safety and conserve wildlife populations uh, through mitigation features and through doing this planning collaboratively um, as a partnership between agencies. And one of the big takeaways from that event was we had to have some sort of forum for multi-agency collaboration. And that didn't really exist at that point. So we concluded the summit with an action plan. And the biggest takeaway was we really want to come together and have a forum where we can talk about issues and, and make agreements and move this together um, on a statewide basis. Um, this came from a background of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Mule Deer Strategy. Uh, which also had funding for Westlake uh, Prioritization Study, which was uh, funded by, again, CPW and consultant team to go out and find these priority herds, priority migration corridors, and um, help us start establishing on the West Slope of Colorado, where are the areas that we want to focus on. Uh, we're doing that on the East Slope right now in Colorado as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our mission, pretty simple, providing safe passage for people and wildlife in Colorado. Um, and the next slide, we go through some of our, uh, our partners in this group, and we're a very diverse group. You can see that we have um, members from uh, CDOT, Department of Natural Resources, CPW, Federal Highways, uh, Rocky Mountain Health Foundation, Mule Deer Foundation, GOCO, which is our uh, state land trust organization with uh, Great Outdoors Colorado. Um, and, we, and we keep adding members. It's, it's pretty open as a group, and we try to find a place for everyone who wants to be involved because we need the partnership and we need the support. In terms of governance, uh, we do have just recently a governance structure to help us make decisions because that's proven over the years to be quite complicated when working with a, this variety of agencies and nonprofit partners. So we start with um, an oversight team and that oversight team is one CDOT member and one CPW mem member, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And those are each from the executive management or executive leadership team. And we really, we really need buy-in from folks on how to, uh, as we work up the ladder, are we working in lockstep from an executive position? Under that, and this is new, we have a steering committee made up of co-chairs, which are one representative, uh, sorry, two representatives from CDOT, one representative, two representatives from CPW and DNR, which are uh, sort of a sister agency, uh, and one NGO. And those co-chairs are expected to put a lot of time and effort into this. We have a lot of meetings. We probably right now, because we're choosing our priority projects for the state, we're meeting like once or twice um, a week. 
And generally that will slow down, but they put in a lot of time, the co-chairs, and they spend a lot of time sort of setting our agendas, talking to their leadership, talking to their staff, and figuring out how we work together from this interagency perspective. Uh, after the co-chairs, we have a steering committee, and the steering committee is made up um, of two different sections, active members who actually have a project that we're working on, and on-deck members who might have a project in the pipeline that we'd be working on. And what we do for these projects is we write, some, like as Renee pointed out, there's a lot of grants that come in. And how do we apply for those grants? Where's the capacity for those grants? Which projects will rise to the top so the state is all in the same um, the same wavelength about who's going to get the grant. So we really build capacity and we help write those grants uh, for different projects around the state. We also help with on the ground creating chapters, friends of friends of um, the different projects. And we really work with local communities and make sure that our statewide initiatives are in step with what the local communities also want. Uh, we also sort of work up the ladder with federal uh, BLM, Fish and Wildlife, to again see how this is, can be integrated along sort of vertical from federal to state to local. So we provide a lot of that correspondence, a lot of that project management, and a lot of that communication. We help identify sort of right of way and how that might be acquired. We work with conservation easements. Um, and one new initiative we have is developing MOUs, memorandums of understanding between local and state agencies. So we can be sure if we're putting a mitigation structure in that there's some sort of development um, understanding between the local and the state agencies so that piece of land doesn't get developed later if we're going to be putting a mitigation uh, strategy in there. So we do a lot of things for a lot of different projects, a big one be being um, writing, writing grants for different projects and really providing that capacity so it's not all on the backs of these, these regional agency members. So defining that funding gap. And if you're interested in the governance, we can go more into that. Below the steering committee, we have our different project specific teams, and those are really the staff on the ground who are working to understand, okay, how do we move this project forward on the ground? I'm here every day. I know the herds, I know the politics, I know the staff, I know the community. Here's what we need to get this project from several shovel ready to completion. So th those are sort of our different levels of, um, of governance structure. Next slide, please. In order to figure out how we were going to do this, we put out a partner survey, and this was really helpful to us in figuring out what are the priorities around the state. I just wanted to go through this quickly because I do think it was it was great in informing how we make uh, how we sort of went about the priorities of the alliance. So it was distributed in, in fall 2022. There was actually 50 responses. We were shocked. Like, wow, there's a lot of people interested in this topic that we didn't know. We barely knew anyone who responded. Uh, there was 44 organizations and we're really trying to understand where are the strategic opportunities to, to collaborate? Who can we rely on? Who is interested in this? Um, and 70% of respondents were already currently working on these uh, issues of wildlife vehicle collisions. And a lot of them continued, we want to be involved in this. Uh, we want to continue co collaboration. So one of our challenges right now with the Alliance is what do we do with external partners and interested community members? How can we leverage those resources? That's something we're trying to work on now uh, because there's a lot of interested folks and we're, we're trying to figure out where everyone fits in. So the top, uh, next slide, please. Oh, and you can go one more. One more, thank you. Um, the top issues were protection and preservation of habitat, wildlife corridors and connectivity, outdoor recreation, endangered or sensitive species, sportsmanship and hunting, invasive species, um, and really this prevention and mit mitigation of wildlife vehicle collisions. As one person, um, next slide please. It's a really niche focus, but you can see funding was at the top. And so I wanted to highlight that for this particular panel presentation, because that is something we are all struggling with uh, in Colorado as well. And all of our respondents said, you know, one person mentioned if I could have selected funding three times, I would have done that. So it just tends to be a gap in this initiative overall. Um, after that, it was targeted state and local policies, legislative champions, which you guys are lucky to have, uh, diverse partnerships, uh, more data, public education and outreach, pre and post construction monitoring, federal and land management policies, and more. So in 2021, um, thanks to the uh, Pew Charitable Trust, we were able to, next slide please, have a strategic planning session. And this was really helpful to us. Next slide. Um, actually, I think you can go back one. Oh, 
it's like maybe I've only, you know. So we had four major actions that came out of the strategic uh, planning about what we were going to do as an alliance. One was strengthen our collaborative forum, um, and you can go forward one. Um, and this is sort of the goals around that. The, the second was advance our East Slope and West Slope prioritization projects. Uh, how are we going to move the dial on those projects now that we've identified those priority populations and priority migra migration corridors, establish funding, and really align local, federal, and state interests to make sure, again, we were all working with one voice. So on this slide, you see under strengthening our collaborative forum, we wanted to solidify the agency's commitment uh, to the alliance. People are really busy, and a lot of folks don't have a lot of capacity. So we noticed since 2017, it was, we're slow. It moves slowly, and this is one more thing on a lot, it's sort of an unfunded mandate for a lot of staff. So how did how can we really solidify commitment and get agent and executive buy-in from, from the different agencies? Um, and this sort of goes to number two, uh, how do we increase alliance member engagement and make sure we're moving forward? Uh, define decision-making structure. How were we as sort of an informal uh, group, very informal, how are we going to make decisions that had real um, teeth? behind them and again get get um, buy-in from both sort of the grassroots local level as well as our executive leadership all the way up the chain. Uh, internal communication was a big one. There's a lot of people on our alliance and how do we work together and communicate. And again, again, partnering with external agencies and organizations, we're still trying to figure out the role there. Next slide, please. Our, sec our second uh, strate strategic initiative is, is how do we advance these priority projects from a statewide perspective? So when funding comes down the pipeline, we are ready to, to move with one voice and, and build capacity to get funding or to move projects forward. And we have five different CDOT regions in our state. So how do we make sure that all of those regions can work together and pick pro projects that they all believe in? Um, so right now we're in that process of identifying those statewide projects and making sure all of the regions, both from a CDOT perspective and a CPW perspective, have buy-in. And that's been a pretty elaborate process of, of what are the criteria that we're looking at to move those projects forward. We've been using the West Slope Wild, Wildlife Prioritization Study as a foundation and also looking at the East Slope Study, along with other overlays such as um, for example, we might have a really important priority herd in a very rural area, but then we might have somewhere near Denver that doesn't have as important of a herd, but it has a lot of opportunity for public engagement and outreach. So how do we weigh those different options when we're moving projects forward? So we look at those sort of outside of just the biological needs, but also the community engagement needs. Supporting project readiness, uh, building buy-in and awareness among communities, local communities, um, demonstrating the need for projects, and that's going up more to our sort of legislative representatives and decision makers. Um, and really this larger role of conservation and landscape connectivity. Next slide, please. I skipped st a strategy three just to move this along. That's data collection and just making sure everybody has the, the data that they need. Um, but here's our, you know, here's a big one on establishing funding. And the big one is there's really no dedicated state funding source for the alliance, um, for the planning and for the mitigation work. And funding is allocated on a case-by-case -case basis as part of the required NEPA mitigation strategy. So our priority goals here are identify, and Renee Callahan's been really helping with this from a federal perspective, where is funding available and how would this funding apply? What are the funding needs of each of these priority projects? So really getting specific. We are gonna take this project from planning to completion. Where does that funding need to go? And we're starting to really collect that data and put it into one place. And then where are the funding opportunities and how can we connect the two? Changing the funding paradigm. There is some legislation uh, right now that I'm sure you, you either talked about or will hear about to have a mitigation fund in Colorado from a statewide perspective. So where can we get matching funds uh, when, when we start having these federal dollars coming in? Um, directing the state toward funding priorities. So again, how do we get buy-in from a diverse region with different needs? So we have one state voice where we're really directing the funding coming into certain projects. Um, and, and as the administration of the Alliance, like I said, we're an external consultant and every year CDOT and CPW work really hard to find us money off the top of their sort of operations budget. It would be great for them to have a dedicated funding source to fund sort of the external Alliance facilitator so we don't have to sort of scrap that together every year. Next slide, please. 
Um, some of the funding that we've gotten as an alliance is from Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for fencing on State Highway 151. There's been a NIFWIF grant for over 300,000 uh, for US 160 and State Highway 151. The CPW Big Game Raffle Grant for 90,000. Um, uh, Go Code Directors Innovation for 20K, and that's just to sort of fund the Alliance administration and the State Transportation Innovation Grant for 15K for Alliance activities. As I mentioned, we also received uh, funding from the Key Charitable Trust to run our strategic planning and help us really align our interests. So these aren't big numbers, but we are hoping with this new grants coming down the pipeline that we'll be able to really apply for some substantial funding for some of these projects. Um, next slide, please. Some of our other achievements in addition to project funding, we've really been able to speak with a statewide voice. And that's been very important to go to the Transportation Commission, to go to the executive leadership of, uh, with Parks and Wildlife, to go to different delegations or to our state representatives and have one voice that we're coming with from a multi-agency perspective. We've developed partnerships. Um, we really raise visibility and awareness of what we're doing and the importance of these issues. We attend conferences. Uh, we, we try to get out there um, and talk about this is an issue and here's how you can help. Um, and we've also had a bunch of interagency agreements and coordinations, a, a memorandum of, of understanding between CDOT and CPW about how they're going to work together, what information they can share, and sort of what their shared goals and priorities are. Um, next slide, please. Some lessons learned. One more slide. Thank you. Really, you know, we were all super psyched after our first alliance, and we had all of these goals, and we had trouble meeting them. So we've really refined this to be um, a narrow and coordinated focus, and that's sort of a big, rep, rep, uh, a big lesson learned. Uh, so we started, people felt overwhelmed with having all this additional work, and they wanted really specific roles, specific responsibilities, and what do I do to move the dial? So we really narrowed our focus to those strategic initiatives I just talked about. Um, managing and reality checking the capacity of members it is, like I said, one more thing on a lot of people's plates that are already full. So just getting really specific and even asking how many hours a month do you have to commit to this? So we could be realistic with our action plan and our deliver goals is really important. Um, identifying alliance members and, and partnership engagement. Um, so again, how do people engage at either a steering committee level or a technical team level and how are the decisions made? We've just recently reworked that because part of what happened is we were such a flat hierarchy that nobody was making a decision and we sort of got we start we started spinning our wheels so figuring out how do we make decisions and can we trust somebody enough to delegate some authority to them was pretty important um, and that took time right we were 2018 we launched and, and we sort of got our decision making structure in place this year uh, the funding constraints and opportunities just looking for funding all the time that's sort of what we're doing as an alliance um, and it's internal coordination and integration across agencies and regions. Our different regions have really different agendas and different priorities. So, uh, so it, making sure that everyone has buy-in and why we're selecting certain projects and not others has been really important to bringing everyone to the table to say, well, why isn't region two's projects on the table? Why is it always region five? So we do have a pipeline of projects that come in and our goal is to select one project from each region. So all the geographic uh, areas of Colorado is represented over time. Um, next slide. So our next steps and what we're really tackling now is how do we have a single statewide conversation? Who needs to be at the table to move these conversations forward? Who's missing from our group? Uh, how do we evaluate the various interests and needs in a fair and equitable way? There's different regions with different resources that can contribute to the Alliance. So not all regions contribute the same amount of money, not all agencies can contribute the same amount of staff time or money. Um, how are we identifying these statewide projects and applying for funding? That's been a really big uh, feat that we've been tackling now. And we'd, be, we'd love to share, we'd love to share any of our resources with folks that are interested because we've learned a lot and we'd be happy to to help and provide any of our lessons learned? Um, and how can we best involve community members? When we put out a newsletter or launched our website and people started writing to us, like, we want to get involved. And we were like, we don't know, we don't know what to do. That felt like a real lack on our part to say, oh, we have all these missed opportunities. And how next time can we be better prepared for the interest that's really out there in the group? 
We do have a new website. Next slide, slide please. Please check it out. You'll find our resources that, uh, right there, Colorado WTA, that's Wildlife Trans uh, Transportation Alliance.com. Um, and we have a lot of resources up there if you have questions. And my email, feel free to reach out to me, um, is on the next slide, um, tward at mediate.org. And again, I'd be happy to provide our governance structure, our bylaws, anything that would help you sort of um, launch an alliance that is something interesting for New Mexico. Thank you, Tabor. And I'm sure that there's a lot of us that would be interested in hearing how we can maybe form an alliance here in New Mexico and kind of the initial steps. Uh, all right, moving on next, uh, Chief Wiley. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think first I want to just thank uh, other staff members in the room, uh, some of our other Game and Fish employees that were able to make this a hybrid success. So it's We've had a lot of learning experiences through the, the last two years in the pandemic, but I think they've been very successful in doing it. Everyone has technical difficulties, but I'd say they've kind of got off without a hitch this time. And it's nice to be able to see when I look at the computer, 30 plus more participants able to participate on this because that's, so again, thanks to them. I also want to thank the uh, Wildlife Federation for inviting Game and Fish to come and, and discuss this with us. I'm going to take a little bit of a different tactic and funding opportunities because we're not necessarily a granting organization or, or, or those kind of things, and more discuss how we use our funding and how we how our funding comes about. Um, you know, a lot of today's discussion is kind of centered around a large mammals that move across the landscape, but really, New Mexico Game and Fish deals with all wildlife that moves across the landscape, whether that be lizards or it be an elk. Connectivity across the landscape is important for all wildlife. And managing connectivity is important for all wildlife species across the state. And so all of our biologists take that into consideration when we set up either a research project. Like Nicole stated, a lot of the data that we saw in maps was gained through some other research question we had, some management question we had about elk calf survival, but we learned something else about how elk moved across the landscape, the importance of how they move across in the corridors that they, that they depend upon on their annual life cycle. So our funding structure in general in the Department of Game and Fish is we work off of hunting and fishing license dollars. Our, we're, we're a self-funded agency. We do not receive general fund from the legislature. We do receive it all off of hunting and fishing license dollars that's then matched to federal excise tax on guns and ammo for the most part, Pittman Robinson, and also on fishing equipment, Dingle Johnson. We do have some other small funds um, within our agency that we really depend upon for wildlife management. And, and one aspect of wildlife management, I think that's most important and John touched on it, is working on land management and, and habitat enhancement. Corridors are a function of healthy landscapes and, and wildlife move across the landscape because of how it is and, and how that landscape is designed, whether it's fragmentation from anthropogenic effects, humans impacting it, or we've created healthy landscapes that allow more free movement across the landscape for wildlife. Or do we have, for example, some, some landscapes, especially in some of our forested areas that have seen 100 years of fire suppression or those kind of areas where you see it, where it's been maybe more, uh, used to be more of an open canopy, easier for wildlife to move across, easier for other species to move about, and it is opening up that canopy, is, is enhancing that, putting back natural fire regimes into that, does that allow for different and more effective corridors across the landscape? I think Nicole touched on that principle really well, is what we see right now on those lines on the graph doesn't necessarily mean it's the one and only or the best corridor, it's where that animal traveled. It's because we caught that animal and we got that data location. There may be more important corridors across the landscape that we aren't capturing from a, a radio collar or from some other means just because we didn't capture that specific herd or out of that herd or that animal. But what we do know is that promoting healthy landscapes across is important for all wildlife species, whether it be a lizard, a bird, or a large mammal. One of the biggest funding expenditures that the department does do on an annual basis is habitat enhancement, working in partnership with our federal land managers, Forest Service, BLM. Over the course of the last about 10 years, we've spent almost $35 million out of game protection funding and also our, our excise 
PR money on habitat enhancement, working in partnership with our federal land management agencies. It might be a project that was initially designed for elk management or elk habitat enhancement, but has multiple benefits to a lot of other species, whether that be pinion jay, Hamas Mountain salamander, those kind of things. All that's taken into consideration at project design level when we go into a habitat management implementation to try to improve the landscape. And I think that's what, when I think about wildlife corridors, for me, the most important is having healthy, unimpeded landscapes. Granted, there's going to be human effects on landscapes, whether it be roads, developments, those kind of things. But how do we work to ensure those, those I guess, untouched landscapes, if you will, maintain healthy ecosystem function that allows for wildlife to move across the landscape the most? I think one of the things, and I'll be pretty quick, one of the, the most important things that from a funding opportunity standpoint that, that was discussed at the very first this morning from Senator Heinrich to the address to the group was Recovering America's Wildlife Act. I agree with him completely that that is transformational in terms of our generational time, in terms of the potential that exists for wildlife management across the United States. What it would bring to New Mexico alone is almost 20, or, $25 million, a little bit more, between 25 to $27 million of new federal funds to work on species of greatest conservation need. Species that don't see as much funding as what we currently have available for them that allows for, whether it be habitat enhanced connectivity or species research or management. The biggest challenge that I think the state of New Mexico and other states are gonna face, but especially in New Mexico, is finding the non-federal match. It is gonna require approximately $9 million of state funding that's outside of our traditional hunting and fishing license dollars that we are going to need to bring to the table to secure those federal funds to see the benefits and reap the benefits of that money on the ground. So I, I, instead of showing funding opportunities, that's absolutely a funding opportunity, but it's going to be a funding need for the department in the state of New Mexico to come around to come up with that $9 million non-federal match. That's very important from us. That's outside of our traditional hunting and fishing dollars. What that would do is more than double the agency's annual budget. So you're looking at a, a budget that normally is about 25 or 35 to $40 million based off of hunting and fishing license sales and excise taxes, going to an additional 35 million that's on species of greatest conservation need. I think, again, it's gonna be transformational. It's gonna take work from a lot of you all. Uh, and I know a lot of members in here have already started advocating for it, but it's gonna take a lot of work from these groups to try to get to how do we get to that $9 million of non-federal match to reap those benefits. And that's gonna include, this will, it goes to everything from species management, trying to keep common species common, prevent species from being listed. And it'll also help us with keeping wildlife corridors open through having resilient habitats, working with the Department of Transportation on bypasses, overpasses, whatever that be, and working to ensure that we have you know, one of the biggest corridors of wildlife around is flyways of birds, right? So we always have stopovers, those kind of things. How do we ensure we have healthy winter range habitat for these birds that depend upon New Mexico for a lot of their winter range or stopover habitat when migrating from the Caribbean to up through or the, the tropics up through their, their ranges? So I guess my discussion is more of putting in the minds of people of how do we come together to try to find a lot of that non-federal match to capture what I think will be one of the biggest funding changes that we have seen, at least in my lifetime, for wildlife, hopefully in the, in the near future. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Stuart. That was uh, well stated. Uh, Sanders, the boss needs to be busy in the next session. <laughs> Add, add another nine million to the tab. Give me my notes. Okay. <laughs> Did I hear you say one time that that additional thirty-seven million dollars we may need as many as ninety additional staff at uh, the department? That kind of those kind of funds. Yeah. So yeah, I think one of the biggest things that we'll see come along with that it would. And I suspect Recovering America's Wildlife Act will pass Congress. I think it's making momentum through Congress. And we are going to be at a capacity issue internally within staff to, to implement all of the programs that we see fit. I think the first phase of that would be probably an additional 90 staff members is what we see. 
whether that be regional biologists working on specific species, whether it be prairie chicken or dune sagebrush lizard or whatever it be, there's going to be a large outgrowth of staff a lot more dedication into the species the greatest conservation need and, and that 90 staff is, is that support staff as well nicole mentioned the importance of partnerships with us right now as a state agency because we are limited staff capacity limited trying to get the technical advice on using the gis data with our collar to collar information to build these maps these hotspots we're capacity limited right now. This would allow us to maybe bring some of this in-house, have more staff members with statistical expertise, those kind of things, and grow that. The other thing that it allows growth from is potentially on our traditional hunted species as well. Right now, again, we, we do a lot of species greatest conservation need work. We use hunting and fishing dollar, license dollars for that. What this will allow is free up some of that, grow and expand both our our traditional sporting fishing hunting programs, but also a significant growth in that species, species of greatest conservation. Should be good problems to have in the future, hopefully. All right, great panel. Thank you all. And we will open it up to uh, the floor for questions and our uh, Zoom participants. Stuart, I guess, turn me back here in the back of the room. I was told not to talk close to the microphone. It's much louder than earlier when I used it. Sorry for that. Um, Stuart, you brought up the, the issue about map funding, and I think moving forward, that's going to be a really important issue as we start to address and try to leverage funding for these projects. And I think finding the match funding, the non federal match funding for the Wawa, the Rabo match is going to be important. But, you know, until that's passed, I think. Currently, there's some opportunities that uh, from the federal side, the state has like NIF with another that may not have matches that are similar to that of like Pittman Robertson, a two to one. Um, and these smaller grants, like one one opportunities where the, the, the benefit may not be as, as, uh, as large for the department to want to compete for a grant like that. I'm curious, how do we address those smaller one-to-one -one opportunities that may be more focused on, on issue around connectivity like the network craft proposal? And I'm also curious what potential um, state funding sources that you might have identified earlier in the conversation could be used for those potential, those potential matches. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I think the, the biggest thing with, as you mentioned, the NIFA grants, for example, is a 50-50 match, one-to-one -one match, whereas PR is a 25% for us. So from, from a standpoint of the department, if we're going to use 25, 25 cents of a license dollar on a project, it makes a lot more sense than a 50 cent, 50 cents if we could do the same project work. So I think a lot of it right now is because we're not fully... Um, we're not overmatched on our PR funds. We'd rather use that 75% reimbursement rate rather than the 50%. I think where that NIFWIF money comes in to where it could be really helpful, and we've done it on other projects. On, for example, there was a big NIFWIF project on the Pecos River running through into the Texas, and finding non non state dollars, not game protection fund or state um, general fund dollars, and finding partner money. And if you could find non-federal partner money, it really helps us to capture that, whether it be, um, we've used Coca-Cola money, for example. Coca-Cola money helped fund um, habitat restoration on the Vibe at all. And so can we find those partners? How do we find those non-traditional partners in, um, that are interested in conservation to be able to tap some of those other NIFWF type funding to, to implement on the ground rather than maybe tapping into state license dollars in those countries. Additional questions here in front. Hi, I'm Brittany Fallon, I'm the policy director of Brittany for a while, and I always love seeing you know, the Jeremy Romero because he's exactly alike, and he asked the first question that I wanted to ask. Um, so instead, I'm going to expand upon what you were talking about. And something that I think a lot of advocates don't understand, and in particular, 
a lot of legislators don't understand, with the exception of a couple stars like Amy Stewart, like Christina Ortez, um, is we're talking about new programs like Carolina, we're talking about expanded programs like um, the IIJA, Federal Infrastructure and Jobs Act, but they don't understand that other agencies across the board, including the FISH, are already not getting matching dollars for existing programs, let alone all this new money that's coming down the pipe. And so I was wondering, and for the benefit of all of us, if you could um, list off a couple programs, for example, that you fish currently does not fully leverage because it can't. I would say that we we leverage all of our funds, so we we have not turned back any federal dollars, but we've been creative in the way we've been able to match dollars. And, and why I say creative is, for example, state forestry might have a project that is in a landscape that we're interested in. State forestry might be doing it more for a, a urban interface fire protection type project that maybe came from an appropriation from the state, from the from the legislature on a capital appropriation to do forest restoration or fire mitigation. We'll use that state forestry dollar that they're spending on that to then expand upon that landscape that we are going to, 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 to try to work with them. So for example, around Conahee Lone up in Northern New Mexico, they were doing a lot of uh, uh, mitigation work around the, the city that, or town, their municipality. We then work with the Forest Service to expand the scoping area that the, the forest restoration would go into, into the forest that was where we were more concerned on wildlife habitat values. So every dollar that state forestry spent on that project, we brought three more dollars to the table for every dollar and worked in the uplands and the, in the upper watershed to expand that project to maybe what would have been a, a 5,000 acre forest, uh, state forestry project defending defensibility around a town to now a 30,000 acre wildlife restoration project. So we've had to find those, as Jeremy kind of went off, those other opportunities to expand and use those federal funds. We have not turned back a federal fund dollar in the last 10 years. Another one was Coca-Cola. They brought almost $200,000 to the table. Every dollar they brought to the table, we brought an additional three. So those are the things that we've been trying to do right now. I think that's that PR funding is very specific on how it can be used what it's for, and, and this Recovering America's Wildlife Act money will be very specific. And what it's gonna be even more specific on that is what the non-federal match is. It's not gonna be hunting, it can't be our hunt, traditional hunting and license dollar match. We can't use that for match, it'll have to be some other source. So I think either, if, if we don't have appropriations, let's say from the legislature to match that, we're gonna really have to search out and seek some of those partnerships like we've done with state forestry. To find the full nine million dollars, I don't know that it happened. So I, I do think we will need to find some other state. And in addition to needing straight up matching dollars, do you also have staff capacity needs like grant writing staff? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's as John mentioned before. We, we, we just presented to our state game commission at the last meeting, kind of our first mock-up of what we would what we would see if Recovering America's Wildlife Act came through. It's almost 90 employees that we think we would need. Some of that is going to be people that are specifically writing grants. Some of that's going to be actual fiscal agents, right? So just because you have the money, you have to spend it. You're spending it according to state uh, rules and, and everything else. That takes staff time and people. So we are at a capacity issue. We're at a capacity issue of working with our land management agencies to grow those projects. So absolutely, we see as we it, this money comes available, which I do think it will to, with Congress eventually passing, we're gonna have to expand as an agency to fully utilize that, that money. And then my last question is for Sanders. Um, based on the presentations that you've seen today on the enormous amount of money coming down the pipeline, what you've heard from Stewart about the department needs for general fund matching dollars for RALA eventually, but also just a need for um, flexible money that they can use to match other grants in general. What do you think us as the advocacy community can do better to help the legislature understand that need in a state where we don't even leverage federal dollars for health care, for example? I, I think that um, 
you mentioned that it's not just the like legislators don't necessarily know about the all the federal dollars that were missing in the state for them. I don't think it's just this, I don't think it's just the legislators, and that's true. I think it's really a two pronged approach, maybe three. Um, one, there are the legislators, especially those on the House Appropriations and Finance Committee and the Senate Finance Committees, are key to getting dollars into the budget. And especially those who are on the interim legislative finance committee, the budgets are really formed in the interim. Um, so those are really the key numbers, and they don't always overlap 100%. Um, so really looking at all three of those committees, there's a huge overlap between those three, but not 100%. So looking at all three of those committees and who sits on those, and educating those legislators as a priority, I think is one problem. The other is the LSC staff. So that's the legislative finance council, full-time, year-round budget staff. There are about 40 to 50 of them. So they will literally all be doing work on the budget. They look at budget projections, they look at agencies. Every agency in the state has an analyst who is assigned specifically to work on their budget. So some of them have a couple of different agencies, but there's always somebody who's been focusing on that and really been focusing on it for years. So they understand and they're trying to, to learn those departments and what those agencies need. Um, but making sure that those staff people know about the federal programs, know what exists, know what money has been left on the table for decades, um, but also what's new and what's coming from the federal government now, but in just a second. Um, and then the third is just the agencies too. Making sure that the agency staff is aware of it so the agencies are putting together their budget requests that they are including us and in saying, we have this huge opportunity because secretaries, secretaries of agencies do not have the time to necessarily go through all of these types of things and know this information, but I'm sure that most of them would not want to leave federal dollars on the table if they know about it. So making sure that proper staff and the agencies know so that as they're building their budgets, they can put that request in, so it's coming from every different angle to make that request and leverage those dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Got a couple questions over here, right? Ready? This is for Tabor. I've got a multi-pronged question for Tabor and then a follow-up for Renee. Tabor, I'm curious about what the catalyst was for the formation of the alliance in Colorado. How you determine what membership means, if it's like open to citizens, citizen scientists, conservationists, interested folks, and how you communicate with those people. Do you have statewide meetings, webinars, local meetings, local subgroups, other than the technical groups, that sort of thing? Yeah, really great questions. I mean, we're sort of constantly evolving as a, as an alliance. Um, so the kickoff was really through our summit in 2017, and um, there was about, let's say, 80 participants, and that was really what came away as this is the need for the state. We need this collaborative forum to share ideas and work together so we all know sort of what's going on uh, throughout the state. And then CDOT uh, and Parks and Wildlife both found money in their operational budgets to just sort of kick it off. Um, but it was pretty, it was pretty grassroots, and it's really funded by the regions as opposed to sort of the statewide uh, entities. So that's been a really a regional. Uh, the environmental managers um, are really the ones that push that forward from the regional perspective. In terms of uh, membership. Uh, it, it, again, that is sort of a new um, a new form that we're working with right now. And so since we're moving our old technical teams, we're split up into um, outreach and education, data analysis, policy and funding. Um, and those didn't really have a place necessarily for community members or for citizen science. So the new way we've organized are those project specific technical teams. So once we choose our priority projects, that steering committee, who serves the higher level environmental managers, will be working with their staff on the ground to figure out what the project needs are to keep that project moving forward, to find funds, to get right of way, to get a local community chapter in place. So that's where we see some of the community coming into it is really at that ground level for each 
individual priority project as opposed to the statewide initiative, which is, it is really much more technical at that level. We're talking about carcass data or um, sort of what the different constraints are that the different regions are, are, are finding on the, on the different sort of statewide priorities. So we're seeing the community come in really at that project specific level. I guess I was wondering what the catalyst for the uh, summit was. Was it the governor's executive order or Colorado Department of Wildlife to work on habitat connectivity or something else to grow out of the grassroots NGO movement there? Yeah, we did have some NGO funding and CDOT found some funding that the mule deer strategy was really what got CPW involved in that. And then CDOT found some funding from their environmental managers. but. Um, it really did seem to just come from a staff desire to like land this thing and really prioritize it. Because I think they were so frustrated with not having the conversation. Um, so it really was you know, the staff environmental managers that put that together and, and led that from that perspective. But Tony Katie uh, will be speaking tomorrow at 10 a.m. and he would be a really good one. He's from CDOT, he's environmental manager of Region 5. And he'd be a great one to sort of uh, to, to talk to about that, that those initial conversations within CBAT and within CPW, and he could probably give you some better perspective of the politics. Thank you. Okay. And Renee, can you hear me? Sorry, just you know, you're a little fuzzy. I can, but I can barely. Uh, I I can sort of hear you. So <laughs> maybe John can transmit my question, but. You went through a number of new, new uh, funding laws and bills, and I just caught part of those. Could you kind of quickly summarize how much money dedicated funding is coming to the state or to the Mexico Department of Transportation that's not competitive? I heard multiple uh, laws and multiple millions of dollars, I think. Right. So, um... So I, I, what I can do, so the discretionary grant programs, as you know, like those are the ones, they will vary in terms of eligibility as well as, you know, individual projects uh, level of competitiveness based on the specific uh, selection criteria, of course. But the ones that I went through, um, let me just check really quickly here, um, some of my notes. So the ones, and this is actually from if this is a, I can send you the link to this uh, allocation sheet. It's actually on that Federal Highways Bipartisan Infrastructure Law website I mentioned. Um, but the ones, and I, and I think these are new numbers based again on that, uh, the recently passed uh, fiscal year 22 federal fiscal year budget. So in terms of, let's see, surface transportation block grant, um, it indicates you all will be getting 114 million. As I said, about roughly half of that uh, is statutorily, and, and it's my understanding this is a new mechanism, but, but uh, uh, if someone, if someone uh, says, no, that this, we've been doing this for a while, then I would stand corrected. But I think it's new language in the bill that basically says, you know, roughly 55%, I believe, of those 114 million, they will actually now go directly to certain communities of various sizes. And then there's sort of a, um, let me look at my cheat sheet again, there's sort of a bucket of uh, additional funds that can go to sort of any area, again, within that 113, 14 million, uh, there will be, again, set asides for each of the communities greater than 200,000, between 50 and 200,000, five to 50,000, smaller than 5,000. They have individual statutory set asides. Any area is about 44 million, off system bridges, 3.3 million, effectively. So that's surface transportation block grant. I know it's a lot of numbers fast. I can send you the spreadsheet. You can confirm I got it right. Um, the next one is, let's see, oh, the formula allocation under the PROTECT program. So again, wildlife crossings uh, infrastructure isn't expressly directly eligible under there. That's all geared towards uh, infrastructure resiliency in the face of extreme weather and, and natural uh, events. 
Um, but the formula allocation is going to be about 13 million for that. Uh, next one is transportation alternatives. That's actually a carve out from that surface transportation block grant. That's about 12 million. It's my understanding that states, uh, that that is subject to a state uh, a competitive process that the state, New Mexico DOT, uh, has in place. Um, I think the state can apply if they do so on behalf of another eligible entity, but otherwise the focus for that is really on um, sort of local uh, non-state uh, uh, infrastructure or facilities. Highway safety improvement program, that's 28 million. Um, and I think that might be all of the ones that, that come through that formula allocation. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, I think those are all the ones that, that will come through the formula allocation. Thank you. No pressure, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any state match associated with those block grants? Could, could you repeat, repeat that? Sorry. Sorry. Right, um, this related question, is there any state match with any of those block grants that are out in the states? Yes. So, so historically, it's the general rule is it's the 80 federal, 20 state local. Um, it does vary depending upon the type of project. So, but that's a rough, that's a rough estimate that there's generally about 20% match required. Again, there are exceptions to that, but that's, that's the typical match. I'll also note, just out of the blue, that uh, on we, well, a group of organizations that ARC works with, our, our partners and other folks who've been working on this issue or working on the wildlife crossing pilot at the federal level, and actually Colorado Wildlife uh, and Transportation Alliance joined us in these comments. Thank you again for that. Um, we filed comments in response to, there is an open request for information. Uh, anyone who wants to file comments with Federal Highways and USDOT suggesting, uh, making suggestions about how they can implement some of these programs and what they should be doing, uh, we, uh, you're, you're able to do that. Again, if you go to that website, there's a link for that request for information in the carousel on the homepage. Um, if it's not the very first item, if you just click the little button, it'll take you, it'll take you to a link for looking at and filing comments and request to that request for information. The reason I'm highlighting it is because one of the requests that we made in our comments was for federal highways to find that there was no uh, required non-federal match for the pilot that the program was set up in such a way that that would be one of the selection criteria. Uh, you would be more competitive uh, under that um, secondary selection criteria of how much non-federal match you were bringing. Um, and then, of course, I'm a, an attorney by training. So it was like, and if you disagree with that, I've got another argument for you. And the other argument is, uh, if you think it applies, you can waive it and you should waive it so that you will have a level playing field. Um, and that way uh, you, you can make sure that you've got the best uh, projects being selected. So I know that wasn't part of the question exactly, but I did want to flag that pending argument uh, for a waiver. And also to note that there is another example under the um, bridge formula allocation program where uh, federal highways did waive the match for off system bridges. So it's not unprecedented that uh, to have a, a request or or to have a waiver of that match and, and fingers crossed they do so. Thank you, Renee. Um, one more question to Dave Dunberger again from Future Animal Trust um, for Chief Wiley. Um, I know in Colorado, the state DOT doesn't manage land at all. And so conservation easements and uh, voluntary land acquisitions are run through uh, the CPW, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Just wondering if there's a role for an excavating fish in voluntary land acquisitions with regards to wildlife crossing. Yeah, absolutely. I I think CPW does definitely has more of a branch that deals with that. Um, we we don't necessarily take on a lot of easements ourselves, but we'll work with other land 
based conservation easements. And I think that's where we have the ability. I think Mark kind of mentioned some of that earlier on, on working with those land easement kind of organizations on, do we know, and I think our, our role really could be on, is there specific willing landowners that are where we know of a corridor that's important, working with an, a, a land-based uh, group in New Mexico or a national group to say, look, let's work with this willing landowner to try to put an easement on this property or try to conserve this important corridor. So I, I do see a role at the agency working with, and I, I think our role really is identifying those landowners that are willing to work with us, work with DOT on, on some of that, and then working and facilitating that with, with an outside organization to help maybe foster that conservation easement through time, but absolutely see, see that process. Jeff, you got a question? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. That's okay. Okay. That's for you. No? Uh, go ahead, Jeff. I'm gonna okay. type so, it. So this was a question I asked Renee a while back, but it's been several months, but and she might have covered this in the presentation, but there was a lot happening there, but I was curious to know if um, some of the funds for the pilot program can be used for design. So that's a great question, Jeff. And, um, and the answer is, we're not sure. And that is actually the other issue that uh, ARC and the group of uh, uh, our partners in it and other folks working on this uh, raised in those comments that we filed in response to the RFI. And we basically said, we made the argument that you should, the statute doesn't, I would argue the statute isn't clear. The statute says projects aimed at reducing wildlife vehicle collisions and in so doing, um, improving habitat connectivity. I think there are, you know, every successful on the ground shovel ready project has a number of steps leading up to it uh, that that will make that project successful because it's data driven because you're putting it in the right place, etc. And you all know this better than I do. So we made the argument that federal highways should interpret that term project broadly, so that folks who did not have uh, a shovel ready project wouldn't be completely cut out of this funding pot. Um, and in particular, uh, of course, the, again, the goal is to have this track kind of the best and brightest projects, if you will. So um, you would want to, I would think you would want to be encouraging uh, data driven shovel ready projects. And, and if that's true, then you would want to define that word project broadly. I think we're really waiting to hear from federal highways as to how they will uh, interpret that uh, term. Um, so we're still in a wait and see mode. I'm I'm sorry to say, for now. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the floor? We still don't see questions coming in online. Jesse has a question in the back. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, this question is for Stuart. You talked a lot about the. Um, the need for increased capacity after the passage of Lala. And obviously in New Mexico, I can't speak for the rest of the country, but in New Mexico in particular, we're experiencing a serious labor shortage. And one concern that I have, and maybe you've got uh, your pulse on this a little bit better, but um, when the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish uh, receives this influx of funding, it's uh, you know, I, can, I think we safely said that every state wildlife agency across the country, or at least the majority of them who have a matching fund, are also going to be looking for all kinds of different positions to be filled. And my question is whether or not you know uh, if the biologists are currently out there. I mean, do, do we currently have the people out there to fill the positions that are going to be created by Rob? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I. Four years ago, I would have said yes. And the, the reason why I say that is, for example, we had a regional wildlife biologist job in TAPS that opened up four years ago. We had 115 applicants for that one position. Huge competitive market. A lot of the, the biologists you see on staff 
dream of becoming the biologist. They spend a lot of time working on it. They get multiple degrees, very competitive. The last year we've advertised a job and we get 15 applicants. So I don't know if that's a function of, are we coming out of a pandemic slump, kids getting graduating from school? Because in general, most of our staff are masters and higher level ed educated. And that, that's just the function of, of a lot of our positions. I do think that there is gonna be a lot of competition across the nation, just like there is for any of our jobs right now. There is gonna be a larger pool for, for people to select from. But I do also think that there is, you know, I don't know what happened from a, from a school perspective. Is a lot of kids going to graduate school? Did they not go to graduate school? I think we had a function of, you know, during the downturn, when, when the recession, a lot of kids couldn't find a job right away. So they went and got a master's degree and a PhD degree. And then all of a sudden you had this influx of highly educated students looking for jobs. I think and hope that we'll see that again. I think one of our big goals is working with universities to prepare the future. I think that's happening a lot with, with federal agencies as well. We try to bring on volunteers, interns that are interested in what we do to try to get sink them into why New Mexico is good for them, whether they're a kid from out of state or a kid from in-state, we're trying to recruit that, that next generation. And it's gonna be difficult for everyone. Hopefully we'll see a, a more competitive job market, I think in the future, but I think everyone's struggling with that aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to add one quick thing, the legislature just passed a 7% pay increase for all state employees, um, which will kick in by the beginning of the fiscal year. So hopefully that will make it more competitive um, for not just being a fish, but all of the agencies across the state. I don't know how we compare to other states, um, but the idea was so that we could the state jobs would be more competitive for retention, recruitment, and retention. So hopefully that will help fill some of these positions um, that are open and hopefully new ones that will become open. We have about five minutes left in this session, so do we have a question? Uh, more of a point of clarification. We may want to see that. I got a question for Stuart. When we were looking at the Chama Minority Corridor, the Lava Corridors Act, which is documented in a number of different overpass locations, including one on the Humphrey Wildlife Management Area. And I, I'm just assuming that because that my understanding is that property was bought by being fished for a winter range for mule deer and elk, if we could potentially use Pitt and Robertson funding for uh, like overpasses or underpasses, structures or fencing, you know, there's any limitations to that within Pitt and Robertson? So twofold point to that question, if the property, because it is a game and fish property, if it was bought, helped purchase with federal funds, we would have to go back to that federal entity to ensure that changing the character of the landscape, which I don't think an overpass would do. So let me, let me put it that way. Wouldn't impact the overall reason for purchase. The reason for purchase was wintering wildlife. So I think an overpass absolutely would qualify. So that's the first thing that we'd have to answer. And then the second, yes, I think it would definitely be uh, um, a, an expendable expense to PR because it's a benefiting of a, a, a wildlife restoration species, which is elk or deer. And so I think PR would definitely sign off on saying, yes, you can use federal PR funds for that. And you could bring non-federal match like DOT dollars as long as it's not federalized itself. If, if DOT had state funding or county had funding or municipalities had funding, we could use that match to bring the federal funds as well. Or we could use license dollars as well too if we, if we deemed that it was an important enough um, and had the, the, the state license number to do it. Thank you. All right, additional questions, panelists, do you have any questions for each other? I just, this is Renee, uh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to quickly add, I, I put this in the chat, but in response to Jeff's question, I should have mentioned that there is this expanded eligibility under the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, um, and it specifically uh, includes uh, project-related planning, design, construction, monitoring, and preventative maintenance. Um, I know that those are a lot of those funds are oftentimes, at least it's my understanding, difficult to come by. So it's my hope that that uh, expanded eligibility uh, will be something that um, 
these projects are able to successfully tap. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour and we have a scheduled break. Between, so we'll see everybody back at 3.15 again. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Kate. Panel, um, this panel that we have on the agenda, and for those folks following with us virtually, we're on our 315 to 415 panel. This panel is connectivity across jurisdictions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this panel today is going to be focusing primarily on connectivity across jurisdictional boundaries. Earlier today, you heard a little bit about what's going on from our BLM counterparts, as well as uh, folks in Colorado, and as well as um, folks from various different agencies. So today we're gonna focus primarily on what's happening kind of on tribal lands, as well as uh, what's happening on state lands. And then we're also gonna talk about uh, what our, our colleagues at the Forest Service are doing around, around connectivity. And then finally, we're going to talk about the, uh, the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act. So without further ado, I'm gonna kick this off to, to Leslie Hay. So good afternoon, everybody. Is it on now? Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. And it's so, I did wanna thank you for um, inviting the Forest Service to be here today. And then also thank you to Pew and to um, so many folks for putting this on. Um, it's very exciting time, I think, in the world of connectivity. and. And um, I think I want expression all for such a time as this. And Casey's demo said something similar this morning when he said, now is the time. <laughs> so um, is uh, my, oh, my slide up? Yeah, okay. Um, so the Forest Service across the nation is engaging in connectivity in a variety of different ways. And if, if this is nothing new to all of here, this is like that old expression, preaching to the choir, I guess, um, in the sense that for so long, since the 90s and so on, we have all been engaged in connectivity at some level. And I think Brian Bird told me earlier today, mid 90s, right, Brian? <laughs> and so, and, and I think this is, however, there's so much coalescing going on that this is uh, just an, a wonderful time to be part of this effort. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about connectivity and some of the efforts we're doing here in Region 3, which is Arizona and New Mexico. However, keep in mind that as the Forest Service, of course, we, we work together all the time. And so there's a variety of connectivity efforts going on across the nation and then out of our Washington office as well. And I guess I didn't introduce myself, did I? So my name is Leslie Hay. I'm the Regional Wildlife Program Leader out of the uh, Regional Office here in Albuquerque. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, of a summary. I've got a couple of slides I'm gonna show you a summary, but something I'd like to have, keep in your mind is I'm gonna build a little bit of a case as to why is now the time. And so to a certain extent, some of this is, is again, you know, preaching to the group that already knows and believes in this, but at least from the Forest Service angle, I think there's a couple of really good points that, that we can make. So first of all, we know that, that landscape connectivity is, is definitely increasing in momentum nationally and in the Western states. And of course that has, that pace has been set, if you will, and the precedent has been set by very various different legis legislation, including the, the DOI Secretary or Secretarial Order 3362, which Casey talked about earlier today, as well as the, as well as the Wildlife Corridors Act. And of course there's legislation in other states as well outside of our region, again, for the Forest Service War in Region 3. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the U.S. Forest Service 2012 planning rule, as well as some of our forest plans. In fact, I'm going to do a little bit of a tour of some of our forest plans, and then also point out that there are other different types of actions going on, such as in northern New Mexico, we have the three northern New Mexico national forests uh, repair, re, uh, repairing restoration EA, boy, that's a mouthful, isn't it? And so just so many different actions are occurring right now that I see really coalescing. And I just want to draw your attention sometimes as federal, state agencies, or even as NGOs, et cetera, sometimes we think we're the only show in town, right? But just want to remind you, and those of you that know this, we're so not that, right? Internationally, there's also a lot going on in the connectivity world that we can learn from. Um, and so this is one of my favorite pictures to show you that 
Um, this is called a monkey bridge, that little picture on the bottom right. So I work in Costa Rica as well. Um, we do uh, monitor, trail camera monitoring of different species of wildlife focused on jaguar, but a lot of other different species as well. And when you're cruising along in your car in Costa Rica, frequently I, I take student trips and other, other people down there, people say, what is that thing going across the road? And we'll say, well, the monkey bridge, that's a corridor. And so monkey bridges are, are pretty common. And so they put them up for howler monkeys. And this right here is white-faced capuchins crossing over a road. And so just, again, I think a lot of times it's good to step back and say, you know, what is corridors? What are linkages? Um, and here, what we do in the Southwest is certainly, it's, it's being done also in other places, but maybe just in a little bit different fashion since we don't have white-faced capuchins here. But, it, but of course we know this, but just to draw attention to the point again, that there's, there's a great deal of, of emphasis and we need to emphasize the issue of size and scale as we are looking across our landscapes and definitely in the Forest Service because here in the Southwestern region, we manage so many million acres of land that that is always in the back of our mind. Even the response to drought. And of course, there's been quite a, quite a lot of work lately done on drought. Uh, myself and the Rocky Mountain Research Station uh, biologist Gavin Jones and I gave a presentation at the National Wildlife Society meetings last November on drought. And it was quite interesting to me, we did a bit of a literature survey to see how important connectivity is in drought. And not only here in the United States and in the Southwest, but in other countries, such as in Australia, um, the, the importance of, of um, different types of connectivity and riverine systems for koala bears, for example. And so again, there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from other places. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Northern Arizona Landscape Connectivity Alliance, known as NALCO. And then just a couple of, of key points here. When you, we look at the SO3362, which of course has come up many times today and will during this entire summit, summit uh, while we are focusing on the three species of big game, um, I don't remember who said it, it might have been Casey, but, but others have said it as well, that it really, were, while that lays so much of an important foundation in the Forest Service regarding connectivity and other agencies were very interested in what those other species are. And I like to use this little diagram in the top right, looking at habitat corridors and movement to remind ourselves that, you know, that a corridor in some ways is in the eye of the beholder, right? And so if you're an amphibian or if you're an elk, or if you're a white-faced capuchin, it's gonna look different, right? And so those of us looking at, say, this riparian system in the picture on the bottom right, again, very important to always keep those things in mind. And we are so happy to see what is occurring in, in the state of New Mexico for the State Wildlife Corridors Act, and then the action plan, which will be um, a core topic for this entire um, summit is key. And I think a real, really important um, stage setter, if you will, for where we can go next. Um, along with some of the new new legislation coming out of, of the Washington office, including the, the 30 by 30 initiative and so on. Okay, so this is a slide everybody has seen probably a thousand times, but but um, whenever I'm giving this type of presentation, I like to get, make a couple of points with regards to the importance of, I'm gonna uh, draw your attention to the agencies on the left and the map on the right on the left side of the screen. And that is really just looking at those Western states. And so even in the connectivity, there's quite a bit of initiative happening just looking at the larger extent of Western states, as well as here in the Southwest region. And while we may not always be working together consistently, just that we, we continue to communicate and, and try to combine our efforts as much as we can. And I think one of the things I want to highlight on this slide right here, and again, this is, this is again preaching to the choir when we're looking at the, the New Mexico Wildlife Corridors Act. I don't need to repeat this because this has been discussed so much today, but, but drawing your attention to the bottom uh, sentence or, or two above, which is the, the plan builds on the past and ongoing efforts to raise support and priority wildlife corridors and projects across New Mexico. And so I have been asking some of the different New Mexico folks 
um, that worked on the, the action plan, including the, the gentleman to my right here, is you know, how can we look at these, these 11 top priority areas that have been identified in the state action plan and then say, where do those cross, for example, in, in different national forest lands? Because of course here in New Mexico, we have not five national forests and then we have six in Arizona, so 11 in the Southwestern region. And I want to talk just a little bit about the importance of how we certainly are trying to pay attention as many or probably all are as well and the importance of aquatic connectivity as well as terrestrial connectivity. And so this is just one example of where the Forest Service has worked with New Mexico Game and Fish as well as Defenders, Trout Unlimited and so on. And it's just, it's sometimes working in the connectivity world is like magic. <laughs> it just brings us together in a way that maybe we wouldn't otherwise. And so I just wanted to um, uh, give a, a shout out to some of the partnerships in the aquatic connectivity world and certainly in the world working with beavers, right? And so with here at this meeting alone, we've got Defenders, we've got Wildlands and, and Trout Unlimited and all the have been so important working with the Forest Service on some of this, um, the coalition, if you will, on, on connectivity, but also the alliance on, on Southwestern Beavers, which we are um, meeting pretty regularly and trying to, to decide how can we go together and uh, go forward together in this partnership. So let me pause now, talk just a little bit about the, the Forest Service 2012 planning rule. And while most in this room and out there virtually are probably very familiar with this, but I just want to call attention to the language in the 2012 planning rule, which is so important for us in the Forest Service. And I'll go ahead and read this one. And it states that the, with regards to connectivity, it defines it as ecological conditions that exist at several spatial and temporal scales that provide landscape linkages that permit the exchange of flow of sediments, nutrients, daily and seasonal movements of animals within home ranges, the dispersal and genetic interchange between populations and long distance range shifts of species. Now, I don't usually read term, terms exactly as it is on the slide, but this is a real critical element for the Forest Service that our planning rule does define this, right? And so in that sense, it gives us such an important foundation on how and where we can go forward on this. And of course, from the Forest Service angle on connectivity, it's been interesting to listen to the conversation today with regards to how much we focus on, on crossings and on, on linkages, et cetera. But of course, with us being the manager of over 22 million acres of land alone here in the Southwest, we might be thinking more in terms of patches, right? And there are big patches in some cases, such as the Tonto National Forest over in Arizona, or such as as uh, the Gila here, that's a in, the, in New Mexico, a large patch, if you will, right? But within that, of course, we have different leakages, we have crossings and so on that are that to draw our attention to. So whether your perspective is what you see on the top left photo or perhaps on the top right, it might be pertaining to species, but it could be pertaining to the agency that you come from, the nonprofit, et cetera. Okay, so within the Forest Service, we, what we have been discussing is how can we make progress on connectivity at the same time, how can we work sort of administratively and then also make progress, if you will, on this, the, the incredible partnerships that are already happening on the ground and have been happening here in the Southwest for a long time. And so I'm gonna draw your attention to the four cir concentric circles here. Number one, you see the Northern New Mexico, Arizona, Northern New Mexico forest. Number two, that little turquoise circle, you see the Northern Arizona Landscape Connect Connectivity Alliance, which are three forests in Northern Arizona. And I'm gonna pause for a second and, and just point out the importance of this. So Jeff Gagnon is here in the audience. Jeff is one of our core team members working with us on NELCA. And through working with Jeff, I have just been astounded at how much work is happening in Arizona, looking at wildlife movements and so on, as well as in New Mexico. And again, these partnerships are just key to making this happen. Number three, the, the circle you see in blue is that greater Mogollon Rim, Gila Central Arizona and New Mexico, and of course the Arizona Sky Islands down in the Coronado. Navajo. And so the important part of that is just to see as we try to look at how can we wrap our head around doing connectivity in the Southwestern region, how can we prioritize? And then, and then number four is the Southern New Mexico Forest and Sky Islands. So 
Um, some of the key features, again, if I were to see like a, a, a word going across that map, however, what I would see is partnerships, right? So while the Forest Service is, is managing under a great deal of, of external pressure and so on, um, a lot of land here in the Southwest, we're surrounded, of course, by the islands that we manage are surrounded by very important partners. And so as um, with, without a question, we, we are excited to be working with the folks that are in this room. And then, of course, out there, um, some, some folks may never appear at one of these meetings, but they're out there doing connectivity, right, in some of our, our districts and so on. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of a quick tour, walking you through some of our five New Mexico national forests. Of course, not the entire forest plan, and I won't read it, but I just want to, to draw your attention to say, oh, oh, okay. So I see that connectivity actually is in the language of these different forest plans. So first, we're going to talk about the Carson. So most people here have worked or are very familiar with the Carson National Forest. And the Carson has com plan components that focus on two main aspects, which are the restoration of ecological conditions that will facilitate wildlife connectivity and movements and providing the direction on infrastructure design that won't inhibit, but will improve wildlife, wildlife connectivity and movements. And then secondly, that the plan components do facilitate wildlife connectivity movements as I have highlighted here. And probably the most in what I have done is I put in turquoise the word habitat connectivity or connectivity that do appear in our forest plans. And so it's important, I think, to note that the, what you see on the bottom of the slide here is that similar language in the forest plan revisions do exist. And the Santa Fe, the Cibola, and drafts of the Lincoln, the Gila, the Prescott, the Coconino, the Cabal, Kaibab, the Tonto, the Avaras, and the Coronado. That was a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> but the important thing is, is that you can see that the that as far as connectivity goes, that the language is in the plants. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that it's challenging to try to figure out how are we going to do this on the ground, right? So one uh, example from the Carson is the Rio Chama CFLRP proposal. And of course, it demonstrates different types of restoration work that the Forest Service has been engaged in. Um, within the Carson. And one of the things I, I put on the bottom of this slide here is that the Forest Service right now, there was, for this cycle that we are in right now, there have been 29 different top priority landscape projects identified across the nation. And we are waiting for the next list of the top 10. But of course, it's possible that the Rio Chama might be in that, even if it isn't, it has been a priority project area on the Carson. So of course that relates to some of the connectivity discussion we've heard about here today. So as far as the Santa Fe goes, um, the Santa Fe has been in incorporating connectivity discussions and project design features. And I would like to highlight some of the aquatic work because the Santa Fe is so different than say the, the Coronado, for example, and, or maybe the Lincoln in light of the amount of water and the amount of rivering systems. And so one of the, the some of the language that's in the Santa Fe's land, resource, land and resource management plan is to complete aquatic restoration and priority projects that restore 30 miles of aquatic habitat. And you can see here there are several different examples, including installing fish barriers, restoring beaver populations, and so on. And so the important feature again is, you know, how is, is the Santa Fe doing or how are they doing some of that work on the ground? And indeed they are. So for example, they've been doing some pretty exciting beaver dam analog work, working with our partners and that if some of them are in the room right now. Um, and so again, just to point out that connectivity is, is occurring. Sometimes it may not have come under that particular label when it got started, but that some of that project work is, is, has been ongoing. Um, looking at the Cibola National Forest, you can see I'm going from north to south here. So looking at the Cibola, again, while the, the forest plan here, I, I address some of the desired conditions on connectivity. And I won't read this, but I just want you to see how many times connectivity does appear in the desired condition language. <clears throat> and then one of the points I'd like to point out here that the Cibola, however, brings up a different model, right, for connectivity than say the Carson or the Santa Fe, in particular when we start looking at island systems, right? Sky islands. So whether we're looking at oceanic islands, 
or whether we're looking at terrestrial island, it brings different, different challenges when it comes to wildlife populations of movements. As we talked about today, we've looked at some of the different um, types of crossing uh, issues and so on. Um, but of course, the, the Forest Service is trying to look at that. And I, I like to, to look at this diagram that's in the center of this slide where you see it, it comes out of a textbook on connectivity. And you'll see that the, with the dark, I, I don't know, you can see that the cursor there, you can see it. Okay, the right in the center here, again, what is our model of connectivity? And I know at least within the Forest Service, we're trying to, to keep be very mindful of this when we look at each and every one of our forests and who our partners are. You know, how much, how many patches do we have? How many linkages do we have? And so, and the same issue I'd like to point out here with the, the map that's in the center, the Siebel, of course, landscape-wise is going to be very different than say, well, what we are gonna look at if we're say perhaps looking at a map of the Gila National Forest in New Mexico. But once again, the, the desired conditions on connectivity are in the language of the forest plan. The Gila National Forest, this is a draft, and again, these, these do uh, come from the draft plan, which is not complete. However, there's, that calls out language on the native vegetation communities for connectivity, on ecological conditions that support um, not only what we might think of as a large scale connectivity, but also even smaller scale. And so whether it be federally listed species or SCCs, what we call species of conservation concern or rare and endemics, um, we are trying to address that. And the, this draft plan directly ad addresses the New Mexico Wildlife Corridor Action Plan on the Gila. And then this is also an example too, but just to, to keep in, we are keeping in mind that whether we're looking at an island system for a national forest or whether we're looking at a, a larger contiguous mass forest, such as the Gila, um, we, we are looking at the structural, functional, and scaled habitat issues as we try to to consider how are we going to look about doing connectivity. And then the Lincoln. So the Lincoln, of course, recognizes the need for habitat connectivity as well. It's a different landscape, of course, those of you that have spent much time there. And the Lincoln, I had asked them, so what are some examples that y'all are doing with connectivity down on the Lincoln? And they have explained, yes, we're working with the Muscaletto Apache, for example, to increase aquatic habitat for Rio Grande cutthroat trout. And uh, just as a number of projects that are going on down there, they recently received some funding from Rock, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation um, to, to, to address some post-fire restoration issues. But one of the things that I, I wanted to, to call out here is that e each of our forests faces different challenges, of course, and each of our forests faces different partners or perhaps the same partners. And in that, we certainly are trying to be very mindful of how do we go about addressing some of the, the big challenges. Um, fire is burning all the time, right? Literally and figuratively. <laughs> So, and here's the Lincoln again, and I'm not to call out the, I don't need to focus on the, the standards and guidelines coming out of that forest plan, but, but they certainly are, for example, are one forest that currently doesn't have beaver. They're quite interested in, in um, increasing their aquatic connectivity. They're, they've been doing some work that will do that and hopefully you know, build it and they will come, right, when it comes to, to beavers. And on this point, I wanna pause for a second and ask, how many people in this room have been engaged with us either in the past, currently, or plan on soon joining up with us on the Southwest uh, Connectivity Coalition? And I see another hand, <laughs> see a couple over there. So I want to just pause for a second and say, if you are interested, we have, I guess, a bit of a formal and informal group that has been, uh, we've been meeting quarterly called the Southwest Connectivity Coalition. And what we're doing in that group is just bringing us together, having conversations, having very good scientific presentations, some policy presentations, et cetera, to get the discussion going, how can we partner with each other more on this? And also there's the Southwest Beavers Alliance. I'm looking at Defenders and Brian and Michael Fax was here who has have worked on that as well. And so again, we're um, there's just a lot of exciting efforts going on right now. Okay, now I'm gonna pause for a second. We're gonna jump over to Arizona. And the Arizona group has, you see three different forest plans here. On the left, we have the Kaibab National Forest, in the center, the Prescott National Forest, and on the right, the Coconino National Forest. 
So almost two years ago, those three forests decided to come together in a formal, formal alliance with partners and say, we are going to formally acknowledge that we're going to, we need to be working together on connectivity. And in so doing, really just bolster our, our efforts and implement much of on the ground work that is needed for the um, landscape alliance that alliances that are needed for increasing connectivity. So last summer, so you can see it's signed here in July, uh, the 22nd or 21, um, we were able to establish formally the Northern Arizona Landscape Connectivity Alliance and the Forest Service. This is a letter of intent. It was signed by the forest supervisors. You can see here all three of those three national forests. And again, hats off to Jeff Gagnon and Hannah and the three, the, the bios working on that forest. We have not only um, this letter of intent, but you can see on the bottom here, we have a charter that's been completed and that establishes all of basically our operating guidelines. And that is the direction we'd like to go with some of our other forest clusters that you saw um, on that, that previous map. Um, but it, this has been very exciting to get this, this work established. So a couple of the points I'd like to kind of highlight here with this, this is nearly the, the last slide, is as we were looking at the Forest Service and it was looking nationally at some of these wildlife crossings, wildlife corridors, connectivity, there's much discussion that's been going on. Um, on the top right, you can see that is from our website from the Forest Service. There was a lot of work done in some pre prior years on this wildlife crossings toolkit. Um, and while I know that there's still um, interest in that, there's a great deal of interest in that, but right now we just have so many other, other priorities underway. And for example, right, uh, just I think a month ago, we finished the Region 3 wild, Wildfire Crisis Strategy, and that's a round table that's going around the nation. And so there's so much that's pulling us in different directions that makes it difficult sometimes to put something like connectivity at the highest priority. And of course, to not only do that at the Washington office and the regional offices and down to the local forest office, whether that be from the Carson down to the Lincoln and figuring out how can we you know, make this happen on the land. And the point of partnering, I think is gonna be, that's the answer, you know, partnering communications and just clearly working together. But, you know, I'd say the same thing with us trying to understand um, how the Forest Service lands overlap with those 11 priority areas here in New Mexico. And of course, it does tier to a variety of the legislation that's out there. And you can see here what I've put here is that the future steps is, is to try to evaluate those planned priority sites. And of course, we, uh, this is getting much attention. Region 6, 2, and 4 have looked at these kind of models on the bottom where you see these these crossings uh, to try to evaluate how, how we can do that in other parts of the, the nation. So I wanna leave you with this slide right here. And, and I've so many questions I'd like to go around to everybody in this room and ask, <laughs> you know, how would you suggest that we could work together more? You know, how can we be more effective on the ground for connectivity? Um, and then if I, even though this is a, this is a um, PowerPoint that I've done to a couple of different audiences, of course I've modified it every time, but this ingredients for success slide for us is important, but I would pause and say, I would just, if I summarize it in one word going across the slide, it would be partnerships. It would be working together, right? And that sounds easy to say, harder to do at times, right? But from our angle anyway, the kind of things that we look at is, is and this is my final slide. <laughs> um, so, of course, there's the legislative activity, which I'm building this case, right? So we have the support of the SO3362. We have the New Mexico State Wildlife Corridors Act and the Action Plan. We have the 30 by 30. We have the Restoration EA here in northern New Mexico. Um, and, of course, the EJA, where we're uh, fondly calling it, the Investment Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And there's, we know, for example, you know, we have a lot coming our way and we're filling a bill in the first of the cycle, we're going to be drinking from a, another fire hose. But still, just we have a lot of support for, for connectivity, I believe, and just these different types of policy examples and the collaborative processes that will be necessary in the Southwestern region. Number two, as I earlier identified, we have the 2012 planning rule and the forest plan revisions, which are very supportive of connectivity work. And then in the, those forest plans, as we implement them, that of course, we get, that's where the rubber hits the road, right? So how do we do it, right? And then number four, we'd like to 
to continue with, with monitoring just to determine, you know, like we're talking this project we've been doing with um, Arizona Game and Fish for NALCA, put in a project for some crossings and of course, like in some water structures and like Jeff had said, we need cameras, of course, right? And just so, sometimes that it's it's intuitive, you know, but but it just working together is, is key. But again, I think we need to celebrate and share our successes as we go about this, because this is no easy road we're trying to hoe here. But also I would conclude with Casey's previous statement, now's the time. So thank you. And I'll would do questions after the time. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. I, uh, as you mentioned earlier, you've uh, had the opportunity to give that presentation a few different times, and I've uh, been fortunate enough to be a part of those, those presentations, and I've, and I've really thoroughly enjoyed it every single time. So I, I look forward to seeing this work continue to culminate and where it goes from there. I'm sure a lot of you have <clears throat> questions for, for Leslie, but before we get to those, we're going to go ahead and move on to our other panelists. So next we have uh, Bianca Gonzalez from the New Mexico State Land Office. And Bianca, I'm asking if you can just uh, introduce yourself a little bit more, your role and, and kind of what you do. Oof, it's getting sweaty in there. I envy you guys. <laughs> um, hi, yeah, my name is Bianca Gonzalez. I actually grew up in Taos and I now work for the State Land Office as the Landscape Scale Land Planner. And I think the commissioner gave an intro uh, to my position earlier, but I just wasn't here, so um, don't have a super high standard for me, please. Uh, <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the state land office's approaches to connectivity um, across state trust lands. No, I'm okay, thanks. I'm a little dehydrated, sorry. I can see them from here, too. thanks. Hi folks. <laughs> Hi Zoom world. So uh, yeah, my name is Bianca Gonzalez and I'm from Taos and I work as the State Land Office Landscape Scale Land Planner. And I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Um, restarting, so I'll be talking about approaches to habitat connectivity across state trust lands. And um, yeah, next slide. So to give a, a general overview of what I'll cover in this talk, um, first I'll talk about, is it kind of bringing a little bit? Or is that just me? No? Okay. Um, I'll first talk about our vision uh, for connectivity across state trust lands. Uh, and then I'll move over to our internal leasing process and a little bit of uh, state land office history, which I'm sure you've all heard it a thousand times, but who knows who's on. Um, and then I'll move on to current and future approaches. So um, this is generally going to be categorized in two buckets, opportunistic approaches, so opportunities that the state land office has been approached with, and proactive projects. So projects that we're working on or planning for the future. And that'll be a pronghorn project in the southwest area between Roswell and Corona. We've implemented a wildlife friendly fencing project that I'll talk about. And then also some um, landscape, sc landscape scale uh, restoration projects in the Loire Mountains. Um, if we have enough time, I'll talk about the uh, best management practices and our compliance standards that we're now implementing. And finally, I'll touch on ways to get involved and save time for questions after all of us have started. Go to the next slide. So, to understand our vision for connectivity, we really have to understand the state land office constitutional mandate. And our mandate um, is actually to generate revenue for future generations. Um, so we're not only generating revenue now and for our public beneficiaries of so all of the state schools, but also stewarding the land for future generations. So oftentimes these two can kind of butt heads and it leaves us with a, a bit of a, a question, how do we do, how do we uh, address both of these? So one way that uh, the state land office has thought of um, using our resources to address connectivity across state trust lands is um, leveraging the resource we have the most of, and that's the land. So we have 9 million circuit takers across the state, and those are the little blue blobs that you'll see and um, it's both checkerboarded and contiguous. Uh, so brief, short history, 
in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, through many acts and treaties, and I'm not gonna put you through a history lesson, uh, we were granted sections 2, 16, 32, and 36. Uh, next slide. And so that created this checkerboard landscape. And so this is a little south of Tucumcari and each little square that you see there is actually a mile by mile or 640 acres. And so I would like to pose a question to all of you is what do you see when you look here? At least for me, yeah, right, nothing. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I see opportunity. So I see um, the ability for all of us to come together as land agencies and um, like Leslie here said, partner. And what, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this later, but uh, I'm, I'm really particularly excited about the Wildlife Quarters Action Plan 11 projects that were identified because I think that there's a way for us to complement those infrastructure projects um, by expanding the infrastructure projects um, to the surrounding areas and creating ecological corridors uh, around those infrastructure projects. Next slide. So this is an example of a contiguous parcel. Uh, this is the Luera Mountains. That's um, a topo map of the Lueras. It's not really supposed to convey any information other than um, it's a contiguous parcel of state trust land. And um, this is where, yeah, so this is where we've done a lot of large scale restoration and we have restoration, we have parcels like this that are large acres across the state, uh, Lower Mountains, uh, South of Toro. We have Chupadera um, Mesa, which is a little south of Albuquerque. We have the White Peak area where I'm doing uh, a lot of my planning work right now. And that's a little south of Interfar. And they all require heavy lift. Go ahead. Thanks. So um, the primary uh, business in uh, the surface division is grazing. So my position is in surface. There's surface, commercial, rights of way, renewable energy, those are within commercial, oil and gas, and surface. Um, and what we engage in primarily in surface, although I, I've kind of been put around in multiple places, um, is making sure that our grazing lessees steward the land properly. So right here in this picture, you'll see Jess of Covera Coalition teaching folks a uh, little soil infiltration experiment. She puts that, um, it's a metal ring and hammers it down and then you pour water in and you take it out and you see how long the water uh, takes to infiltrate in the soil. And so information like this is actually used in ranch plants. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize this because we're still kind of figuring out the sweet spot of how do we make sure that our lessees are integrating um, like the best stewardship practices for their land while not being overbearing. <laughs> uh, so next slide. Uh, so uh, the reason that I'll talk about the surfing, surface leasing process is it'll set us up for understanding the best management practices and compliance standards later. So in this picture here, you'll see the dark blue is actually chat one or two, which uh, for those that don't know, chat is um, crucial habitat assessment tool. It's developed by the Department of the Game Fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Um, and it really ranks land based off of the, um, the, the sensitivity. So chat one is that area is going to be really sensitive. You, you probably have some high value animal or high value uh, riparian area. And that's actually the Corrales and um, Bernalillo area. So that's why it's dark blue. Um, so the service division will, will take applications in from uh, commercial leases. So any renewable applications, any rights of way, any rights of entry, and if they're within a chat one, so really sensitive, or if they're within a CCAA, which I won't touch on today, uh, then we'll review it. And our biologist, Katrina Hux, I don't know if any of y'all met her, but uh, she was here earlier today and unfortunately had to sleep. So that's our general surface leasing process on reviewing applications when they come in through the door from commercial. So, only if they're sensitive areas will we review them and then again, make recommendations. So emphasis on the recommendations. Next slide. 
So I put this picture in here so that I could remind myself not to take myself seriously. Um, <laughs> I was on the Little Coyote Creek prescribed fire, uh, south of Angel Fire, and uh, no one told me I had a unibrow all day. So I just love that of all the firefighters. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the state crestland, so we have <coughs> current approaches. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm running out. Um, yeah, so our current approaches are really within opportunistic projects. And so those opportunistic projects are where we have partner interests or um, there's a really obvious wildlife need. So, um, I mean, that makes sense, right? Some, some issue comes up, the state land office usually has to address it. And that's, that's where bread and butter is. Um, next, we have uh, proactive approaches, which I'll talk about later. Uh, management plans, which haven't really been done in a traditional fashion. So uh, the Luera's, uh, Chupiter Mesa and White, White Speaker, we're, we're currently working on those. And compliance standards and best management practices are how we address the question of what are we going to do with resources that are um, irreplaceable? How do we make sure we protect those resources? And finally, monitoring and research projects, which I'm not going to talk on today, but I think are really important when we're thinking about climate change resiliency. Next. Um, yeah, so these are pronghorn roaming freely, and I couldn't get a picture from our surface division in time, so thank you, internet. Um, uh, yeah, so I put these up here because um, this was one of our opportunistic projects where uh, there, there was a need for replacing wildlife, uh, replacing fencing to wildlife friendly fencing. So we worked with the Department of Game and Fish and between Rosal and Corona replaced about six miles of fencing, uh, quarter mile sections. And um, I think what we've heard from folks is that, from local folks is that they're returning to the area. So that's just awesome to know that our work is meaningful. Uh, and of course, we also have opportunistic projects from other agencies, nonprofits, and internally we have our team of specialists, our forester, um, our biologists, uh, range ecologists, and we can't forget our lessees because most of the state land office land is um, leased out to lessees. Go ahead. Thank you. Right, so here you'll see this is a picture of um, a forest, prescribed forest fire in 2017 in the Luera Mountains. Uh, thank you, Mark Myers, for being the lead on this project. But since 2009, we've actually treated 90% of our project full, which is amazing because um, this area is, it's, uh, if anyone's been, it's truly magical. You have some of the largest elk. Uh, and it's, it's state land and public land, and there have been many projects prior to my arrival here that have, um, yeah, led, led to a lot of this project work. One second. Uh, um, so this, this work, it's really building landscape resiliency, and the reason I wanted to put fire up here is because all of the different fire work is setting the landscape up to be drought resilient. And that's really important when we're thinking about forage for animals that are traveling through the area. Um, and of course, we couldn't have done this in part without our local partners. Uh, one last thing to mention about the Luaras is all of this work here was funded through a collaborative forest restoration project uh, grant. So these are federal dollars. So uh, planning was done in advance, and that's why we're calling it a proactive approach. We had um, an environmental focus EA a archaeological surveys, biological surveys, and cultural surveys that allow all of this um, work in this landscape to happen. Go ahead. Oh, yay. Uh, we also have three wildlife drinkers in the Luaras, so that's approximately over 60,000 acres and 16 wildlife drinkers throughout the state. And this is where I uh, ask for you all to think about that previous slide with all of the different checkerboards across the state. Um, I think that there's a possibility for us to possibly, again, expand those, those infrastructure projects with, wild, with um, wildlife drinkers and make ecological corridors. 
but I also think there's the possibility to, well, I, I, re I really guess I, I'd like to ask the group, um, wildlife thinkers can address drought in places that are beginning to be drier, right? So, so is that a, a, a kind of a solution we might take in the future when thinking about preparing for um, drier conditions? Might we increase our wildlife drinkers throughout the state? Go ahead. Okay, great. So going back to the surface um, leasing process, uh, our biologist, Katrina, she'll review that commercial application, so that renewable energy application, if it's within a chat one or two or a CCAA, and then she'll give recommendations. But recommendations can only go so far. So our answer to this are compliance standards and best management practices. And compliance standards uh, for the practitioners in the room are really just uh, like a mini NEPA. They're a way for us, next slide, for us to address all the irreplaceable resources that you'll see here on the screen. Uh, next slide. Best management practices are our approach to our customers asking us, well, what can we do if there's a resource that we've encountered that isn't necessarily on those lists, but they want to be good stewards of the land, and we also want to have guidelines for them to follow when they come to us. So we have best management practices that can happen in tandem with uh, compliance standards in the design phase or in the construction operation or remediation phases. Next slide. Um, yeah, so really, um, I'm here to meet all of you. I joined during the pandemic, so I don't know anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, would, I would like to, sorry, next slide, because I want to say thanks to people. Yeah, I need to say thanks. Um, all these folks, it's primarily, I've cited most of their work. Uh, I'm working on a management plan in the White Sneak area, but I am still pretty new. Um, next slide. And this is an awesome photo that one of our district resource managers <laughs> sent to me, uh, I think from a few years ago. So any questions? Well, I guess sorry. Let's do that one. Awesome. Thank you, Bianca. Um, just kind of thinking off the top of my head, you know, three years ago when we when we uh, approached the New Mexico State Land Office to attend our our 2019 uh, Wildlife Corridor and Connectivity Summit in Taos, um, it was really uh, a unique opportunity to get a, I think, a, a deeper lens into how the State Land Office works. And from that summit, you know, as, as uh, Commissioner Garcia Richard this morning stated, her, her willingness to continue to support these efforts and engage on these efforts at that time was just was just words, right? And so sitting here and seeing Bianca present to us today with, with all of these proactive measures that the New Mexico State Land Office is, is taking is really, I, I think, something to be said for the steps that the State Land Office and, 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 and the staff there that comprises of, of New Mexico, the New Mexico State Land Office is taking to, to address these issues. Um, it's been, you know, going on three years, and based off of what Bianca was sharing with us today, I think the New Mexico State Land Office has, has really been doing some some amazing work. So I'm excited to uh, to see how that continues, and I appreciate you, Bianca, for for sharing that that presentation with us today. And I'm sure we got questions for Bianca, but as we stated, we're going to save those for the end. Um, next, I'm going to kick it off to our virtual panelist, Glenn Harper, coming to us from the Pueblo of Santa Ana. For those of you that don't know, Glenn has really, uh, from from my perspective, been a uh, a leader and an expert in this world of connectivity management, especially from looking at it on the lens of uh, tribal lands. So, without further ado, I'm going to kick it off to Glenn to talk to you guys about all the amazing work he's he's doing now and hope to be doing on the Pueblo Santa Ana. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you, Jeremy. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, good. And you can see my screen? Correct. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, to the New Mexico Wildlife Federation for inviting the Pueblo of Santa Ana to present on some of the connectivity work the Pueblo is involved with. Uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll learn a little bit about the history of the Pueblo, uh, where the Pueblo was at and where we're wanna go. 
And uh, with that, um, there was this book that uh, came out in 1994. It was called Santa Ana, the People, the Pueblo, and the History of Tamaya. And it was a book based on the uh, archaeological record and on oral histories. And in that book, there was this interesting uh, plate that I found. And this is um, in the 13th century after the uh, Pueblo of Santa Ana people moved out of the Chaco culture and established themselves along the middle Rio Grande. And this is Pa'aku on the east side of the Sandia Mountains, Albuquerque here, Socorro down here. So they initially established themselves and had a village here on the east side of the Sandias. And then over the centuries, they moved in a counterclockwise fashion all the way down through, um, this is Mesa Prieto or Black Mesa. You see there's villages here and farmlands all the way down to Socorro and returned back to Pa'aku. These were, um, the entire tribe didn't move. It was kind of groups that went through. And then they eventually met back up in Pa'aku. And then when the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, um, this is where the Santa Ana people were. And so they've been at this location, at that star, for approximately anywhere from 500 to 700 years. And uh, fortunately, you know, or unfortunately, the, the area that they used was roughly 1.8 million acres. And then the King of Spain granted them a whole 17,200 acres to maintain their traditional lifestyle. So you take this culture that uh, has relied on a large landscape, kind of like wildlife does, um, to, to meet all their needs of finding food and, and uh, conducting their ceremonies and um, just living. And then you put this community on 17,200 acres. Fortunately, over the years, the, the tribe has been able to acquire or reacquire its ancestral lands. And this star isn't the, is at about the approximate size of those 17,000 acres. So uh, they had expanded their land base to about 79,000 acres. And more recently, in 2016, they purchased the uh, southern half of the old King Ranch. And so they've increased their land base now by 800,000 acres. I'm sorry, about 800%. And they're, they're up to about 141,000 acres. And even 141,000 acres is a lot of land for an individual, but for, for a culture, to maintain a culture, it's still pretty small. Um, this landscape has parts of the Rio Grande that go through it, the Rio Jemez, the Rio Puerco just abuts the, uh, the new property. The elevations range from about 5,000 feet on the Rio Grande to about 7,000 feet on the top of the Mesa Prieta. Um, the, the, it's a semi-arid semi uh, environment that supports grasslands, shrublands, and pinyon juniper woodlands. I would call it more arid nowadays because it seems like we're just, it's just getting drier and drier. And so these are the lands that the Pueblo has, that it has to manage to maintain its traditional and cultural ways, which include a deep connection with plants and the wildlife. And so what are the threats to sustaining these wildlife populations for, for the Pueblo and for current generations? Climate change is obviously one. Um, we've been monitoring rain gauges for 22 years. We have a network of 34 rain gauges right now. And over those 22 years, we've only seen two wet years. Uh, we've seen nine drought years and 11 average years. So we're basically running between average years and drought years. And this is based in comparison to the long-term precipitation data that was collected since, since the 1920s here in Bernalillo. Another threat is the lack of surface water, uh, surface water availability. You know, the real Hamas dries out in May just as the flycatchers migrate through. This is um, mostly because of irrigation upstream. Uh, that's when the Hamas basically shuts off the Rio Grande flows at least at this point in time, perennially. But water is a big uh, concern and the Pueblo has set up, a, been aggressive in putting water out. Uh, we have a network of 80 wildlife drinkers that consist of, consist of small bird drinkers to troughs and rubber tire troughs and boss tank guzzlers and then solar powered ponds. Another threat is unregulated grazing. Um, the um, we had feral horses and feral cattle, and then including cattle that were owned by livestock on the on the pueblo uh, in the 19 late 1990s. Um, utilization rates were like 80 to 
70 to 80 percent. It's just you can't support plants when you're grazing that much. And so the, the Pueblo adopted a, a livestock code and um, is, is basically leaving in that code. It allows for 40 percent utilization of the annual production, which is really uh, what we're trying to do is grow healthy plants with healthy deep root systems, healthy soils, and vegetation communities that are resilient to these multi-year droughts that we've been, we've been seeing. Along with grazing come fence lines. So we've modified 33 miles of internal fences um, to make them wildlife friendly. Unregulated hunting was another threat, and that's something that has been going on until uh, 2005. So wildlife populations were pretty much non-existent before then. I mean, we would fly aerial surveys and count a handful of animals. Um, we took this information to the council. They changed their policies basically and adopted a wildlife code. We worked with the traditional leaders to get this approved. And um, we're, we closed it for six years. And since 2011, the, the, the Pueblo has had draw hunts for, for different species. What I'm really here to talk about is a little bit about loss of, of wildlife connectivity. And what we see along our boundaries, the black lines are, are the um, Pueblo's boundaries and the white lines is a roadmap from Sandoval County. Um, this is the sort of encroachment. We have Placidas over here, Bernalillo. We have um, uh, Rio Rancho and Bernalillo on this side. You know, we're located, for those of you don't, who don't know, we're 15 miles north of the largest metropolitan area in New Mexico, which has its benefits, but also can be problematic. Fortunately, early on, the tribe set aside about 1,700 acres out of its, at that point, would have been the 79,000 acres over here. And that area was set aside for economic development. I think that was really an important step that the tribe took. They knew they wanted to develop their economic sovereignty but they didn't just want to expand it all across the landscape. So right along in this area, about 1,700 acres is developed for, for uh, economic development. Really important. This is the kind of stuff that we're seeing in our boundary. So the, the foreground is Rio Rancho, and that's Santa Ana, and this is Highway 550 coming through here. Fragmentation, um, along with the urban development and kind of uncontrolled development on our, on our boundaries, the, uh, we have I-25 that um, supports about the um, annual average daily totals is somewhere between 25 and 35,000 vehicles per day, per day. And if you're ever standing on the side of the, the highway, you can't even imagine crossing yourself. So you can't even imagine what a wild, what a wild animal would have to deal with. And then of course, 550 doesn't see the same volume, but it still has 15,000 to 25,000 vehicles moving along it per day. And so how does this kind of urbanization and fragmentation affect the big seven? You know, these species that are traditionally important to the tribe. These, you know, these are the charismatic species. There are other really important species to the tribe, including small mammals and, and birds, but for these animals that require large home ranges, um, how did it affect them? Well, pronghorn were basically extra, they're locally extirpated for, for years. Elk were in low densities. Uh, bighorn sheep have been extirpated since. Mule deer went, were in low densities. Turkeys were, were locally extinct. And then we, we had a few predators roaming around, but I think they were mostly just passing through because the prey availability wasn't there. So we've had to reintroduce species, and starting with pronghorn in 2009. And th this map is a heat map that was generated from, from a Brownian Bridge movement model. Of, it's based on four pronghorn GPS collars in 11,000 locations. Um, the pronghorn that uh, uh, didn't cross 550, didn't cross I-25. We had one pronghorn that, that after she was released, she actually did this kind of post-release bizarre movement and came all the way over here. And she crossed 550, but then fell off a cliff in the Ojito wilderness, um, very cliffy out there. And then we had an unconfirmed uh, report from uh, the Department of Game and Fish that told us that there was a dead pronghorn on I-25 shortly ap after our first release in 2009. And then we got reports from the BLM that there were some pronghorns seen over in, in this country. But from our GPS data and at a population level, they really didn't, uh, they really didn't cross 550 or, or I-25. Deer, we've been collaring deer since 2010. Um, 
the, the, these maps are based on 70,000 GPS locations of 29 mule deer. In 2010, we collared deer on this side on the 79,000 acre block. And then in 2017, we started calling deer on the new property. And the deer from this side aren't crossing 550. There is some movement across 550 here between mile markers 8 and 13 on 550, and none of them crossed I-25. For, for elk, we have, um, we've collared nine elk. The elk are also crossing in the same place the deer are. They're not crossing I-25. There was some seasonal movement up into the southern Amos, up near the Valles Caldera. And more recently, we collared 25 cows this past February to, to look at how they're using the landscape around the new property. Bears in 2017, as, as, as the management and ungulate populations came up, we started seeing more predators on the landscape. So we call it, we were only able to get data from two black bears. We'd call her three, but the third one kept pulled off his collar twice. So we weren't ever, ever able to get much data from them. But from the two black bears, we did call her. They didn't cross 550 or they didn't cross I-25. Mountain lions, we call her nine mountain lions. These, this heat map right here is, is um, based on 32,000 GPS locations. And you can see they didn't cross 550 but I'm sorry, I-25, and they did cross 550, really using the riparian corridor, the Rio Grande, the Rio Jemez, and even, even all the way over here, the Rio Puerco. And, you know, this is, lions kind of give us a, because they require such large home ranges, they kind of give us an insight as to maybe where other species might cross. And it's interesting because this particular lion here is an adult female. She had her collar for one year, uh, failed after one year. We were trying to recapture her and we ended up catching her 16 month old kitten. And so we collared him and um, he, after he was collared, he, re, he joined back up with his mother for, for a while. And this is the information that we got from this, which is pretty cool, I think. The uh, heat map in the background is the mom's um, utilization distribution during one year. Um, here's where the den site was. And then after we call her that young subadult male, the blue lines with the green dots represent his movements during that time. And what's important about this slide is that at about three, three months or three months after we collared him, um, when he was about 18 months old, he started ranging outside of his natal range. And so he moved up towards Tent Rocks in, in April, and then again, moved over towards Buttigers off by 25. And then in May, he was right, right off of 313 and trying to cross I-25. And then on May 7th, the next night, he was right up at the, he was actually on the fence line, the right-of-way fence. And then he moved over to 550 on May 13th, May 14th, again on, on 550, and May 15th again, May 16th. And I was like, ah, I can't cross here, so I'm going to go back down to I-25. And he goes back down to I-25 on June 25th. June 26th, he's right by the Bernalillo High School. And so he's trying to find a way to get out. And it took him basically three months to, uh, to do this. And um, on July 5th, he finally crossed. And so after he crossed, this is his utilization distribution of where he went. And this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, he followed the Puerco up. And then by July 16th, he crossed near Cuba. And this is interesting because he crossed between mile markers 70 and 71, which is the number one uh, wildlife vehicle collision site in the state, the uh, north of the 550 north of Cuba site. And that, I thought that was pretty interesting. And then in August, uh, 20, on August 24th, after swimming two, two arms of the Navajo Reservoir, over 300 meters uh, each, each arm he swam across, he kind of, he finally found his, his way and found a, a new territory on October 1st on Southern Ute land and, and the Mesa Verde area. So basically, he crossed Highway 550 three times. Uh, it took him three months. Yeah, it took him about three months to get there. Um, he traveled a distance of 165 air miles, but during his journey, he covered 558 miles. And he once he got to the his new territory, he established about a 200 uh, square mile home range. His is a great story. It's a great story that it's good to know that there's still some connectivity. It could have ended right outside of Cuba. Um, I heard from Mark Payton recently that he had a lion do some, something similar, a subadult male that came out of the Jemez, but
but took the Chama River Valley up and is somewhere up in Durango as well. These are great stories, but unfortunately, a lot of our stories end like this. And this is what we see along the roads, Highway 550 and I-25. A lot of great potential stories, but they're just end on the roadside. And so what's happening here? If we kind of look at a local scale, um, this is I-25 here. This is Highway 550, and I apologize for those dramatic slides, so, but I think it's important to you know face the reality of this. And so when you when we look at just at Cougar information in 2008, Kurt Menke uh, developed a East Coast um, corridor for Cougars uh, between the Sandia Mountains down here on, on the south end and the Hamas Mountains on the north end, and um, this was under a, a Share with Wildlife grant through the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. When he showed me this, uh, I basically, I was like, uh, I wanted to put data in this corridor. And so we started collecting our data. And if we just use our cougar data, um, you can see that none of the data actually crossed I-25. And we're back to this, uh, animals using the Rio Grande, animals using the Hama, the Rio Hamas, the Mesa edges crossing 550, but nothing crossed. And then, so if you look at, you add in Kurt's, Kurt Mankey's uh, um, model, you can see where the potential and existing from, from the data that we've collected uh, crossings are. And so what's, it's not very surprising to see that when you put our, our carcass data on there, you see that um, the, the green are deer, the tan is elk, the red is mountain lions, the blue is bears. These animals are picking these sites and it's really, great to see that, not great to see that they're getting hit, but the fact that this model to me has some validity, um, but I-25 is really what changes that because it's such a barrier to movement for wildlife across it. I, or Highway 550 is open still, it's still permeable, I guess you'd say, but it has high risk uh, for wildlife to cross. So we were excited when um, we were this area, the, the uh, Hamas Mountain uh, Sandia uh, habitat linkage was selected as one of the top sites in the state to, to do um, some mitigation work. And so we, we're in the process now of kind of collecting data on 12 uh, of the highway structures that exist out there to look at animal passage rates. We haven't started yet. We just got the grant agreement finalized, but we'll be starting uh, soon. And the idea is to collect animal passage rates at these structures, see which structures animals are using and which ones are not. And then this should help in the design of any future mitigation structures. So I wanna go one more, one more slide to space and connectivity. But while we can kind of, we can uh, create those links across these roadways. And, and this goes back to what Stuart was just talking about earlier. It's, it's really about making sure there's food on both sides of the road. And when it comes to the Pueblo's lands, it's just a small little stamp on a larger landscape, but there's tremendous potential for tribes, the way that they're situated along the middle Rio Grande. It's because if you added in the Pueblos of Isleta, Acoma, um, Laguna, Tahajali, and then you added in Sandia, Cochiti, Santo Domingo, San Felipe, and Jemez Pueblo, and then Santa Clara and San Alfonso, that's and then the, the areas between these are forest service or park lands or monument lands. This is huge potential. This is close to a hundred million, I mean, I'm sorry, um, a million acres of land. And while it may not be fragmented or there might be links that you could protect within those, it's really about making sure that the landscape is managed appropriately. So there's good habitat on throughout this whole corridor area. So with that, I kind of went a little fast to try to get caught back up on time. Um, I'd like to, uh, you know, the uh, acknowledgements go to the Pueblo of Santa Ana for supporting these type of projects. All the staff at, at our Department of Natural Resources who work out in the field and in the office to, to meet our long-term goals. Pueblos of Laguna, Sandia, Cochiti, Zia, Jemez, and Santo Domingo. Um, the Mescalero Apache Tribe and Southern Ute Tribe have been helpful uh, for, for the Pueblos Progress, Bureau of Indian Affairs and Southern Pueblos Agency, Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Game and Fish has really been 
helpful in, in uh, translocation and working with lions and other things in the Arizona Department of Game and Fish as well. The Mexican Wildlife Federation Western Ecosystems Technology Hall Sawyers Group did the Browning Bridge movement models for us. And that was funded in part by the Defenders of Wildlife. We'd like to really thank them for, for helping us with that and Wildlands Network, New Mexico State University and the National Wild Turkey Federation. Whew. That's it, thank you. And I, I'd take any questions if we have time, but I think we're, gosh, we're 15, we're over. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a little over. Glenn, thank, thank you again for, for taking the time there to, to share that, that awesome presentation. That presentation never gets old. I could probably watch that every day. Um, so as, as you kind of referenced, we are getting a little tight on the agenda. And I know I, I promised everybody the opportunity to provide questions uh, to our panelists, but we're going to go ahead and push that to the end of the day after our 4.15 to 5 o'clock panel. We'll probably have a little lengthier uh, question and answer section there if, if we can. So again, Leslie, Bianca, and Glenn, thank you all for taking the time to, to speak on this panel. And uh, we'll go ahead and move on now to our next panel. So our next panel from 4.15 to 5 o'clock is other other connectivity issues and concerns. And so we're gonna have in this in this panel, I'm gonna ask if Rep Representative Christina Ortez can come up, as well as I think we have Joanna on our virtual our virtual panel there. And I'm also gonna ask our buddy Brian Burke to come up. And during this panel, everybody, we're gonna be talking about roles of land trusts, other roles that private lands can play in the connectivity sphere. And Brian's gonna talk, uh, talk about aquatic connectivity. And Brian, as I mentioned earlier, is going to share with you guys a presentation on quad connectivity. Yeah, thank you, bud, very much. And while they put my presentation up, I just introduced myself. I'm Brian Bird. I'm the Southwest Program Director for Defenders of Wildlife. I live up in Santa Fe, which is the traditional homeland of the Hickory Apache and the Pueblo communities. Um, I run a program for Defenders of Wildlife in Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. Um, but today, I just want to remind, do a little. I'll be pretty brief because I know we're all getting pretty tired and we got stuck with the last slot. <laughs> but um, today I just want to remind us how important aquatic connectivity is and aquatic habitat connectivity. And Leslie sort of stole my thunder, but she did a really good job, which she'll make my job even easier by talking so much about aquatic connectivity. But we often talk about landscape connectivity. We also we often talk about land and terrestrial connectivity. And we have been talking a lot today about um, large mammals, but we often don't think about how does a fish get from one end of the stream to the other end of the stream? Or how does a leopard frog or a jumping mouse hop from one meadow to another meadow? Or to be a little more sophisticated, you know, how does a population of native trout move from one tributary to another tributary or from one watershed to another watershed. Um, and it becomes especially important when we're talking about large catastrophic events like wildfires and you have isolated populations of these animals like a Rio Grande cutthroat trout or a Gila trout or a jumping mouse population. If one population is wiped out in a wildfire, how would a recovery population move into that habitat again once it's recovered. So I'm going to talk a little bit today just briefly about aquatic um, habitat. So you can go ahead. Um, it's very important to recognize um, that the state of New Mexico, the Ga uh, Game and Fish Department, has come up with the State Wildlife Action Plan. Um, and so a lot of the mitigation actions, such as redesigning the existing bridges, culverts were identified in this plan um, and to help reconnect streams and wetlands and to improve habitat for aquatic and semi-aquatic species of greatest conservation need. So uh, a couple of years ago, the Share with Wildlife program offered um, a grant to develop uh, a protocol for basically measuring um, the condition of bridges and culverts in uh, the Jemez watershed to determine uh, aquatic connectivity and where 
priority action should be implemented to reconnect that, that connectivity. And you can go on to the next slide. Um, so the Northern Hamas Mountains of New Mexico have been particularly impacted by hundreds of hundreds of miles of roads and their accompanying culverts and bridges. Despite the presence of the infrastructure, species such as the Rio Grande chub and the Northern leopard frog have persisted in the region. But impacts such as global climate change, uh, catastrophic wildfires and other sort of extinction events have, had a, have really had their impact on these species of greatest conservation need. However, before we undertake any restoration or design efforts, uh, the region really needs to be surveyed to determine how culverts, bridges, and other road infrastructure affect passage of these species. And so this map here, we were awarded, Defenders of Wildlife was awarded a share with wildlife grant in 2020 um, to develop a protocol to measure sort of the condition of many of these uh, culverts and bridges and determine which ones are a priority for repair for um, reconnecting aquatic habitat for species of greatest conservation need. This map shows uh, culverts and bridges along six streams in the Santa Fe National Forest in Northern New Mexico. Almost 100 culverts were surveyed as part of the Share with Wildlife program. And we were determining which were impactful to wildlife passage. You can go on. This is pretty easy, basic stuff. This is a good culvert. This is one of the culverts that we determined was in very good condition. You can also see it has quite a nice riparian component there. Um, so things like the jumping mouse could probably move under that culvert from one patch to another. Next slide. Bad culvert. Um, this is a photograph of a culvert in very poor condition that obviously is not allowing anything to get through one way or the other. The next slide. So most culverts assessed really did not require immediate management attention, at least in the Jemez Mountains where we did this survey. For a pilot project, the results collected were encouraging and provide meaningful justifiable steps forward for the U.S. Forest Service to act on in the riparian corridors. Ongoing coordination continues with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the New Mexico Game and Fish Department to pr prioritize the next phase of this project um, that will allow us to um, actually get in there and repair these culverts. There's another program I wanna mention here that could be very useful in doing this. And a lot of you may have been on this, um, this meeting last Friday, but the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership is expanding into the Southwest. And that's a program for doing, basically looking at dams and culverts and other things in their conditions. Next slide. I just want to uh, remind you all this was funded by New Mexico Game and Fish Share with Wildlife. So a special thanks to uh, Department of Game and Fish and a, and a big thanks to U.S. Forest Service for all their support on this project. And I'm going to actually go ahead and skip the next slide, although you can put it up. I had gone through and sort of inventoried all of the sources of funding that are specific to aquatic habitat connectivity, um, especially in the infrastructure law. And I guess I'll point out that there are specific provisions in the infrastructure bill that can be used for, aquatic, for restoring aquatic connectivity and riparian connectivity. We've talked a little bit about these today, the bridge investment program, the collaborative based aquatic focused landscape restoration program, National Culvert Replacement and Restoration Grant Program, and of course, the Forest Service Legacy Roads and Trails Remediation Program. And then there are some state-specific programs that haven't been mentioned today. The River Stewardship Program has anywhere from 500,000 to 2.3 million a year, and that's administered by the New Mexico Environment Department. The Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, which is uh, administered by the USDA, and that's a specific collaborative program to New Mexico, and that, give, that uh, dis, distributes 360,000 a year. And then the on the ground surface water quality improvement projects, which are, um, that's 303D money, and that's um, administered by the New Mexico Environment Department Surface Water Quality Program Bureau. And then finally, the New Mexico Wetland Restoration Program, also administered by NMED. So I encourage you, if you're interested in aquatic connectivity, to look at those sources. And um, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a great meeting.
Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you uh, keeping us on track with yeah. our time here. No problem. Next, Representative Ortez, I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you, Jeremy. I don't have a slide uh, deck, but uh, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the role of private land conservation in um, and how important it is to this work. And I imagine that Joanna will be uh, adding to this a bit. Uh, but first about myself, I'm Christina Ortez. I'm the executive director of the Taos Land Trust in Taos. I'm also the representative for District 42. So uh, I find myself um, integrating uh, those two worlds uh, quite a bit. Um, and it's in a, I do it a lot in, in the legislature when it comes to uh, providing incentives to protecting private land, it's, it's really critical. And I think there's a huge role for land trusts. Land trusts all over the country uh, really focus on, on protecting wildlife um, and, and ensuring that we've got habitat that's protected. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that all of, all of us are great at the connectivity part. And I think that's, that's the opportunity for us, you know, all the lands that we have under easement at the Taos Land Trust are, um, we don't have wildlife habitat as a huge component. That's really the reason why uh, landowners are doing it. But, you know, it has taken us some time to get to the point where we're really working strategically with landowners uh, and thinking about a riparian corridor, um, forest corridors for migration. That's just not something that we were really able to do very well until recently. And I want to just give you a little snippet of, of the possibilities. Uh, five years ago, the Taos Land Trust started working with Amigos Bravos, um, you know, water conservation group, a water, um, a water focus group, policy group, uh, the uh, Nature Conservancy, Taos Valley Asequia Association, the um, BLM, the Forest Service, Taos County, and the Town of Taos uh, to work together. Now Trout Unlimited is part of, part of our group to work together on the Rio Fernando corridor at, at its headwaters all the way down to the confluence with um, uh, the Rio Pueblo. And so together we, you know, we spent about a year working on how we can just talk to each other. Uh, there are lots of, there was lots of infighting for years and years and years. We, we just weren't good bedfellows and it took us some time, but there was some significant investment from the foundation community to make sure that we could, you know, together come up with really local solutions to bring that river back to life. You know, TVAA, Taos Valley Association, didn't work with any of the who didn't work well with the Forest Service, and Taos Land Trust just didn't really work with anybody. So, you know, uh, now we have this really robust uh, collaborative, and we're looking at ways that we can bring private landowners into the mix so that we're, as we're restoring the river in the forest, um, the Taos Land Trust owns a 20 acre parcel that has the Rio Fernando going through it. You know, we're, we, you know, are the right ambassador to have conversations with private landowners downstream, how to, you know, um, bring their acequias back to life, how to protect their riparian habitat, um, how to you know, introduce beavers back into the system. This is really, really important. And I think it's a model for how we have to work together. As Leslie talked about partnerships. This is the only way that we're gonna do this. Um, I think, especially in small rural places where uh, uh, one of us doesn't have enough resources to make it happen. We have to work together. Uh, so I think there's a role for land trust. There's absolutely a role for, um, for private landowners, but what we have to do uh, at the state and federal level is make it a lot easier and provide more incentives for private landowners to protect their land and restore their land. There are a tons, tons, millions and millions of dollars for private land conservation, right? But it's really, really hard to access if you're, you know, a landowner, say, in like northern New Mexico, where your land is your only asset. Mm -hmm. To ask uh, a traditional Hispano landowner to give up their development rights on, on their land uh, to protect it forever uh, is, is a really hard thing to do when, you, when you're only providing a small um tax credit, $250,000. That's just not enough, especially with land values now in Northern New Mexico at $100,000 an acre if you have mm. water rights, right? So that, that's, it's, it's really hard. And the transaction costs are very, very expensive. You know, it costs something like, I don't know, 55,000 to $85,000 to do a conservation easement. And Joanna's probably more expensive in Santa Fe, but you know, that, that's where it is in Taos, that's out of reach. Period. You have to be um, a be benevolent, rich soul to do uh, private land conservation and uh, want to do a CE. So we have to provide the incentives. We have to make it 
a lot easier. We have to uh, have those federal programs work more quickly. Can't take two years to do an easement at that point. You know, someone can come in and say, hey, I'll just give you a million dollars for your land. And that is what's happening uh, in, in places like Northern New Mexico. So we have to get more money into the system. We have to um, increase the tax credits at the state level. We have to provide transaction costs at the federal level that really truly um, take care of that transaction because it's it's really, really costly and we, we have to do it really quickly and we have to rethink the, the matches. Uh, we've talked a lot about matches. You know, it's um, it's really, really hard in northern New Mexico to uh, to get the funding we need to do a, a match with, at the federal level. We just don't have it locally. So we need to think about um, bu the buckets at the state level that can that we can access. You know, we have we have the buckets. The vessels are there. They're just empty. So let's uh, let's fill the vessels. And that's what I'll, I'll I'll end with that. We can do it. We need to do it, but we need more money. We need it right now. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Representative. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, our virtual panelist, Joanna. Hi, uh, how's everyone this afternoon and can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Great, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say I'm very happy to be here and certainly happy to be on a panel with uh, Brian and Christina. I still have to get used to calling her Representative Ortez because we've known each other for a while and have certainly worked together on uh, land trust issues. I also want to thank you for having me participate in the panel, uh, especially rep representing the Santa Fe Conservation Trust, that is an organization that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we, have, we operate in a three-county area, um, Santa Fe County, Rio Arriba County, and San Miguel County. Perhaps not everyone in the audience knows that we essentially have four land trusts in New Mexico and we all work together. And I'll give you an example in a moment of how Christina has been very helpful to us here in the Santa Fe Conservation Trust on one particular project. But the land trusts are the Taos Land Trust, the Santa Fe Conservation Trans uh, Trust, one that was mentioned earlier today that is a statewide land trust called the New Mexico Land Conservancy. And then we have a very active little agricultural land trust down in the Socorro area, but also that middle Rio Grande area, the Rio Grande Agricultural Land Trust. And so these four groups do work around the state to try to protect lands in perpetuity. We all have challenges. We all try to work with each other. And as Christina pointed out, a lot of times funding is key to what we can or can't get done. <coughs> Excuse me. Before I go on, I also want to mention that, <coughs> pardon me, years ago in my game and fish career, we actually were early developers um, in the Northeast area of New Mexico when we launched the San Antonio Mountain Elk Study in Unit 52 and Unit 4, right south of the Colorado border. That was the first time New Mexico Game and Fish ever used these new things called GPS collars. And uh, it was a project initiated by the Raptone Office of Game and Fish, not Santa Fe. And it arose because we were very concerned in our area, but also the Northwest area because of uh, elk issues in unit four up in the Chama area about the elk movements back and forth across the New Mexico, Colorado line. <coughs> Pardon me. And the fact that both states were hunting them, we were hunting bulls and cows. The elk moved all over the place, depending on the, the year and the snowfall, et cetera. So, that was one of the first times I would say the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish ventured into really trying to understand elk movements and um, what their corridors actually looked like, depending especially on snowfall when they actually did migrate north and then try to return south. I also want to point out that it was during the Governor Richardson administration that we did do an MOU and executive orders with Governor Ritter in Colorado and developed a working relationship along the Colorado-New Mexico border on wildlife corridors. Um, 
And so those were exciting times. And after listening to today's presentation, <coughs> pardon me, it is just fabulous to see how advanced things have become since those very early days. As Christina pointed out, <coughs> Pardon me, I have a dry throat. Not everyone realizes that con conservation easements are easements in perpetuity and that they do cost money to put in place. <coughs> One of the things Christina worked with us on very recently with the Santa Fe Conservation Trust had to do with putting a conservation easement on a piece of property that was gifted to the Santa Fe Conservation Trust that we now call the homestead. And it is more or less the last puzzle piece to the um, Galisteo Basin uh, Preserve. And it's not a big piece of property, but it's the old Thornton Ranch headquarters. It's a little over 320 acres. And the, we own it and we plan to keep it. So the Taos Land Trust very graciously agreed to hold the conservation easement on it for us. I mention it for a number of reasons and would like to use it as an example of the kinds of things that land trusts can do and add to the efforts to create, <coughs> pardon me, and expand wildlife corridors. On the homestead, <coughs> I apologize for my throat. We have removed all of the infrastructure all of the old buildings and corrals and things, and res we're restoring the land to um, native plants and habitat. Our intention is to use it as a demonstration site for how you can develop water for wildlife, restore native vegetation, and use it as, a <coughs> as an example for how others can attempt these very same things. We're working with many partners, as everyone here has mentioned today, including the Galisteo Basin Preserve, many state and federal agencies and organizations, but also particularly the Institute for Applied Technology to figure out how best to approach native plants and native seed mixes, and the Quivera Coalition, especially Bill Zedike, who even at age 80 plus has come to visit the property with Jan Willem Janssen, who's with Ecotet Tone Landscaping and Planning. Um, the point being that as we face the challenge of drought over these last few years and the dismal information that was shared earlier today about what will likely be New Mexico's um, impacts regarding climate change, we're trying to use this site as a learning laboratory basically for ourselves and anyone else who wants to join with us or, or who wants to come and see it um, to help us figure out how to restore wildlife habitats um, in, a, in a landscape and then connect it. Because as Christina mentioned, in recent years, land trusts have definitely turned their eye toward landscape scale conservation and doing more, more targeted acquisition of conservation easements to start to link together properties and habitats. We're doing that here in Santa Fe County with a lot of our conservation easements within this county and along some of the riparian areas on the, on the, on the arroyos that run through many of the properties that we hold easements on and in conjunction with the Galisteo um, um, Basin Preserve. Um, I bring it up because we did respond to the uh, state planning efforts saying that we were particularly concerned about the Glorietta Pass um, zone and it was great to see it listed as number four on the priority list today because we do work with landowners in that area and we think that we could uh, serve as an entity that could help uh, nurture landowners to protect properties along that corridor and work with uh, state and federal efforts to um, put in uh, wildlife friendly passages, etc. Um, I can't tell you how important it's been to talk to private landowners in our area. Christina mentioned um, 
and we have the same history of previously working with uh, wealthier landowners and people who had the ability to come forward to protect their land and pay the cost to do so. Yes, they took advantage of the tax credits. And in some cases, that might have been the primary instigator, but often not because they could afford to do it anyway. Our big challenge is working with smaller landowners, especially in agricultural communities in uh, Rio Arriba County, Santa Fe County, but also San Miguel County, uh, to try to encourage them to protect their lands. Many of them do because they want to stay on the land and they want their families to stay on the land. We have issues uh, with um, property taxes and have tried in our state legislature to, to get wildlife conservation included as an agricultural value. And we haven't gotten very far with that, but that's one thing this particular community uh, talking about wildlife corridors could get involved in and helping counties figure out how to um, uh, exercise uh, uh, conservation as a uh, legitimate ag activity um, because they would not lose any more income than, than if they just uh, kept it as ag land. But we need that kind of thing to help families stay on the land even if they're not going to plant alfalfa crops. <clears throat> so I think I'll stop there because I believe I've covered the things I was interested in talking to y'all about and pointing out. I'll just highlight that our land trusts like the others in the state are very interested and have as a focal point now, wildlife corridor conservation protection and expansion. Anything we can do to work with all the people that have spoken today and others that will speak tomorrow to help in local areas or to support efforts at the state level, we're more than interested in being involved in. And anything we learn and share about best management practices for uh, wildlife corridor uh, pr um, uh, management and conservation will be greatly appreciated for our own work. So with that, I'll thank you again for including me today and for recognizing that the land trusts around the state do have a role and an interest, very strong interest in wildlife corridor management and protection. Awesome. Thank you, Joanne, for, for taking the time to, uh, to share your experiences and your role at the, at the Santa Fe Conservation Trust. Um, we're, approaching, we're approaching the five o'clock hour. Um, just a couple of <laughs> couple things, a couple of notary mentions. Um, if you guys saw on our, on our agenda during our last panel, we had Senator Ben Raiden Hahn uh, and his staff to speak on the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act. As we know, uh, Senator Ben Raiden Hahn is uh, currently recovering. From some medical issues so i think it's safe to say we all uh wish the senator a full and speedy recovery we look forward to engaging and work, working with him uh in person when, when he's ready and, and healthy to do so um and then uh on our last panel that we just had uh, another colleague of ours ralph Hill, who is the uh, chair of the new mexico Asseki association was set to present today unfortunately ralph had a uh, a little scheduling conflict come up last minute this morning that uh, prevented him from, from speaking with us today. So the good news is, is I will talk to you guys tomorrow about the Tribal Wildlife Corridors Act, so you're not escaping <laughs> that. Um, and if Ralph is, is able to, we will touch on the New Mexico uh, Asequi Association and the work they do. As, as Representative Ortez uh, sat here and talked about the private land interests and the importance of, of private lands, uh, Ralph is going to sit here and talk to us about the cultural dynamic and the importance of cultural communities other than the land trust community in regards to the Asequia community. So really looking forward to that conversation and the event that can happen. But uh, I think what we're going to do now, we got three minutes left. Um, <laughs> if folks virtually have any questions, go ahead and, and drop those uh, questions into the chat box and we'll do our best to, to ask those. Um, other than that, I want to be respectful of folks' time. So those of you in the audience, if you do have if you did have any questions for our last two panelists in those presentations, um, I would encourage you guys to, to mingle amongst yourselves or, 
or ask those questions now when we complete this summit and uh, we'll try to record those those answers via via the chat so that all sounds good i, I uh, again just want to thank all of you for participating in today's summit uh, this is the first of two days so i, I expect to see everybody here here tomorrow <laughs> just kidding i know you guys cannot make it but uh, again i appreciate that and a big shout out again to the mexico wildlife federation trcp for putting on the lunch pew for helping with the org with the organizing of the event as well and uh look forward to engaging with you all tomorrow thank you